Xenophon. Scripta Minora. Hiero. Translated by E. C. Marchant. 1. Simonides, the poet, once paid a visit to Hiero, the despot. When both found time to spare, Simonides said, Hiero, will you please explain something to me that you probably know better than I? And pray what is it, said Hiero, that I can know better than one so wise as yourself? I know you were born a private citizen, he answered, and are now a despot. Therefore, as you have experienced both fortunes, you probably know better than I how the lives of the despot and the citizen differ as regards the joys and sorrows that fall to man's lot. Surely, said Hiero, seeing that you are still a private citizen, it is for you to remind me of what happens in a citizen's life, and then, I think, I could best show you the differences between the two. Well, said Simonides, taking the suggestion, I think I have observed that sights affect private citizens with pleasure and pain through the eyes. Sounds through the ears. Smells through the nostrils, meat and drink through the mouth, carnal appetites of course we all know how. In the case of cold and heat, things hard and soft, light and heavy, our sensations of pleasure and pain depend on the whole body, I think. In good and evil we seem to feel pleasure or pain, as the case may be sometimes through the instrumentality of the moral being only, at other times through that of the moral and the physical being together. Sleep, it seems clear to me, affects us with pleasure, but how and by what means and when are puzzles that I feel less able to solve. And perhaps it is no matter for surprise if our sensations are clearer when we are awake than when we are asleep. For my part, Simonides, said Hiero in answer to this, I cannot say how a despot could have any sensations apart from those you have mentioned. So far, therefore, I fail to see that the despot's life differs in any respect from the citizens. In this respect it does differ. Said Simonides, the pleasures it experiences by means of these various organs are infinitely greater in number, and the pains it undergoes are far fewer. It is not so, Simonides, retorted Hiero, I assure you far fewer pleasures fall to despots than to citizens of modest means, and many more and much greater pains. Incredible! exclaimed Simonides. Were it so, how should a despot's throne be an object of desire to many, even of those who are reputed to be men of ample means? And how should all the world envy despots? For this reason of course, said Hiero, that they speculate on the subject without experience of both estates. But I will try to show you that I am speaking the truth, beginning with the sense of sight. That was your first point, if I am not mistaken. In the first place, then, taking the objects that we perceive by means of vision, I find by calculation that in regard to sightseeing, despots are worse off. In every land there are things worth seeing, and in search of these private citizens visit any city they choose. And attend the national festivals, where all things reputed to be most worth seeing are assembled. But despots are not at all concerned with missions to shows. For it is risky for them to go where they will be no stronger than the crowd, and their property at home is too insecure to be left in charge of others while they are abroad. For they fear to lose their throne, and at the same time to be unable to take vengeance on the authors of the wrong. Perhaps you may say, but, after all, such spectacles come to them even if they stay at home. No, no, Simonides, only one in a hundred such, and what there are of them are offered to despots at a price so exorbitant that showmen who exhibit some trifle expect to leave the court in an hour with far more money than they get from all the rest of the world in a lifetime. Ah, said Simonides, but if you are worse off in the matter of sightseeing, the sense of hearing, you know, gives you the advantage. Praise. The sweetest of all sounds is never lacking, for all your courtiers praise everything you do and every word you utter. Abuse, on the contrary, that most offensive of sounds, is never in your ears, for no one likes to speak evil of a despot in his presence. And what pleasure, asked Hiero, comes, do you suppose, of this shrinking from evil words, when one knows well that all harbour evil thoughts against the despot, in spite of their silence? Or what pleasure comes of this praise, do you think, when the praises sound suspiciously like flattery? Well yes, replied Simonides, in this of course I agree with you entirely, Hiero, that praise from the freest is sweetest. But this, now, you will not persuade anyone to believe, that the things which support human life do not yield you a far greater number of pleasures. Yes, Simonides, and I know that the reason why most men judge that we have more enjoyment in eating and drinking than private citizens is this. They think that they themselves would find the dinner served at our table better eating than what they get. Anything, in fact, that is better than what they are accustomed to gives them pleasure. This is why all men look forward to the festivals, except the despots. 
for their table is always laden with plenty, and admits of no extras on feast days. Here then is one pleasure in respect of which they are worse off than the private citizen, the pleasure of anticipation. But further, your own experience tells you, I am sure, that the greater the number of superfluous dishes set before a man, the sooner a feeling of repletion comes over him, and so, as regards the duration of his pleasure too, the man who has many courses put before him is worse off than the moderate liver. But surely, said Simonides, so long as the appetite holds out, the man who dines at the costlier banquet has far more pleasure than he who is served with the cheaper meal. Don't you think, Simonides, that the greater a man's pleasure in any occupation the stronger is his devotion to it? Certainly. Then do you notice that despots fall to their meal with any more zest than private persons to theirs? No, no, of course not, I should rather say with more disgust, according to the common opinion. Well now, said Hiero, have you observed all those pickles and sauces that are put before despots acid, bitter, astringent and so forth? Yes, certainly, and very unnatural cates I think them for human beings. Don't you look on these condiments, then, as mere fads of a jaded and pampered appetite? I know well enough, and I expect you know too, that hearty eaters have no need of these concoctions. Well, I certainly think that those costly unguents with which you anoint your bodies afford more satisfaction to those who are near you than to yourselves, just as the man who has eaten rank food is less conscious of the disagreeable smell than those who come near him. Quite so, and we may add that he who has all sorts of food at all times has no stomach for any sort. Offer a man a dish that he seldom tastes, and he eats a bellyful with gusto. It seems. Remarked Simonides. As if the satisfaction of the sexual appetites were the only motive that produces in you the craving for despotism. For in this matter you are free to enjoy the fairest that meets your eye. I assure you that we are worse off than private citizens in the matter to which you now refer. First take marriage. It is commonly held that a marriage into a family of greater wealth and influence is most honourable, and is a source of pride and pleasure to the bridegroom. Next to that comes a marriage with equals. A marriage with inferiors is considered positively degrading and useless. Now unless a despot marries a foreign girl, he is bound to marry beneath him, and so the thing to be desired does not come his way. And whereas it is exceedingly pleasant to receive the attentions of the proudest of ladies, the attentions of slaves are quite unappreciated when shown, and any little shortcomings produce grievous outbursts of anger and annoyance. In his relations with young boys. Again. Even much more than in his relations with women, the despot is at a disadvantage. We all know, I suppose, that passion increases the sweets of sex beyond measure. Passion, however, is very shy of entering the heart of a despot, for passion is fain to desire not the easy prize, but the hoped for joy. Therefore, just as a man who is a stranger to thirst can get no satisfaction out of drinking, so he who is a stranger to passion is a stranger to the sweetest pleasures of sex. To this speech of Hiero Simonides replied, laughing, How say you, Hiero? You deny that love for boys springs up in a despot's heart? Then how about your passion for Dilochus, whom they call most fair? Why, Simonides, the explanation, of course, is this, I desire to get from him not what I may have, apparently, for the asking, but that which a despot should be the last to take. The fact is, I desire of Dilochus just that which human nature, maybe, drives us to ask of the fair. But what I long to get. I very strongly desire to obtain by his goodwill, and with his consent, but I think I could sooner desire to do myself an injury than to take it from him by force. For to take from an enemy against his will is, I think, the greatest of all pleasures, but favours from a loved one are very pleasant, I fancy, only when he consents. For instance, if he is in sympathy with you, how pleasant are his looks, how pleasant his questions and his answers, how very pleasant and ravishing are the struggles and bickerings. But to take advantage of a favourite against his will seems to me more like brigandage than love. Nay, your brigand finds some pleasure in his gain and in hurting his foe, but to feel pleasure in hurting one whom you love, to be hated for your affection, to disgust him by your touch, surely that is a mortifying experience and pitiful. The fact is. A private citizen has instant proof that any act of compliance on the part of his beloved is prompted by affection. Since he knows that the service rendered is due to no compulsion, but the despot can never feel sure that he is loved. For we know that acts of service prompted by fear copy as closely as possible the ministrations of affection. Indeed, even plots against despots as often as not are the work of those who profess the deepest affection for them. Two, to this Simonides replied, well. 
The points that you raise seem to me mere trifles. For I notice that many respected men willingly go short in the matter of meat and drink and delicacies, and deliberately abstain from sexual indulgence. But I will show you where you have a great advantage over private citizens. Your objects are vast, your attainment swift, you have luxuries in abundance, you own horses unequalled in excellence, arms unmatched in beauty, superb jewelry for women, stately houses full of costly furniture, moreover you have servants many in number and excellent in accomplishments and you are rich in power to harm enemies and reward friends. To this Hiero answered, well, Simonides, that the multitude should be deceived by despotic power surprises me not at all. Since the mob seems to guess wholly by appearances that one man is happy, another miserable. Despotism flaunts its seeming precious treasures outspread before the gaze of the world, but its troubles it keeps concealed in the heart of the despot, in the place where human happiness and unhappiness are stored away. That this escapes the observation of the multitude I say, I am not surprised. But what does seem surprising to me is that men like you, whose intelligence is supposed to give you a clearer view of most things than your eyes, should be equally blind to it. But I know well enough by experience, Simonides, and I tell you that despots get the smallest share of the greatest blessings, and have most of the greatest evils. Thus, for instance, if peace is held to be a greatest blessing to mankind, very little of it falls to the share of despots, if war is a great evil, of that despots receive the largest share. To begin with. So long as their state is not engaged in a war in which all take part. Private citizens are free to go wherever they choose without fear of being killed. But all despots move everywhere as in an enemy's country, at any rate they think they are bound to wear arms continually themselves, and to take an armed escort about with them at all times. Secondly, in the event of an expedition against an enemy's country, private citizens at least think themselves safe as soon as they have come home. But when despots reach their own city, they know that they are now among more enemies than ever. Again, suppose that strangers invade their city in superior force, true, the weaker are conscious of danger while they are outside the walls, yet once they are inside the fortress, all feel themselves bestowed in safety. But the despot is not out of danger even when he passes within the palace gates, nay, it is just there that he thinks he must walk most warily. Once again, to private citizens a truce or peace brings rest from war. But despots are never at peace with the people subject to their despotism and no truce can ever make a despot confident. There are, of course, wars that are waged by states against one another, and wars waged by the despot against his oppressed subjects. Now the hardships incidental to these wars that fall on the citizen fall also on the despot. For both must wear arms, be watchful, run risks, and the sting of a defeat is felt by both alike. So far, then, both are equally affected by wars. But the joys that fall to the citizens of states at war are not experienced by despots. For, you know, when states defeat their foes in a battle, words fail one to describe the joy they feel in the rout of the enemy, in the pursuit, in the slaughter of the enemy. What transports of triumphant pride! What a halo of glory about them! What comfort to think that they have exalted their city! Everyone is crying, I had a share in the plan, I killed most. And it's hard to find where they don't revel in Fossard, claiming to have killed more than all that were really slain. So glorious it seems to them to have won a great victory. But when a despot harbours suspicion, and, well aware that opposition is on foot, puts the conspirators to death, he knows that he does not exalt the city as a whole, he understands that the number of his subjects will be less, he cannot look cheerful, nor does he boast himself of his achievement. Nay, he belittles the occurrence as much as possible, and explains, while he is at the work, that there is nothing wrong in what he has done, so far his deeds from seeming honourable even to himself. Even the death of those whom he feared does not restore him to confidence, he is yet more on his guard afterwards than before. And now I have shown you the kind of war that a despot wages continually. 3. Turn next to friendship. And behold how despots share in it. First let us consider whether friendship is a great blessing to mankind. When a man is loved by friends, I take it, they rejoice at his presence, delight to do him good, miss him when he is absent, greet him most joyfully on his return, rejoice with him in his good fortune, unite in aiding him when they see him tripping. Even states are not blind to the fact that friendship is a very great blessing, and very delightful to men. At any rate, many states have a law that adulterers only may be put to death with impunity, obviously for this reason, because they believe them to be destroyers of the wife's friendship with her husband, although, when a woman's lapse is the result of some accident, husbands do not honour their wives any less on that account, provided that wives seem to reserve their affection unblemished. 
In my judgment. To be loved is a blessing so precious that I believe good things fall literally of themselves on him who is loved from gods and men alike. Such, then, is the nature of this possession a possession wherein despots above all other men are stinted. If you want to know that I am speaking the truth, Simonides, consider the question in this way. The firmest friendships, I take it, are supposed to be those that unite parents to children, children to parents, wives to husbands, comrades to comrades. Now you will find, if you will but observe, that private citizens are, in fact, loved most deeply by these. But what of despots? Many have slain their own children, many have themselves been murdered by their children, many brothers, partners in despotism, have perished by each other's hand, many have been destroyed even by their own wives, I, and by comrades whom they accounted their closest friends. Seeing, then, that they are so hated by those who are bound by natural ties and constrained by custom to love them most, how are we to suppose that they are loved by any other being? 4. Next take confidence. Surely he who has very little of that is stinted in a great blessing? What companionship is pleasant without mutual trust? What intercourse between husband and wife is delightful without confidence? What squire is pleasant if he is not trusted? Now of this confidence in others despots enjoy the smallest share. They go in constant suspicion even of their meat and drink, they bid their servitors taste them first, before the libation is offered to the gods, because of their misgiving that they may sup poison in the dish or the bowl. Again, to all other men their fatherland is very precious. For citizens ward one another without pay from their slaves and from evilders, to the end that none of the citizens may perish by a violent death. They have gone so far in measures of precaution that many have made a law whereby even the companion of the blood guilty is deemed impure, and so thanks to the fatherland every citizen lives in security. But for despots the position is the reverse in this case too. Instead of avenging them, the cities heap honours on the slayer of the despot, and Whereas they exclude the murderers of private persons from the temples. The cities, so far from treating assassins in the same manner, actually put up statues of them in the holy places. If you suppose that just because he has more possessions than the private citizen, the despot gets more enjoyment out of them, this is not so either, Simonides. Trained athletes feel no pleasure when they prove superior to amateurs, but they are cut to the quick when they are beaten by a rival athlete, in like manner the despot feels no pleasure when he is seen to possess more than private citizens, but is vexed when he has less than other despots, for he regards them as his rivals in wealth. Nor even does the despot gain the object of his desire any quicker than the private citizen. For the private citizen desires a house or a farm or a servant, but the despot covered cities or wide territory or harbours or strong citadels, and these are far more difficult and perilous to acquire than the objects that attract the citizen. And, moreover, you will find that even poverty is rarer among private citizens than among despots. For much and little are to be measured not by number, but in relation to the owner's needs, so that what is more than enough is much, and what is less than enough is little. Therefore, the despot with his abundance of wealth has less to meet his necessary expenses than the private citizen. For while private citizens can cut down the daily expenditure as they please, despots cannot, since the largest items in their expenses and the most essential are the sums they spend on the lifeguards, and to curtail any of these means ruin. Besides, when men can have all they need by honest means, why pity them as though they were poor? May not those who through want of money are driven to evil and unseemly expedients in order to live, more justly be accounted wretched and poverty-stricken? Now, despots are not seldom forced into the crime of robbing temples and their fellow men through chronic want of cash to meet their necessary expenses. Living, as it were, in a perpetual state of war. They are forced to maintain an army, or they perish. 5. Despots are oppressed by yet another trouble. Simonides, which I will tell you of. They recognize a stout-hearted, a wise or an upright man as easily as private citizens do. But instead of admiring such men, they fear them. The brave lest they strike a bold stroke for freedom, the wise lest they hatch a plot, the upright lest the people desire them for leaders. When they get rid of such men through fear, who are left for their use, save only the unrighteous, the vicious and the servile. The unrighteous being trusted because, like the despots, they fear that the cities may some day shake off the yoke and prove their masters, the vicious on account of the license they enjoy as things are, the servile because even they themselves have no desire for freedom. This too, then, is a heavy trouble, in my opinion, to see the good in some men, and yet perforce to employ others.
Furthermore, even a despot must needs love his city, for without the city he can enjoy neither safety nor happiness. But despotism forces him to find fault even with his fatherland. For he has no pleasure in seeing that the citizens are stout-hearted and well-armed, rather he delights to make the foreigners more formidable than the citizens, and these he employs as a bodyguard. Again, even when favorable seasons yield abundance of good things, the despot is a stranger to the general joy, for the needier the people, the humbler he thinks to find them. 6. But now. Simonides, he continued, I want to show you all those delights that were mine when I was a private citizen, but which I now find are withheld from me since the day I became a despot. I communed with my fellows then, they pleased me and I pleased them. I communed with myself whenever I desired rest. I passed the time in carousing, often till I forgot all the troubles of mortal life, often till my soul was absorbed in songs and revels and dances, often till the desire of sleep fell on me and all the company. But now I am cut off from those who had pleasure in me, since slaves instead of friends are my comrades, I am cut off from my pleasant intercourse with them, since I see in them no sign of goodwill towards me. Drink and sleep I avoid as a snare. To fear a crowd, and yet fear solitude, to fear to go unguarded, and yet fear the very men who guard you, to recoil from attendants unarmed and yet dislike to see them armed. Surely that is a cruel predicament. And then, to trust foreigners more than citizens, strangers more than Greeks, to long to keep free men slaves, and yet be forced to make slaves free do you not think that all these are sure tokens of a soul that is crushed with fear? Fear, you know, is not only painful in itself by reason of its presence in the soul, but by haunting us even in our pleasures it spoils them utterly. If, like me, you are acquainted with war, Simonides, and ever had the enemy's battle line close in front of you, call to mind what sort of food you ate at that time, and what sort of sleep you slept. I tell you. The pains that despots suffer are such as you suffered then. Nay, they are still more terrible, for despots believe that they see enemies not in front alone, but all around them. To this Simonides made answer, excellent words in part, I grant. War is indeed a fearsome thing, nevertheless, Hiero, our way, when we are on active service, is this, we post sentries to guard us, and sup and sleep with a good courage. Then Hiero answered, No doubt you do, Simonides. For your sentries have sentries in front of them the laws. And so they fear for their own skins and relieve you of fear. But despots hire their guards like harvesters. Now the chief qualification required in the guards, I presume, is faithfulness. But it is far harder to find one faithful guard than hundreds of workmen for any kind of work, especially when money supplies the guards, and they have it in their power to get far more in a moment by assassinating the despot than they receive from him for years of service among his guards. You said that you envy us our unrivaled power to confer benefits on our friends, and our unrivaled success in crushing our enemies. But that is another delusion. For how can you possibly feel that you benefit friends when you know well that he who receives most from you would be delighted to get out of your sight as quickly as possible? For, no matter what a man has received from a despot, nobody regards it as his own, until he is outside the giver's dominion. Or again, how can you say that despots more than others are able to crush enemies? When they know well that all who are subject to their despotism are their enemies and that it is impossible to put them all to death or imprison them else who will be left for the despot to rule over and, knowing them to be their enemies, they must beware of them, and, nevertheless, must needs make use of them. And I can assure you of this, Simonides, when a despot fears any citizen, he is reluctant to see him alive, and yet reluctant to put him to death. To illustrate my point, suppose that a good horse makes his master afraid that he will do him some fatal mischief, the man will feel reluctant to slaughter him on account of his good qualities, and yet his anxiety lest the animal may work some fatal mischief in a moment of danger will make him reluctant to keep him alive and use him. Yes, and this is equally true of all possessions that are troublesome as well as useful, it is painful to possess them, and painful to get rid of them. 7. These statements drew from Simonides the following reply, a great thing, surely, Hiero. Is the honour for which men strive so earnestly that they undergo any toil and endure any danger to win it? And what if despotism brings all those troubles that you tell of? Yet such men as you, it seems, rush headlong into it that you may have honour, that all men may carry out your behests in all things without question, that the eyes of all may wait on you, that all may rise from their seats and make way for you, that all in your presence may glorify you by deed and word alike. Such, in fact, is the behaviour of subjects to despots and to anyone else who happens to be their hero at the moment. 
For indeed it seems to me, Hiero, that in this man differs from other animals I mean, in this craving for honor. In meat and drink and sleep and sex all creatures alike seem to take pleasure, but love of honor is rooted neither in the brute beasts nor in every human being. But they in whom is implanted a passion for honor and praise, these are they who differ most from the beasts of the field, these are accounted men and not mere human beings. And so, in my opinion, you have good reason for bearing all those burdens that despotism lays on you. In that you are honored above all other men. For no human joy seems to be more nearly akin to that of heaven than the gladness which attends upon honors. To this Hiero replied, Ah, Simonides, I think even the honors enjoyed by despots bear a close resemblance to their courtships, as I have described them to you. The services of the indifferent seem to us not acts of grace, and favors extorted appeared to give no pleasure. And so it is with the services proffered by men in fear, they are not honors. For how can we say that men who are forced to rise from their seats rise to honor their oppressors, or that men who make way for their superiors desire to honor their oppressors? And as for presents, most men offer them to one whom they hate, and that too at the moment when they have cause to fear some evil at his hands. These acts, I suppose, may not unfairly be taken for acts of servility, but honors, I should say, express the very opposite feelings. For whenever men feel that some person is competent to be their benefactor, and come to regard him as the fountain of blessings, so that henceforward his praise is ever on their lips, every one of them looks on him as his peculiar blessing, they make way for him spontaneously and rise from their seats, through love and not through fear, crown him for his generosity and beneficence, and bring him free will offerings, these same men in my opinion, honour that person truly by such services, and he who is accounted worthy of them is honoured in very deed. And, for myself, I count him a happy man who is honoured thus, for I perceive that, instead of being exposed to treason, he is an object of solicitude, lest harm befall him, and he lives his life unassailed by fear and malice and danger, and enjoys unbroken happiness. But what is the despot's lot? I tell you, Simonides, he lives day and night like one condemned by the judgment of all men to die for his wickedness. When Simonides had listened to all this he asked, pray, how comes it? Hiero. If despotism is a thing so vile, and this is your verdict, that you do not rid yourself of so great an evil, and that none other, for that matter, who has once acquired it, ever yet surrendered despotic power? Simonides, said he, this is the crowning misery of despotic power, that it cannot even be got rid of. For how could any despot ever find means to repay in full all whom he has robbed, or himself serve all the terms of imprisonment that he has inflicted? Or how could he forfeit a life for every man whom he has put to death? Ah, Simonides, he cried, if it profits any man to hang himself, know what my finding is, a despot has most to gain by it, since he alone can neither keep nor lay down his troubles with profit. 8. Well. Hiero, retorted Simonides, I am not surprised that you are out of heart with despotism for the moment, since you hold that it cuts you off from gaining the affection of mankind, which you covet. Nevertheless, I think I can show you that rule so far from being a bar to popularity, actually has the advantage of a citizen's life. In trying to discover whether this is so, let us for the time being pass over the question whether the ruler, because of his greater power, is able to confer more favours. Assume that the citizen and the despot act alike, and consider which of the two wins the greater measure of gratitude from the same actions. You shall have the most trifling examples to begin with. First, suppose that two men greet someone with a friendly remark on seeing him. One is a ruler, the other a citizen. In this case which greeting, do you think, is the more delightful to the hearer? Or again, both commend the same man. Which commendation, do you think, is the more welcome? Suppose that each does the honours when he offers sacrifice. Which invitation, think you, will be accepted with the more sincere thanks? Suppose they are equally attentive to a sick man. Is it not obvious that the attentions of the mightiest bring most comfort to the patient? Suppose they give presents of equal value. Is it not clear in this case too that half the number of favours bestowed by the mightiest count for more than the whole of the plain citizen's gift? Nay, to my way of thinking, even the gods cause a peculiar honour and favour to dance attendance on a great ruler. For not only does rule add dignity of presence to a man, but we find more pleasure in the sight of that man when he is a ruler than when he is a mere citizen, and we take more pride in the conversation of those who rank above us than in that of our equals. And favourites, mark you, who were the subject of your bitterest complaint against despotism, are not offended by old age in a ruler. And take no account of ugliness in the patron with whom they happen to be associated.
High rank in itself is a most striking embellishment to the person, it casts a shade over anything repulsive in him and shows up his best features in a high light. Moreover, inasmuch as equal services rendered by you rulers are rewarded with deeper gratitude, surely, when you have the power of doing far more for others by your activities, and can lavish far more gifts on them, it is natural that you should be much more deeply loved than private citizens. Hiero instantly rejoined, Indeed it is not so, Simonides, for we are forced to engage far oftener than private citizens in transactions that make men hated. Thus, we must extort money in order to find the cash to pay for what we want, we must compel men to guard whatever needs protection, we must punish wrongdoers, we must check those who would fain wax insolent, and when a crisis arises that calls for the immediate despatch of forces by land and sea, we must see that there is no dilly-dallying. Further, a great despot must needs have mercenaries. And no burden presses more heavily on the citizens than that, since they believe that these troops are maintained not in the interests of equality, but for the despot's personal ends. 9. In answer to this Simonide said, Well. Hiero, I do not deny that all these matters must receive attention. But I should divide a ruler's activities into two classes, those that lead inevitably to unpopularity, and those that are greeted with thanks. The duty of teaching the people what things are best, and of dispensing praise and honor to those who accomplish the same most efficiently, is a form of activity that is greeted with thanks. The duty of pronouncing censure, using coercion, inflicting pains and penalties on those who come short in any respect, is one that must of necessity give rise to a certain amount of unpopularity. Therefore my sentence is that a great ruler should delegate to others the task of punishing those who require to be coerced, and should reserve to himself the privilege of awarding the prizes. The excellence of this arrangement is established by daily experience. Thus, when we want to have a choral competition, the ruler offers prizes. But the task of assembling the choirs is delegated to choir masters. And others have the task of training them and coercing those who come short in any respect. Obviously, then, in this case, the pleasant part falls to the ruler, the disagreeables fall to others. Why, then, should not all other public affairs be managed on this principle? For all communities are divided into parts tribes, wards, unions, as the case may be and every one of these parts is subject to its appointed ruler. If, then, the analogy of the choruses were followed and prizes were offered to these parts for excellence of equipment, good discipline, horsemanship, courage in the field and fair dealing in business, the natural outcome would be competition, and consequently an earnest endeavour to improve in all these respects too. And as a matter of course, with the prospect of reward there would be more despatch in starting for the appointed place, and greater promptitude in the payment of war taxes, whenever occasion required. Nay, agriculture itself, most useful of all occupations, but just the one in which the spirit of competition is conspicuous by its absence, would make great progress if prizes were offered for the farm or the village that can show the best cultivation, and many good results would follow for those citizens who threw themselves vigorously into this occupation. For apart from the consequent increase in the revenues, sobriety far more commonly goes with industry. And remember, vices rarely flourish among the fully employed. If commerce also brings gain to a city, the award of honours for diligence in business would attract a larger number to a commercial career. And were it made clear that the discovery of some way of raising revenue without hurting anyone will also be rewarded, this field of research too would not be unoccupied. In a word, once it becomes clear in every department that any good suggestion will not go unrewarded, many will be encouraged by that knowledge to apply themselves to some promising form of investigation. And when there is a widespread interest in useful subjects, an increase of discovery and achievement is bound to come. In case you fear, Hiero, that the cost of offering prizes for many subjects may prove heavy, you should reflect that no commodities are cheaper than those that are bought for a prize. Think of the large sums that men are induced to spend on horse races, gymnastic and choral competitions, and the long course of training and practice they undergo for the sake of a paltry prize. 10. Well, Simonides, said Hiero, I think you are right in saying that. But what about the mercenaries? Can you tell me how to employ them without incurring unpopularity? Or do you say that a ruler, once he becomes popular, will have no further need of a bodyguard? No, no, he will need them, of course, said Simonides. For I know that some human beings are like horses the more they get what they want, the more unruly they are apt to become. The way to manage men like that is to put the fear of the bodyguard into them. And as for the gentlemen, you can probably confer greater benefits on them by employing mercenaries than by any other means. 
for I presume that you maintain the force primarily to protect yourself. But masters have often been murdered by their slaves. If therefore the first duty enjoined on the mercenaries were to act as the bodyguard of the whole community and render help to all, in case they got wind of any such intention there are black sheep in every fold, as we all know I say, if they were under orders to guard the citizens as well as the depot, the citizens would know that this is one service rendered to them by the mercenaries. Nor is this all, for naturally the mercenaries would also be able to give fearlessness and security in the fullest measure to the labourers and cattle in the country, and the benefit would not be confined to your own estates, but would be felt up and down the countryside. Again, they are competent to afford the citizens leisure for attending to their private affairs by guarding the vital positions. Besides, should an enemy plan a secret and sudden attack, what handier agents can be found for detecting or preventing their design than a standing force, armed and organised? Or once more, when the citizens go campaigning, what is more useful to them than mercenaries? For these are, as a matter of course, the readiest to bear the brunt of toil and danger and watching. And must not those who possess a standing force impose on border states a strong desire for peace? For nothing equals an organized body of men, whether for protecting the property of friends or for thwarting the plans of enemies. Further, when the citizens get it into their heads that these troops do no harm to the innocent and hold the would-be malefactor in check, come to the rescue of the wronged, care for the citizens and shield them from danger, surely they are bound to pay the cost of them with a right goodwill. At all events they keep guards in their homes for less important objects than these. 11. Nor should you hesitate to draw on your private property, Hiero, for the common good. For in my opinion the sums that a great despot spends on the city are more truly necessary expenses than the money he spends on himself. But let us go into details. First, which do you suppose is likely to bring you more credit, to own a palace adorned with priceless objects of art, or to have the whole city garnished with walls and temples and verandas and marketplaces and harbours? Which will make you look more terrible to the enemy, to dazzle all beholders with your own glittering panoply, or to present the whole of your people in goodly armour? Which plan, think you, will yield revenues more abounding, to keep only your own capital employed, or to contrive to bring the capital of all the citizens into employment? And what about the breeding of chariot horses, commonly considered the noblest and grandest business in the world? By which method do you think you will gain most credit for that? If you outdo all other Greeks in the number of teams you breed and send to the festivals, or if the greatest number of breeders and the greatest number of competitors are drawn from your city? And how is the nobler victory gained, by the excellence of your team, or by the prosperity of the city of which you are the head? Indeed my own opinion is that it is not even seemly for a great despot to compete with private citizens. For your victory would excite envy rather than admiration, on the ground that many estates supply the money that you spend, and no defeat would be greeted with so much ridicule as yours. I tell you, Hiero, you have to compete with other heads of states, and if you cause your state to surpass theirs in prosperity, be well assured that you are the victor in the noblest and grandest competition in the world. And in the first place you will forthwith have secured just what you really want, the affection of your subjects. Secondly, your victory will not be proclaimed by one herald's voice. But all the world will tell of your virtue. The observed of all observers' eyes, you will be a hero, not only to private citizens, but to many states, you will be admired not only in your home, but in public among all men. And you will be free to go wherever you choose, so far as safety is concerned, to see the sights, and equally free to enjoy them in your home, for you will have a throng of aspirants before you, some eager to display something wise or beautiful or good, others longing to serve you. Everyone present will be an ally, everyone absent will long to see you. Thus you will be not only the loved, but the adored of mankind. You will need not to court the fair, but to listen patiently to their suit. Anxiety for your welfare will fall not on yourself, but on others. You will have the willing obedience of your subjects, you will mark their unsolicited care for you, and should any danger arise, you will find in them not merely allies, but champions and zealots. Accounted worthy of many gifts, and at no loss for some man of goodwill with whom to share them, you will find all rejoicing in your good fortune, all fighting for your interests, as though they were their own. And all the riches in the houses of your friends will be yours in fee. Take heart then, Hiero, enrich your friends, for so you will enrich yourself. Exalt the state, for so you will deck yourself with power. Get her allies, for so you will win supporters for yourself. Account the fatherland your estate. Citizens your comrades, friends your own children, your sons' possessions dear as life. 
and try to surpass all these in deeds of kindness. For if you outdo your friends in kindness, it is certain that your enemies will not be able to resist you. And if you do all these things, rest assured that you will be possessed of the fairest and most blessed possession in the world, for none will be jealous of your happiness. Agesilors. Translated by E. C. Marchant. 1. I know how difficult it is to write an appreciation of Agesilors that shall be worthy of his virtue and glory. Nevertheless the attempt must be made. For it would not be seemly that so good a man, just because of his perfection, should receive no tributes of praise, however inadequate. Now concerning his high birth what greater and nobler could be said than this, that even today the line of his descent from Heracles is traced through the role of his ancestors, and those no simple citizens, but kings and sons of kings? Nor are they open to the reproach that though they were kings, they ruled over a petty state. On the contrary, as their family is honoured above all in their fatherland, so is their state glorious above all in Greece, thus they are not first in the second rank, but leaders in a community of leaders. On one account his fatherland and his family are worthy to be praised together. For never at any time has the state been moved by jealousy of their preeminence to attempt the overthrow of their government. And never at any time have the kings striven to obtain greater powers than were conferred on them originally at their succession to the throne. For this reason, while no other government democracy, oligarchy, despotism or kingdom can can lay claim to an unbroken existence, this kingdom alone stands fast continually. However, there are not wanting signs that even before his reign began Agesilaus was deemed worthy to be king. For on the death of King Aegis there was a struggle for the throne between Leotychidas, as the son of Aegis, and Agesilaus, as the son of Archidamus. The state decided in favour of Agesilaus, judging him to be the more eligible in point of birth and character alike. Surely to have been pronounced worthy of the highest privilege by the best men in the mightiest state is proof sufficient of his virtue, at least before he began to reign. I will now give an account of the achievements of his reign. For I believe that his deeds will throw the clearest light on his qualities. Now Agesilaus was still a young man when he gained the throne. He had been but a short time in power when the news leaked out that the king of the Persians was assembling a great navy and army for an attack on the Greeks. While the Lacedaemonians and their allies were considering the matter, Agesilaus declared, that if they would give him thirty Spartans, two thousand newly enrolled citizens, and a contingent of six thousand allies, he would cross to Asia and try to effect a peace, or, in case the barbarian wanted to fight, would keep him so busy that he would have no time for an attack on the Greeks. His eagerness to pay back the Persian in his own coin for the former invasion of Greece, his determination to wage an offensive rather than a defensive war, and his wish to make the enemy pay for it rather than the Greeks, were enough to arouse an immediate and widespread enthusiasm for his project. But what appealed most to the imagination was the idea of entering on a struggle not to save Greece, but to subdue Asia. And what of his strategy after he had received the army and had sailed out? A simple narrative of his actions will assuredly convey the clearest impression of it. This, then, was his first act in Asia. Tissaphernes had sworn the following oath to Agesilaus, if you will arrange an armistice to last until the return of the messengers whom I will send to the king, I will do my utmost to obtain independence for the Greek cities in Asia, and Agesilaus on his part had sworn to observe the armistice honestly, allowing three months for the transaction. What followed? Tissaphernes forthwith broke his oath, and instead of arranging a peace, applied to the king for a large army in addition to that which he had before. As for Agesilaus, though well aware of this, he nonetheless continued to keep the armistice. I think, therefore, that here we have his first noble achievement. By showing up Tissaphernes as a perjurer, he made him distrusted everywhere. And, contrarywise, by proving himself to be a man of his word and true to his agreements, he encouraged all, Greeks and barbarians alike, to enter into an agreement with him whenever he wished it. The arrival of the new army emboldened Tissaphernes to send an ultimatum to Agesilaus, threatening was unless he withdrew from Asia, and the allies and the Lacedaemonians present made no concealment of their chagrin, believing that the strength of Agesilaus was weaker than the Persian king's armament. But Agesilaus with a beaming face bade the envoys of Tissaphernes inform their master that he was profoundly grateful to him for his perjury, by which he had gained the hostility of the gods for himself and had made them allies of the Greeks. Without a moment's delay he gave the word to his troops to pack up in preparation for a campaign, and warned the cities that lay on the lines of march to Caria to have their markets ready stocked. He advised by letter the Greeks of Ionia, the Aeolid and the Hellespont, to send their contingents for the campaign to his headquarters at Ephesus. 
Now Tissaphernes reflected that Agesilaus was without cavalry, while Caria was a difficult country for mounted men, and he thought that Agesilaus was wroth with him on account of his deceit. Concluding, therefore, that his estate in Caria was the real object of the coming attack, he sent the whole of his infantry across to that district and took his cavalry round into the plain of the Maeander, confident that he could ride down the Greeks before they reached the country where cavalry could not operate. But instead of marching on Caria, Agesilaus forthwith turned round and made for Phrygia. Picking up the various forces that met him on the route, he proceeded to reduce the cities and captured a vast quantity of booty by sudden attacks. This achievement also was thought to be a proof of sound generalship, that when war was declared and cousining in consequence became righteous and fair dealing. He showed Tissaphernes to be a child at deception. It was thought, too, that he made shrewd use of this occasion to enrich his friends. For the accumulation of plunder was so great that things were selling for next to nothing. So he gave his friends the word to buy, saying that he was shortly going down to the coast with his army. The auctioneers were ordered to have a schedule made of the prices obtained and to give delivery of the goods. Thus without capital outlay, and without any loss to the treasury, all his friends made a prodigious amount of money. Further, whenever deserters offered to give information where plunder might be taken, they naturally went to the king. In such a case he took care that the capture should be effected by his friends, so that they might at one and the same time make money and add to their laurels. The immediate result was that he had many ardent suitors for his friendship. Recognizing that a country plundered and depopulated could not long support an army. Whereas an inhabited and cultivated land would yield inexhaustible supplies. He took pains not only to crush his enemies by force, but also to win them over by gentleness. He would often warn his men not to punish their prisoners as criminals, but to guard them as human beings, and often when shifting camp, if he noticed little children, the property of merchants, left behind many merchants offered children for sale because they thought they would not be able to carry and feed them he looked after them too, and had them conveyed to some place of refuge. Again, he arranged that prisoners of war who were too old to accompany the army were to be looked after, that they might not fall a prey to dogs or wolves. It thus came about that he won the goodwill not only of those who heard of these facts, but even of the prisoners themselves. In his settlement with the cities that he won over, he invariably excused them from all servile duties and required only such obedience as freemen owe to their rules. And by his clemency he made himself master of fortresses impregnable to assault. However, since a campaign in the plains was impossible even in Phrygia, owing to Pharnabas's cavalry, he decided that he must raise a mounted force, if he was to avoid continually running away from the enemy. He therefore enrolled the wealthiest men in all the cities thereabouts as breeders of horses, and issued a proclamation that anyone who supplied a horse and arms and an efficient man should be exempt from personal service. In this way he brought it about that every one of them carried out these requirements with the zeal of a man in quest of someone to die in his stead. He also specified cities that were to furnish contingents of cavalry, feeling sure that from the horse-breeding cities riders proud of their horsemanship would be forthcoming. This again was considered an admirable stroke on his part, that no sooner had he raised his cavalry than it became a powerful body ready for action. At the first sign of spring he collected the whole of his forces at Ephesus. With a view to their training he offered prizes for the cavalry squadron that rode best. For the company of heavy infantry that reached the highest level of physical fitness. He also offered prizes to the targeteers and the archers who showed the greatest efficiency in their particular duties. Thereupon one might see every gymnasium crowded with the men exercising, the racecourse thronged with cavalrymen riding, and the javelin men and archers shooting at the mark. Indeed he made the whole city in which he was quartered a sight to see. For the market was full of arms and horses of all sorts on sale, and the coppersmiths, carpenters, workers in iron, cobblers, and painters were all busy making weapons of war, so that you might have thought that the city was really a war factory. And an inspiring sight it would have been to watch a Jessalors and all his soldiers behind him returning garlanded from the gymnasium and dedicating their garlands to Artemis. For where men reverence the gods, train themselves in warfare and practice obedience. There you surely find high hopes abounding. Moreover, believing that contempt for the enemy would kindle the fighting spirit, he gave instructions to his heralds that the barbarians captured in the raids should be exposed for sale naked. So when his soldiers saw them white because they never stripped, and fat and lazy through constant riding in carriages, they believed that the war would be exactly like fighting with women. He also gave notice to the troops that he would immediately lead them by the shortest route to the most fertile parts of the country, so that he might at once find them preparing themselves in body and mind for the coming struggle. 
Tissaphernes, however, believed that in saying this he meant to deceive him again, and that now he would really invade Caria. Accordingly he sent his infantry across into Caria as before, and stationed his cavalry in the plain of the Maander. But Agesilaus did not play false, in accordance with his notice he marched straight to the neighborhood of Sardis. And for three days his route lay through a country bare of enemies. So that he supplied his army with abundance of provisions. On the fourth day the enemy's cavalry came up. Their leader told the officer in command of the baggage train to cross the river Pactolus and encamp. The cavalry, meantime, catching sight of the Greek camp followers plundering in scattered bands, killed a large number of them. On noticing this, Agesilaus ordered his cavalry to go to their help. The Persians in turn, seeing the supports coming, gathered in a mass and confronted them with the full strength of their horse. Then Agesilaus, realizing that the enemy's infantry was not yet up, while he had all his resources on the spot, thought the moment was come to join battle if he could. Therefore, after offering sacrifice, he led forward the battle line immediately against the opposing cavalry, the heavy infantrymen of ten years' service having orders to run to close quarters with the enemy, while the targeteers were to lead the advance at the double. He also sent word to the cavalry to attack in the knowledge that he himself was following with the whole army. The charge of the cavalry was met by the flower of the Persians, but as soon as the full weight of the attack fell on them, they swayed, and some were cut down immediately in the river, while the rest fled. The Greeks followed up their success and captured their camp. The targeteers naturally fell to pillaging, but Agesilaus drew the lines of his camp round so as to enclose the property of all, friends and foes alike. On hearing that there was confusion among the enemy, because everyone put the blame for what had happened on his neighbor, he advanced forthwith on Sardis. There he began burning and pillaging the suburbs, and meantime issued a proclamation calling on those who wanted freedom to join his standard, and challenging any who claimed a right to Asia to seek a decision between themselves and the liberators by an appeal to arms. As no one came out to oppose him, he prosecuted the campaign henceforward in complete confidence, he beheld the Greeks. Compelled erstwhile to cringe. Now honored by their oppressors, caused those who arrogantly claimed for themselves the honors paid to the gods to shrink even from looking the Greeks in the face, rendered the country of his friends inviolate, and stripped the enemy's country so thoroughly that in two years he consecrated to the god at Delphi more than two hundred talents as tithe. But the Persian king, believing that Tissaphernes was responsible for the bad turn in his affairs, sent down Tithrausts and beheaded Tissaphernes. After this the outlook became still more hopeless for the barbarians, while Agesilaus received large accessions of strength. For all the nations of the empire sent embassies seeking his friendship, and the desire for freedom caused many to revolt to him, so that not Greeks alone, but many barbarians also now acknowledged the leadership of Agesilaus. His conduct at this juncture also merits unstinted admiration. Though ruler of countless cities on the mainland. And master of islands. For the state had now added the fleet to his command becoming daily more famous and more powerful, placed in a position to make what use he would of his many opportunities, and designing and expecting to crown his achievements by dissolving the empire that had attacked Greece in the past, he suppressed all thought of these things, and as soon as he received a request from the home government to come to the aid of his fatherland, he obeyed the call of the state, just as though he were. Standing in the ephor's palace alone before the five, thus showing clearly that he would not take the whole earth in exchange for his fatherland, nor new-found friends for old, and that he scorned to choose base and secure gains rather than that which was right and honorable, even though it was dangerous. Throughout the time that he remained in his command, another achievement of his showed beyond question how admirable was his skill in kingcraft. Having found all the cities that he had gone out to govern rent by faction in consequence of the political disturbances that followed on the collapse of the Athenian Empire, he brought it about by the influence of his presence that the communities lived in unbroken harmony and prosperity without recourse to banishment or executions. Therefore the Greeks in Asia mourned his departure as though they were bidding farewell not merely to a ruler, but to a father or a comrade. And at the end they showed that their affection was unfeigned. At any rate they went with him voluntarily to aid Sparta, knowing as they did that they must meet an enemy not inferior to themselves. This then was the end of his activities in Asia. 2. After crossing the Hellespont, he passed through the very same tribes as the Persian king with his mighty host, and the distance that had been traversed by the barbarian in a year was covered by Agesilaus in less than a month. For he had no intention of arriving too late to aid his fatherland. When he had passed through Macedonia and reached Thessaly, the people of Larissa, Cranon, Scotussa, and Pharsalus, 
who were allies of the Boeotians, all the Thessalians, in fact, except those who happened to be in exile at the time, followed at his heels and kept molesting him. For a time he led the army in a hollow square, with one half of the cavalry in front and the other half in the rear, but finding his progress hampered by Thessalian attacks on his rearguard, he sent round all the cavalry from the vanguard to the rear, except his own escort. When the two forces faced one another in line of battle, the Thessalians, believing it inexpedient to engage heavy infantry with cavalry, wheeled round and slowly retired, their enemy following very cautiously. Agesilaus, noticing the errors into which both sides were falling, now sent round his own escort of stalwart horsemen, with orders to bid the others to charge at full speed, and to do the same themselves, and not to give the enemy a chance of rallying. As for the Thessalians, on seeing the unexpected charge they either did not rally at all, or were captured in the attempt to do so with their horses broadside to the enemy. Polycarmus the Pharsalian, commander of the cavalry, did indeed turn, and fell fighting along with those about him. Hereupon ensued a wild flight, so that some of the enemy were killed and some were taken prisoners, at any rate they never halted until they reached Mount. Narthasium. On that day Agesilaw set up a trophy between Pras and Narthasium, and here for the moment he paused, mightily pleased with his exploit. Since he had defeated an enemy inordinately proud of his horsemanship with the cavalry that he had himself created. On the morrow he crossed the Achaean mountains in Thyre, and now his route led him through friendly country till he reached the borders of Boeotia. Here he found arrayed against him the, the bands, Athenians, Argives, Corinthians, Aenianians, Eubians, and both the Locrian tribes. Without a moment's delay, in full view of the enemy, he drew up his army for battle. In addition to the army that he had brought with him he had a regiment and a half of Lacedaemonians, and of the local allies only the Phocians and Orchomenians. Now I am not going to say that his forces were far inferior in numbers and in quality, and that nevertheless he accepted battle. That statement, I think, would but show a want of common sense in Agesilaus and my own folly in praising a leader who wantonly jeopardized interests of vital moment. On the contrary and this is what I do admire him for he brought into the field an army not a whit inferior to the enemies. He so armed it that it looked one solid mass of bronze and scarlet. He took care to render his men capable of meeting all calls on their endurance, he filled their hearts with confidence that they were able to withstand any and every enemy, he inspired them all with an eager determination to outdo one another in valour, and lastly he filled all with anticipation that many good things would befall them, if only they proved good men. For he believed that men so prepared fight with all their might, nor in point of fact did he deceive himself. I will describe the battle, for there has been none like it in our time. The two armies met in the plain of Coronia, Agesilaus advancing from the Cephasus, the the bands, and their allies from Helicon. Their eyes told them that the opposing lines of battle were exactly matched in strength, and the number of cavalry on both sides was about the same. Agesilaus was on the right wing of his army and had the Orchomenians on his extreme left. On the other side the the bands themselves were on the right wing and the Argives held the left. As they approached both sides for a time maintained complete silence, but when they were about a furlong apart, the the bands raised the battle cry and rushed forward at the double. The distance between them was still about 100 yards when the mercenary troops under Heripides, consisting of the men who had gone with Agesilaus from home and some of the Cyraeans, dashed out in turn from their main body, closely followed by Ionians, Aeolians and Hellespontines. All these took part in the dash, and coming within spear thrust put to flight the force in front of them. As for the Argives, they fled towards Helicon without awaiting the attack of Agesilaus. And now some of the mercenaries were in the act of crowning Agesilaus with a wreath, when a man reported to him that the, the bands had cut their way through the Orchomenians and were among the baggage train. So he immediately wheeled his main body and advanced against them, and the, the bands in their turn. Seeing that their allies had sought refuge at the foot of Mount Helicon, and wanting to break through and join their friends, made a strong move forward. At this juncture one may say without fear of contradiction that Agesilaus showed courage, but the course that he adopted was not the safest. For he might have allowed the men who were trying to break through to pass, and then have followed them and annihilated those in the rear. Instead of doing that he made a furious frontal attack on the the bands. Thrusting shield against shield, they shoved and fought and killed and fell. There was no shouting, nor was there silence, but the strange noise that wrath and battle together will produce. In the end some of the, the bands broke through and reached Helicon, but many fell during the retreat. 
The victory lay with the Jessalors, but he himself had been carried wounded to his battle line, when some horsemen rode up, and told him that eighty of the enemy retaining their arms had taken cover in the temple, and they asked what they should do. Though wounded in every part of his body with every sort of weapon. He did not forget his duty towards the gods, but gave orders that these men should be suffered to go whithersoever they wished, and would not suffer them to be harmed, and charge his escort of cavalry to conduct them to a place of safety. Now that the fighting was at an end, a weird spectacle met the eye, as one surveyed the scene of the conflict the earth stained with blood, friend and foe lying dead side by side, shields smashed to pieces, spears snapped in two, daggers bared of their sheaths, some on the ground, some embedded in the bodies, some yet gripped by the hand. Then, as the day was far spent, having dragged the enemies dead within their battle line, they supped and slept. Early next morning Agesilors ordered Gylis, the pole march, to draw up the army in battle order and to set up a trophy, and to command every man to wear a wreath in honour of the god and all the flute players to play. Now while they were carrying out these orders that the band sent a herald, asking leave to bury their dead under protection of a truce. And so a truce was made, and Agesilors left for home, choosing, instead of supreme power in Asia, to rule and to be ruled at home according to the constitution. Some time afterwards, finding that the Argives were enjoying the fruits of their land, that they had appropriated Corinth and were finding the war a pleasant occupation, he made an expedition against them. He first laid waste all their territory, then crossed to Corinth by the pass and captured the walls leading to Lycium. Having thus unbarred the gates of Peloponnese, he returned home for the festival of Hyacinthus and joined in singing the paean in honour of the god, taking the place assigned to him by the choirmaster. After a time, discovering that the Corinthians were keeping all their cattle safe in Perium, and sowing and reaping the crops throughout that district, and what he thought most serious that the Boeotians were finding this route convenient for sending support to the Corinthians, with Crucis as their base, he marched against Perium. Seeing that it was strongly guarded, he moved his camp after the morning meal to a position before the capital, as though the city was about to surrender. But becoming aware that supports had been hurriedly poured into the city during the night from Perium, he turned about at daybreak and captured Perium, finding it undefended, and everything in it, along with the fortresses that stood there, fell into his hands. Having done this, he returned home. After these events, the Achaeans, who were zealous advocates of the alliance, begged him to join them in an expedition against Acarnania. And when the Acarnanians attacked him in a mountain pass, he seized the heights above their heads with his light infantry fought an engagement and, after inflicting severe losses on them, set up a trophy, nor did he cease until he had induced the Acarnanians, Aetolians and Argives to enter into friendship with the Achaeans and alliance with himself. When the enemy sent embassies desiring peace, Agesilors opposed the peace until he forced Corinth and Thebes to restore to their homes the citizens who had been exiled on account of their sympathy with the Lacedaemonians. And again later, having led an expedition in person against Phlaeus, he also restored the Phlaeasian exiles who had suffered in the same cause. Possibly some may censure these actions on other grounds, but at least it is obvious that they were prompted by a spirit of true comradeship. It was in the same spirit that he subsequently made an expedition against Thebes, to relieve the Lacedaemonians in that city when their opponents had taken to murdering them. Finding the city protected on all sides by a trench and stockade. He crossed the pass of Cynocephaly and laid waste the country up to the city walls, offering battle to the the bands both on the plain and on the hills, if they chose to fight. In the following year he made another expedition against Thebes, and, after crossing the stockade and trenches at Scolus, laid waste the rest of Boeotia. Up to this time he and his city enjoyed unbroken success, and though the following years brought a series of troubles, it cannot be said that they were incurred under the leadership of Agesilors. On the other hand, after the disaster at Leuctra, when his adversaries in league with the Mantineans were murdering his friends and acquaintances in Tegea, and a coalition of all Boeotia, Arcadia and Elis had been formed, he took the field with the Lacedaemonian forces only, thus disappointing the general expectation that the Lacedaemonians would not even go outside their own borders for a long time to come. It was not until he had laid waste the country of those who had murdered his friends that he returned home once more. After this Sparta was attacked by all the Arcadians, Argives, Eleans and Boeotians, who had the support of the Phocians, both the Locrian peoples, the Thessalians, Aenianians, Acarnanians and Euboeans. In addition the slaves and many of the outlander communities were in revolt, and at least as many of the Spartan nobles had fallen in the Battle of Leuctra as survived. 
he kept the city safe notwithstanding, and that though it was without walls, not going out into the open where the advantage would have lain wholly with the enemy, and keeping his army strongly posted where the citizens would have the advantage, for he believed that he would be surrounded on all sides if he came out into the plain, but that if he made a stand in the defiles and the heights, he would be master of the situation. After the retirement of the enemy, none will deny that his conduct was marked by good sense. The marching and riding incidental to active service were no longer possible to a man of his years. But he saw that the state must have money if she was to gain an ally anywhere. So he applied himself to the business of raising money. At home he did all that ingenuity could suggest, and, if he saw any prospect of serving the state abroad, shrank from no measures that circumstances called for, and he was not ashamed to go out, not as a general, but as an envoy. And even as an envoy he accomplished work worthy of a great general. For instance, Autophrodates laying siege to Ariobarzanes, an ally of Sparta, at Assos, took to his heels from fear of Agesilaus. Cotes for his part, besieging Cestus, while it was still in the hands of Ariobarzanes, broke up the siege and made off. With good reason, therefore, might the victorious envoy have set up a trophy once again to record these bloodless successes. Again, Morsalus, laying siege to both these places with a fleet of a hundred vessels, was induced, not indeed by fear, but by persuasion, to sail for home. In this affair too his success was admirable. For those who considered that they were under an obligation to him and those who fled before him, both paid. Yet again, Tachos and Morsalus, another of those who contributed money to Sparta, owing to his old ties of hospitality with Agesilaus, sent him home with a magnificent escort. Subsequently, when he was now about eighty years of age, he became aware that the king of Egypt was bent on war with Persia, and was possessed of large forces of infantry and cavalry and plenty of money. He was delighted when a summons for help reached him from the Egyptian king, who actually promised him the chief command. For he believed that at one stroke he would repay the Egyptian for his good offices to Sparta, would again set free the Greeks in Asia, and would chastise the Persian for his former hostility, and for demanding now, when he professed to be an ally of Sparta, that her claim to Messene should be given up. However, when this suitor for his assistance failed to give him the commander Gesilors felt that he had been grossly deceived, and was in doubt what he ought to do. At this juncture first a portion of the Egyptian troops, operating as a separate army, revolted from the king, and then the rest of his forces deserted him. The king left Egypt and fled in terror to Sidon in Phoenicia, while the Egyptians split up into two parties, and each chose its own king. Agesilaus now realized that if he helped neither king, neither of them would pay the Greeks their wages. Neither would provide a market, and the conqueror, whichever he proved to be, would be hostile, but if he cooperated with one of them, that one, being under an obligation to him, would in all probability adopt a friendly attitude. Accordingly, having decided which of them showed the stronger signs of being a friend to the Greeks, he took the field with him. He inflicted a crushing defeat on the enemy of the Greeks, and helped to establish his rival, and so having made him the friend of Sparta, and having received a great sum of money in addition, he sailed home, though it was midwinter, with all haste, in order that the state might be in a position to take action against her enemies in the coming summer. 3. Such. Then, is the record of my hero's deeds, so far as they were done before a crowd of witnesses. Actions like these need no proofs, the mere mention of them is enough and they command belief immediately. But now I will attempt to show the virtue that was in his soul, the virtue through which he wrought those deeds and loved all that is honourable and put away all that is base. Agesilaus had such reverence for religion, that even his enemies considered his oaths and his treaties more to be relied on than their own friendship with one another, for there were times when they shrank from meeting together, and yet would place themselves in the power of Agesilaus. And lest anyone should think this statement incredible, I wish to name the most famous among them. Spithridates the Persian, for example, knew that Pharnabazus was negotiating for a marriage with the great king's daughter, and intended to take his, Spithridates, daughter as a concubine. Regarding this as an outrage, he delivered himself, his wife, his children and all that he had into Agesilaus's hands. Cotes, ruler of the Paphlagonians, who had disobeyed the command of the great king, though it was accompanied with the symbol of friendship, feared that he would be seized and either be fined heavily or even put to death, but he too, trusting in the armistice with Agesilaus, came to his camp and having entered into alliance elected to take the field at Agesilaus' side with a thousand horse and two thousand targeteers. And Pharnabazus too came and parleyed with Agesilaus, and made agreement with him that if he were not himself appointed the Persian general, he would revolt from the great king. But, he said, if I become general, I shall make war on you, Agesilaus, with all my might. 
he used this language in full confidence that nothing contrary to the terms of the armistice would happen to him. So great and so noble a treasure has every man, and above all a general. Who is upright and trustworthy and is known to be so. So much, then, for the virtue of piety. For, next comes his justice in money matters. Of this what proofs can be more convincing than the following? No man ever made any complaint that he had been defrauded by a Jessalors, but many acknowledged that they had received many benefits from him. One who delighted to give away his own for the good of others could not possibly be minded to defraud others at the price of disgrace. For if he had coveted money it would have cost him far less trouble to keep his own than to take what did not belong to him. A man who would not leave unpaid debts of gratitude, which are not recoverable in the courts, cannot have been minded to commit thefts that are forbidden by law. And Agesilaus held it wrong not only to repudiate a debt of gratitude, but, having greater means, not to render in return a much greater kindness. Again, with what show of reason could embezzlement of public property be charged against a man who bestowed on his fatherland the rewards due to himself? And is it not a striking proof of his freedom from avarice that he was able to get money from others? Whenever he wanted, for the purpose of rendering financial assistance to the state or his friends. For had he been in the habit of selling his favours or taking payment for his benefactions, no one would have felt that he owed him anything. It is the recipient of unbout, gratuitous benefits who is always glad to oblige his benefactor in return for the kindness he has received and in acknowledgement of the trust reposed in him as a worthy and faithful guardian of a favour. Further, is it not certain that the man who by a noble instinct refused to take more and preferred to take less than his just share was far beyond the reach of covetousness? Now when the state pronounced him sole heir to the property of Aegis, he gave half of it to his mother's kinsfolk, because he saw that they were in want, and all Lacedaemon bears witness that my statement is true. On receiving from Tithrosts an offer of gifts unnumbered if only he would leave his country. Agesilaus answered, Among us. Tithrosts, a ruler's honour requires him to enrich his army rather than himself, and to take spoils rather than gifts from the enemy. 5. Again. Among all the pleasures that prove too strong for many men, who can mention one to which Agesilaus yielded? Drunkenness, he thought, should be avoided like madness, overeating like idleness. Moreover, he received a double ration at the public meals, but instead of consuming both portions himself, he distributed both and left neither for himself, holding that the purpose of this double allowance to the king was not to provide him with a heavy meal, but to give him the opportunity of honouring whomsoever he would. As for sleep, it was not his master, but the servant of his activities, and unless he occupied the humblest bed among his comrades, he could not conceal his shame, for he thought that a ruler's superiority over ordinary men should be shown not by weakness but by endurance. There were things, to be sure, of which he was not ashamed to take more than his share for instance, the summer's heat and the winter's cold, and whenever his army was faced with a hard task, he toiled willingly beyond all others, believing that all such actions were an encouragement to the men. Not to labour the point, Agesilaus gloried in hard work, and showed a strong distaste for indolence. His habitual control of his affections surely deserves a tribute of admiration, if worthy of mention on no other ground. That he should keep at arm's length those whose intimacy he did not desire may be thought only human. But he loved Megabates, the handsome son of Spithridates, with all the intensity of an ardent nature. Now it is the custom among the Persians to bestow a kiss on those whom they honour. Yet when Megabates attempted to kiss him, Agesilaus resisted his advances with all his might and act of punctilious moderation surely. Megabates, feeling himself slighted, tried no more to kiss him. And Agesilaus approached one of his companions with a request that he would persuade Megabates to show him honour once again. Will you kiss him? asked his companion, if Megabates yields. After a deep silence, Agesilaus gave his reply, by the twin gods, no, not if I were straightway to be the fairest and strongest and fleetest man on earth. By all the gods I swear that I would rather fight that same battle over again than that everything I see should turn into gold. What opinions some hold in regard to these matters I know well enough, but for my part one am persuaded that many more men can gain the mastery over their enemies than over impulses such as these. No doubt when these things are known to few, many have a right to be sceptical, but we all know this, that the greater a man's fame, the fiercer is the light that beats on all his actions, we know too that no one ever reported that he had seen a Jessilors do any such thing, and that no scandal based on conjecture would have gained credence, for it was not his habit, when abroad, to lodge apart in a private house. But he was always either in a temple, 
where conduct of this sort is, of course, impossible, or else in a public place where all men's eyes became witnesses of his rectitude. If I speak this falsely against the knowledge of the Greek world, I am in no way praising my hero, but I am censuring myself. 6. As for courage. He seems to me to have afforded clear proofs of that by always engaging himself to fight against the strongest enemies of his state and of Greece, and by always placing himself in the forefront of the struggle. When the enemy were willing to join battle with him, it was not by their panic flight that he won victory, but it was after overcoming them in stubborn fighting that he set up a trophy, leaving behind him imperishable memorials of his own valour, and bearing in his own body visible tokens of the fury of his fighting, so that not by hearsay but by the evidence of their own eyes men could judge what manner of man he was. In truth the trophies of Agesilaus are not to be counted by telling how many he set up, the number of his campaigns is the number of them. His mastery was in no way less complete when the enemy were unwilling to accept battle, but it was gained at less risk and with more profit to the state and to the allies. So in the great games the unchallenged champion is crowned no less than he who has fought to conquer. Of his wisdom I find the evidence in every one of his deeds. Towards his fatherland he behaved in such a manner that, being entirely obedient to her, he won the obedience of the citizens, and by his zeal for his comrades he held the unquestioning devotion of his friends, and as for his troops, he gained at once their obedience and their affection. Surely nothing is wanting to the strength of that battle line in which obedience results in perfect discipline, and affection for the general produces faithful promptitude. As for the enemy, though they were forced to hate, he gave them no chance to disparage him. For he contrived that his allies always had the better of them, by the use of deception when occasion offered, by anticipating their action if speed was necessary, by hiding when it suited his purpose, and by practicing all the opposite methods when dealing with enemies to those which he applied when dealing with friends. Night, for example, was to him as day. And day as night. For he often veiled his movements so completely that none could guess where he was, whither he was going, or what he meant to do. Thus he made even strong positions untenable to the enemy, turning one, scaling another, snatching a third by stealth. On the march, whenever he knew that the enemy could bring him to an engagement if they chose, he would lead his army in close order, alert and ready to defend himself, moving on as quietly as a modest maiden, since he held that this was the best means of maintaining calm, of avoiding panic, confusion, and blundering, and of guarding against a surprise attack. And so, by using such methods, he was formidable to his enemies, and inspired his friends with strength and confidence. Thus he was never despised by his foes, never brought to account by the citizens, never blamed by his friends, but throughout his career he was praised and idolized by all the world. 7. Of his patriotism it would be a long task to write in complete detail. For there is no single action of his, I think, that does not illustrate that quality. To speak briefly, we all know that when Agesilaus thought he would be serving his fatherland he never shirked toil, never shrank from danger, never spared money, never excused himself on the score of bodily weakness or old age, but believed that it is the duty of a good king to do as much good as possible to his subjects. Among the greatest services he rendered to his fatherland I reckon the fact that, though the most powerful man in the state, he was clearly a devoted servant of the laws. For who would be minded to disobey when he saw the king obeying? Who would turn revolutionist, thinking himself defrauded of his due, when he knew that the king was ready to yield in accordance with the laws? Here was a man whose behavior to his political opponents was that of a father to his children, though he would chide them for their errors he honored them when they did a good deed. And stood by them when any disaster befell them. Deeming no citizen an enemy, willing to praise all, counting the safety of all again, and reckoning the destruction even of a man of little worth as a loss. He clearly reckoned that if the citizens should continue to live in peaceful submission to the laws, the fatherland would always prosper and that she would be strong when the Greeks were prudent. Again, if it is honourable in one who is a Greek to be a friend to the Greeks, what other general has the world seen unwilling to take a city when he thought that it would be sacked, or who looked on victory in a war against Greeks as a disaster? Now when a report reached Agesilaus that eight Lacedaemonians and near ten thousand of the enemy had fallen at the Battle of Corinth, instead of showing pleasure, he actually exclaimed, Alas for thee! Hellas! Those who now lie dead were enough to defeat all the barbarians in battle had they lived. And when the Corinthian exiles told him that the city was about to be surrendered to them and pointed to the engines with which they were confident of taking the walls, he would not make an assault, declaring that Greek cities ought not to be enslaved, but chastened. And if, he added, we are going to annihilate the erring members of our own race, let us beware lest we lack men to help in the conquest of the barbarians.
or again, if it is honourable to hate the Persian because in old days he set out to enslave Greece, and now allies himself with that side which offers him the prospect of working the greater mischief, makes gifts to those who, as he believes, will injure the Greeks most in return, negotiates the peace that he thinks most certain to produce war among us well, everyone can see these things, but who except Agesilaus has ever striven either to bring about the revolt of a tribe from the Persian, or to save a revolting tribe from destruction, or by some means or other to involve the great king in trouble so that he will be unable to annoy the Greeks. Nay. When his fatherland was actually at war with Greeks. He did not neglect the common good of Greece, but went out with a fleet to do what harm he could to the barbarian. 8. Another quality that should not go unrecorded is his urbanity. For although he held honour in fee, and had power at his beck, and to these added sovereignty sovereignty not plotted against but regarded with affection yet no traces of arrogance could have been detected in him, where are signs of a fatherly affection and readiness to serve his friends, even if unsought, were evident. He delighted, moreover, to take his part in light talk, yet he showed an eager sympathy with friends in all their serious concerns. Thanks to his optimism, good humour, and cheerfulness he was a centre of attraction to many, who came not merely for purposes of business, but to pass the day more pleasantly. Little inclined to boastfulness himself, he heard without annoyance the self-praise of others, thinking that, by indulging in it, they did no harm and gave earnest of high endeavour. On the other hand, one must not omit a reference to the dignity that he showed on appropriate occasions. Thus, when the Persian envoy who came with call the ace, the Lacedaemonian, handed him a letter from the great king containing offers of friendship and hospitality, he declined to accept it. Tell his majesty, he said to the bearer, that there is no need for him to send me private letters, but, if he gives proof of friendship for Lacedaemon, and goodwill towards Greece, I on my part will be his friend with all my heart. But if he is found plotting against them, let him not hope to have a friend in me, however many letters I may receive. In this contempt for the king's hospitality, as nothing in comparison with the approval of the Greeks, I find one more reason for praising Agesilaus. Admirable too was his opinion that it is not for the ruler with the deeper coffers and the longer role of subjects to set himself above his rival. But for him who is the better leader of the better people. Again, an instance of his foresight that I find worthy of praise is this, believing it to be good for Greece that as many satraps as possible should revolt from the king, he was not prevailed on either by gifts or by the king's power to accept his hospitality, but was careful not to give cause to those who wanted to revolt for mistrusting him. There is yet another side of his character that everyone must admire. It was the belief of the Persian king that by possessing himself of colossal wealth, he would put all things in subjection to himself. In this belief he tried to engross all the gold, all the silver and all the most costly things in the world. Agesilaus, on the contrary, adopted such a simple style in his home that he needed none of these things. If anyone doubts this, let him mark what sort of a house contented him, and in particular, let him look at the doors, one might imagine that they were the very doors that Aristodemus, the descendant of Heracles set up with his own hands in the days of his homecoming. Let him try to picture the scene within, note how he entertained on days of sacrifice, hear how his daughter used to go down to Amicle in a public car. And so, thanks to this nice adjustment of his expenditure to his income, he was never compelled to commit an act of injustice for the sake of money. Doubtless it is thought noble to build oneself fortresses impregnable to an enemy, but in my judgment it is far nobler to fortify one's own soul against all the assaults of lucre, of pleasure, and of fear. 9. I will next point out the contrast between his behaviour and the imposture of the Persian king. In the first place the Persian thought his dignity required that he should be seldom seen, Agesilaus delighted to be constantly visible, believing that, where a secrecy was becoming to an ugly career, the light shed luster on a life of noble purpose. In the second place, the one prided himself on being difficult of approach, the other was glad to make himself accessible to all and the one affected tardiness in negotiation, the other was best pleased when he could dismiss his suitors quickly with their requests granted. In the matter of personal comfort, moreover, it is worth noticing how much simpler and how much more easily satisfied were the tastes of Agesilaus. The Persian king has vintner scouring every land to find some drink that will tickle his palate, an army of cooks contrives dishes for his delight, and the trouble his lackeys take that he may sleep is indescribable. But Agesilaus, thanks to his love of toil, enjoyed any drink that was at hand and any food that came his way, and any place was good enough to give him soft repose. 
nor was he happy only in this behavior, he was also proud to reflect that, while he was surrounded with good cheer, he saw the barbarian constrained to draw from the ends of the world the material for his enjoyment, if he would live without discomfort. And it cheered his heart to know that he could accommodate himself to the divine ordering of the world. Whereas he saw his rival shunning heat and shunning cold through weakness of character, imitating the life, not of brave men, but of the weakest of the brutes. Surely, too, he did what was seemly and dignified when he adorned his own estate with works and possessions worthy of a man, keeping many hounds and war horses, but persuaded his sister Siniska to breed chariot horses, and showed by her victory that such a stud marks the owner as a person of wealth, but not necessarily of merit. How clearly his true nobility comes out in his opinion that a victory in the chariot race over private citizens would add not a wit to his renown, but if he held the first place in the affection of the people, gained the most friends and best all over the world, outstripped all others in serving his fatherland and his comrades and in punishing his adversaries, then he would be victor in the noblest and most splendid contests, and would gain high renown both in life and after death. 10. Such, then, are the qualities for which I praise a Jessalors. These are the marks that distinguish him, say, from the man who, lighting on a treasure, becomes wealthier but not wiser in business, or from the man who wins victory through an outbreak of sickness among the enemy, and adds to his success but not to his knowledge of strategy. The man who is foremost in endurance when the hour comes for toil, in valour when the contest calls for courage, in wisdom when the need is for counsel he is the man, I think, who may fairly be regarded as the perfect embodiment of goodness. If line and rule are a noble discovery of man as aids to the production of good work, I think that the virtue of a Jessalors may well stand as a noble example for those to follow who wish to make moral goodness a habit. For who that imitates a pious, a just, a sober, a self-controlled man, can come to be unrighteous, unjust, violent, wanton? In point of fact, a Jessalors prided himself less on reigning over others than on ruling himself. Less on leading the people against their enemies than on guiding them to all virtue. However, let it not be thought, because one whose life is ended is the theme of my praise, that these words are meant for a funeral dirge. They are far more truly the language of eulogy. In the first place the words now applied to him are the very same that he heard in his lifetime. And, in the second place, what theme is less appropriate to a dirge than a life of fame and a death well timed? What more worthy of eulogies than victories most glorious and deeds of sovereign worth? Justly may the man be counted blessed who was in love with glory from early youth and won more of it than any man of his age, who, being by nature very covetous of honour, never once knew defeat from the day that he became a king, who, after living to the utmost limit of human life, died without one blunder to his account, either concerning the men whom he led or in dealing with those on whom he made war. 11. I propose to go through the story of his virtue again, and to summarise it. In order that the praise of it may be more easily remembered. A Jessalors reverenced holy places even when they belonged to an enemy, thinking that he ought to make allies of the gods no less in hostile than in friendly countries. To suppliants of the gods, even if his foes, he did no violence, believing it unreasonable to call robbers of temples sacrilegious and yet to consider those who dragged suppliants from altars pious men. My hero never failed to dwell on his opinion that the gods have pleasure in righteous deeds no less than in holy temples. In the hour of success he was not puffed up with pride, but gave thanks to the gods. He offered more sacrifices when confident than prayers when in doubt. He was wont to look cheerful when in fear, and to be humble when successful. Of his friends he welcomed most heartily not the most powerful, but the most devoted. He hated not the man who defended himself when injured, but such as showed no gratitude for a favour. He rejoiced to see the avaricious poor and to enrich the upright desiring to render right more profitable than wrong. It was his habit to associate with all sorts and conditions of men, but to be intimate with the good. Whenever he heard men praise or blame others, he thought that he gained as much insight into the character of the critics as of the persons they criticised. If friends proved deceivers he forbore to blame their victims, but he heaped reproaches on those who let an enemy deceive them, and he pronounced deception clever or wicked according as it was practised on the suspicious or the confiding. The praise of those who were prepared to censure faults they disapproved was pleasing to him, and he never resented candour, but avoided dissimulation like a snare. Slanderers he hated more than thieves, deeming loss of friends graver than loss of money. The mistakes of private persons he judged leniently, because few interests suffer by their incompetence, but the errors of rulers he treated as serious, since they lead to many troubles. Kingship, he held. Demands not indolence. But manly virtue. 
He would not allow a statue of himself to be set up, though many wanted to give him one, but on memorials of his mind he labored unceasingly, thinking the one to be the sculptor's work, the other his own, the one appropriate to the rich, the other to the good. In the use of money he was not only just but generous, thinking that a just man may be content to leave other men's money alone, but the generous man is required also to spend his own in the service of others. He was ever God-fearing, believing that they who are living life well are not yet happy, but only they who have died gloriously are blessed. He held it a greater calamity to neglect that which is good knowingly than in ignorance. No fame attracted him unless he did the right work to achieve it. He seemed to me one of the few men who count virtue not a task to be endured but a comfort to be enjoyed. At any rate praise gave him more pleasure than money. Courage, as he displayed it, was joined with prudence rather than boldness. And wisdom he cultivated more by action than in words. Very gentle with friends, he was very formidable to enemies, and while he resisted fatigue obstinately, he yielded most readily to a comrade, though fair deeds appealed more to his heart than fair faces. To moderation in times of prosperity he added confidence in the midst of danger. His urbanity found its habitual expression not in jokes but in his manner, and when on his dignity, he was never arrogant, but always reasonable, at least, if he showed his contempt for the haughty, he was humbler than the average man. For he prided himself on the simplicity of his own dress and the splendid equipment of his army, on a strict limitation of his own needs and a boundless generosity to his friends. Added to this, he was the bitterest of adversaries, but the mildest of conquerors, wary with enemies, but very compliant to friends. While ever ensuring security to his own side, he ever made it his business to bring to naught the designs of his enemy. By his relatives, he was described as devoted to his family, by his intimates as an unfailing friend, by those who served him as unforgetful, by the oppressed as a champion, by his comrades in danger as a savior second to the gods. In one respect, I think, he was unique. He proved that, though the bodily strength decays, the vigor of good men's souls is ageless. At any rate, he never wearied in the pursuit of great and noble glory so long as his body could support the vigor of his soul. What man's youth, then, did not seem weaker than his old age? For who in his prime was so formidable to his foes as a Jessalors at the very limit of human life? Whose removal brought such welcome relief to the enemy as the death of a Jessalors, despite his years? Who gave such confidence to allies as a Jessalors, though now on the threshold of death? What young man was more regretted by his friends than Agesilaus, though he died full of years? So complete was the record of his service to his fatherland that it did not end even when he died, he was still a bountiful benefactor of the state when he was brought home to be laid in his eternal resting place, and, having raised up monuments of his virtue throughout the world, was buried with royal ceremony in his own land. Constitution of the Lacedaemonians. Translated by E. C. Marchant. It occurred to me one day that Sparta, though among the most thinly populated of states, was evidently the most powerful and most celebrated city in Greece, and I fell to wondering how this could have happened. But when I considered the institutions of the Spartans, I wondered no longer. Lycurgus, who gave them the laws that they obey, and to which they owe their prosperity, I do regard with wonder, and I think that he reached the utmost limit of wisdom. For it was not by imitating other states, but by devising a system utterly different from that of most others, that he made his country preeminently prosperous. First, to begin at the beginning, I will take the begetting of children. In other states the girls who are destined to become mothers and are brought up in the approved fashion, live on the very plainest fare, with a most meagre allowance of delicacies. Wine is either withheld altogether, or, if allowed them, is diluted with water. The rest of the Greeks expect their girls to imitate the sedentary life that is typical of handicraftsmen. To keep quiet and do wool work. How, then, is it to be expected that women so brought up will bear fine children? But Lycurgus thought the labor of slave women sufficient to supply clothing. He believed motherhood to be the most important function of freeborn woman. Therefore, in the first place, he insisted on physical training for the female no less than for the male sex, moreover, he instituted races and trials of strength for women competitors as for men, believing that if both parents are strong they produce more vigorous offspring. He noticed, too, that, during the time immediately succeeding marriage, it was usual elsewhere for the husband to have unlimited intercourse with his wife. The rule that he adopted was the opposite of this, for he laid it down that the husband should be ashamed to be seen entering his wife's room or leaving it. With this restriction on intercourse the desire of the one for the other must necessarily be increased. 
and their offspring was bound to be more vigorous than if they were surfeited with one another. In addition to this, he withdrew from men the right to take a wife whenever they chose, and insisted on their marrying in the prime of their manhood, believing that this too promoted the production of fine children. It might happen, however, that an old man had a young wife, and he observed that old men keep a very jealous watch over their young wives. To meet these cases he instituted an entirely different system by requiring the elderly husband to introduce into his house some man whose physical and moral qualities he admired, in order to beget children. On the other hand, in case a man did not want to cohabit with his wife and nevertheless desired children of whom he could be proud, he made it lawful for him to choose a woman who was the mother of a fine family and of high birth, and if he obtained her husband's consent, to make her the mother of his children. He gave his sanction to many similar arrangements. For the wives want to take charge of two households. And the husbands want to get brothers for their sons. Brothers who are members of the family and share in its influence, but claim no part of the money. Thus his regulations with regard to the begetting of children were in sharp contrast with those of other states. Whether he succeeded in populating Sparta with a race of men remarkable for their size and strength anyone who chooses may judge for himself. 2. Having dealt with the subject of birth. I wish next to explain the educational system of Lycurgus, and how it differs from other systems. In the other Greek states parents who profess to give their sons the best education place their boys under the care and control of a moral tutor as soon as they can understand what is said to them, and send them to a school to learn letters, music and the exercises of the wrestling ground. Moreover, they soften the children's feet by giving them sandals, and pamper their bodies with changes of clothing, and it is customary to allow them as much food as they can eat. Lycurgus, on the contrary, instead of leaving each father to appoint a slave to act as tutor, gave the duty of controlling the boys to a member of the class from which the highest offices are filled, in fact to the warden as he is called. He gave this person authority to gather the boys together, to take charge of them and to punish them severely in case of misconduct. He also assigned to him a staff of youths provided with whips to chastise them when necessary. And the result is that modesty and obedience are inseparable companions at Sparta. Instead of softening the boys' feet with sandals he required them to harden their feet by going without shoes. He believed that if this habit were cultivated it would enable them to climb hills more easily and descend steep inclines with less danger, and that a youth who had accustomed himself to go barefoot would leap and jump and run more nimbly than a boy in sandals. And instead of letting them be pampered in the matter of clothing, he introduced the custom of wearing one garment throughout the year, believing that they would thus be better prepared to face changes of heat and cold. As to the food, he required the prefect to bring with him such a moderate amount of it that the boys would never suffer from repletion, and would know what it was to go with their hunger unsatisfied. For he believed that those who underwent this training would be better able to continue working on an empty stomach, if necessary, and would be capable of carrying on longer without extra food, if the word of command were given to do so, they would want fewer delicacies and would accommodate themselves more readily to anything put before them, and at the same time would enjoy better health. He also thought that a diet which made their body slim would do more to increase their height than one that consisted of flesh-forming food. On the other hand, lest they should feel too much the pinch of hunger, while not giving them the opportunity of taking what they wanted without trouble he allowed them to alleviate their hunger by stealing something. It was not on account of a difficulty in providing for them that he encouraged them to get their food by their own cunning. No one, I suppose, can fail to see that. Obviously a man who intends to take to thieving must spend sleepless nights and play the deceiver and lie in ambush by day, and moreover, if he means to make a capture. He must have spies ready. There can be no doubt, then, that all this education was planned by him in order to make the boys more resourceful in getting supplies, and better fighting men. Someone may ask, but why, if he believed stealing to be a fine thing, did he have the boy who was caught beaten with many stripes? I reply, because in all cases men punish a learner for not carrying out properly whatever he is taught to do. So the Spartans chastise those who get caught for stealing badly. He made it a point of honour to steal as many cheeses as possible, from the altar of Artemis or Thea. But appointed others to scourge the thieves, meaning to show thereby that by enduring pain for a short time one may win lasting fame and felicity. It is shown herein that where there is need of swiftness, the slothful, as usual, gets little profit and many troubles. In order that the boys might never lack a ruler even when the warden was away, he gave authority to any citizen who chanced to be present to require them to do anything that he thought right, and to punish them for any misconduct. 
This had the effect of making the boys more respectful, in fact boys and men alike respect their rulers above everything. And that a ruler might not be lacking to the boys even when no grown man happened to be present, he selected the keenest of the prefects, and gave to each the command of a division. And so at Sparta the boys are never without a ruler. I think I ought to say something also about intimacy with boys, since this matter also has a bearing on education. In other Greek states. For instance among the Boeotians, man and boy live together, like married people, elsewhere, among the Aeleans, for example, consent is won by means of favours. Some, on the other hand, entirely forbid suitors to talk with boys. The customs instituted by Lycurgus were opposed to all of these. If someone, being himself an honest man, admired a boy's soul and tried to make of him an ideal friend without reproach and to associate with him, he approved and believed in the excellence of this kind of training. But if it was clear that the attraction lay in the boy's outward beauty, he banned the connection as an abomination, and thus he caused lovers to abstain from boys no less than parents abstain from sexual intercourse with their children and brothers and sisters with each other. I am not surprised, however, that people refuse to believe this. For in many states the laws are not opposed to the indulgence of these appetites. I have now dealt with the Spartan system of education. And that of the other Greek states. Which system turns out men more obedient, more respectful, and more strictly temperate, anyone who chooses may once more judge for himself. 3. When a boy ceases to be a child. And begins to be a lad, others release him from his moral tutor and his schoolmaster, he is then no longer under a ruler and is allowed to go his own way. Here again Lycurgus introduced a wholly different system. For he observed that at this time of life self will make strong root in a boy's mind, a tendency to insolence manifests itself, and a keen appetite for pleasure in different forms takes possession of him. At this stage, therefore, he imposed on him a ceaseless round of work, and contrived a constant round of occupation. The penalty for shirking the duties was exclusion from all future honours. He thus caused not only the public authorities, but their relations also to take pains that the lads did not incur the contempt of their fellow citizens by flinching from their tasks. Moreover, wishing modesty to be firmly rooted in them, he required them to keep their hands under their cloaks, to walk in silence, not to look about them. But to fix their eyes on the ground. The effect of this rule has been to prove that even in the matter of decorum the male is stronger than the female sex. At any rate you would expect a stone image to utter a sound sooner than those lads, you would sooner attract the attention of a bronze figure, you might think them more modest even than a young bride in the bridal chamber. When they have taken their place at a public meal, you must be content if you can get an answer to a question. Such was the care that he bestowed on the growing lads. 4. For those who had reached the prime of life he showed by far the deepest solicitude. For he believed that if these were of the right stamp they must exercise a powerful influence for good on the state. He saw that where the spirit of rivalry is strongest among the people, there the choruses are most worth hearing and the athletic contests afford the finest spectacle. He believed, therefore, that if he could match the young men together in a strife of valour, they too would reach a high level of manly excellence. I will proceed to explain, therefore, how he instituted matches between the young men. The ephors, then, pick out three of the very best among them. These three are called commanders of the guard. Each of them enrolls a hundred others, stating his reasons for preferring one and rejecting another. The result is that those who fail to win the honour are at war both with those who sent them away and with their successful rivals, and they are on the watch for any lapse from the code of honour. Here then you find that kind of strife that is dearest to the gods. And in the highest sense political the strife that sets the standard of a brave man's conduct, and in which either party exerts itself to the end that it may never fall below its best, and that, when the time comes, every member of it may support the state with all his might. And they are bound, too, to keep themselves fit, for one effect of the strife is that they spar whenever they meet, but anyone present has a right to part the combatants. If anyone refuses to obey the mediator the warden takes him to the ephors, and they fine him heavily, in order to make him realize that he must never yield to a sudden impulse to disobey the laws. To come to those who have passed the time of youth, and are now eligible to hold the great offices of state. While absolving these from the duty of bestowing further attention on their bodily strength, the other Greeks require them to continue serving in the army. But Lycurgus established the principle that for citizens of that age, hunting was the noblest occupation. Except when some public duty prevented, in order that they might be able to stand the fatigues of soldiering as well as the younger men. 
5. I have given a fairly complete account of the institutions of Lycurga so far as they apply to the successive stages of life. I will now try to describe the system that he established for all alike. Lycurgus found the Spartans boarding at home like the other Greeks, and came to the conclusion that the custom was responsible for a great deal of misconduct. He therefore established the public messes outside in the open, thinking that this would reduce disregard of orders to a minimum. The amount of food he allowed was just enough to prevent them from getting either too much or too little to eat. But many extras are supplied from the spoils of the chase, and for these rich men sometimes substitute wheat and bread. Consequently the board is never bare until the company breaks up, and never extravagantly furnished. Another of his reforms was the abolition of compulsory drinking. Which is the undoing alike of body of mind. But he allowed everyone to drink when he was thirsty, believing that drink is then most harmless and most welcome. Now what opportunity did these public messes give a man to ruin himself or his estate by gluttony or wine-bibbing? Note that in other states the company usually consists of men of the same age, where modesty is apt to be conspicuous by its absence from the board. But Lycurgus introduced mixed companies at Sparta, so that the experience of the elders might contribute largely to the education of the juniors. In point of fact, by the custom of the country the conversation at the public meals turns on the great deeds wrought in the state. And so there is little room for insolence or drunken uproar, for unseemly conduct or indecent talk. And the system of feeding in the open has other good results. They must needs walk home after the meal, and, of course, must take good care not to stumble under the influence of drink, for they know that they will not stay on at the table, and they must do in the dark what they do in the day. Indeed, those who are still in the army are not even allowed a torch to guide them. Lycurgus had also observed the effects of the same rations on the hard worker and the idler, that the former has a fresh colour, firm flesh and plenty of vigour, while the latter looks puffy, ugly and weak. He saw the importance of this, and reflecting that even a man who works hard of his own will because it is his duty to do so, looks in pretty good condition. He required the senior for the time being in every gymnasium to take care that the task set should be not too small for the rations allowed. And I think that in this matter too he succeeded. So it would not be easy to find healthier or handier men than the Spartans. For their exercises train the legs, arms and neck equally. 6. In the following respects. Again, his institutions differ from the ordinary type. In most states every man has control of his own children, servants and goods. Lycurgus wanted to secure that the citizens should get some advantage from one another without doing any harm. He therefore gave every father authority over other men's children as well as over his own. When a man knows that fathers have this power, he is bound to rule the children over whom he exercises authority as he would wish his own to be ruled. If a boy tells his own father when he has been whipped by another father, it is a disgrace if the parent does not give his son another whipping. So completely do they trust one another not to give any improper orders to the children. He also gave the power of using other men's servants in case of necessity, and made sporting dogs common property to this extent, that any who want them invite their master, and if he is engaged himself he is glad to send the hounds. A similar plan of borrowing is applied to horses also. Thus a man who falls ill or wants a carriage or wishes to get to some place quickly, if he sees a horse anywhere, takes and uses it carefully and duly restores it. There is yet another among the customs instituted by him which is not found in other communities. It was intended to meet the needs of parties belated in the hunting field with nothing ready to eat. He made a rule that those who had plenty should leave behind the prepared food, and that those who needed food should break the seals, take as much as they wanted, seal up the rest and leave it behind. The result of this method of going shares with one another is that even those who have but little receive a share of all that the country yields whenever they want anything. 7. Nor does this exhaust the list of the customs established by Lycurgus at Sparta that are contrary to those of the other Greeks. In other states, I suppose, all men make as much money as they can. One is a farmer, another a ship owner, another a merchant, and others live by different handicrafts. But at Sparta Lycurgus forbade freeborn citizens to have anything to do with business affairs. He insisted on their regarding as their own concern only those activities that make for civic freedom. Indeed, how should wealth be a serious object there, when he insisted on equal contributions to the food supply and on the same standard of living for all, and thus cut off the attraction of money for indulgence's sake? Why, there is not even any need of money to spend on cloaks, for their adornment is due not to the price of their clothes, but to the excellent condition of their bodies. 
nor yet is there any reason for amassing money in order to spend it on one's messmates, for he made it more respectable to help one's fellows by toiling with the body than by spending money. Pointing out that toil is an employment of the soul. Spending an employment of wealth. By other enactments he rendered it impossible to make money in unfair ways. In the first place the system of coinage that he established was of such a kind that even a sum of ten minae could not be brought into a house without the master and the servants being aware of it, the money would fill a large space and need a wagon to draw it. Moreover, there is a right of search for gold and silver, and, in the event of discovery, the possessor is fined. Why, then, should money-making be a preoccupation in a state where the pains of its possession are more than the pleasures of its enjoyment? 8. To continue, we all know that obedience to the magistrates and the laws is found in the highest degree in Sparta. For my part, however, I think that Lycurgus did not so much as attempt to introduce this habit of discipline until he had secured agreement among the most important men in the state. I base my inference on the following facts. In other states the most powerful citizens do not even wish it to be thought that they fear the magistrates, they believe such fear to be a badge of slavery. But at Sparta the most important men show the utmost deference to the magistrates, they pride themselves on their humility, on running instead of walking to answer any call, in the belief that, if they lead, the rest will follow along the path of eager obedience. And so it has proved. It is probable also that these same citizens helped to set up the office of Ephor, having come to the conclusion that obedience is a very great blessing whether in a state or an army or a household. For they thought that the greater the power of these magistrates the more they would impress the minds of the citizens. Accordingly, the ephors are competent to fine whom they choose, and have authority to enact immediate payment, they have authority also to deprive the magistrates of office, and even to imprison and prefer a capital charge against them. Possessing such wide power they do not, like other states, leave persons elected to office to rule as they like throughout the year, but in common with despots and the presidents of the games, they no sooner see anyone breaking the law than they punish the offender. Among many excellent plans contrived by Lycurgus for encouraging willing obedience to the laws among the citizens, I think one of the most excellent was this, before delivering his laws to the people he paid a visit to Delphi, accompanied by the most important citizens, and inquired of the god whether it was desirable and better for Sparta that she should obey the laws that he himself had framed. Only when the god answered that it was better in every way did he deliver them. After enacting that to refuse obedience to laws given by the Pythian god was not only unlawful but wicked. 9. The following achievement of Lycurgus, again, deserves admiration. He caused his people to choose an honourable death in preference to a disgraceful life. And, in fact, one would find on consideration that they actually lose a smaller proportion of their men than those who prefer to retire from the danger zone. To tell the truth, escape from premature death more generally goes with valour than with cowardice, for valour is actually easier and pleasanter and more resourceful and mightier and obviously glory adheres to the side of valour, for all men want to ally themselves somehow with the brave. However, it is proper not to pass over the means by which he contrived to bring about this result. Clearly, what he did was to ensure that the brave should have happiness, and the coward misery. For in other states when a man proves a coward, the only consequence is that he is called a coward. He goes to the same market as the brave man, sits beside him. Attends the same gymnasium. If he chooses. But in Lacedaemon everyone would be ashamed to have a coward with him at the mess or to be matched with him in a wrestling bout. Often when sides are picked for a game of ball he is the odd man left out, in the chorus he is banished to the ignominious place. In the streets he is bound to make way, when he occupies a seat he must needs give it up, even to a junior, he must support his spinster relatives at home and must explain to them why they are old maids, he must make the best of a fireside without a wife, and yet pay forfeit for that, he may not stroll about with a cheerful countenance, nor behave as though he were a man of unsullied fame, or else he must submit to be beaten by his betters. Small wonder, I think, that where such a load of dishonour is laid on the coward, death seems preferable to a life so dishonoured, so ignominious. 10. The law by which Lycurgus encouraged the practice of virtue up to old age is another excellent measure in my opinion. By requiring men to face the ordeal of election to the council of elders near the end of life, he prevented neglect of high principles even in old age. Worthy of admiration also is the protection that he afforded to the old age of good men. For the enactment by which he made the elders judges in trials on the capital charge caused old age to be held in greater honour than the full vigour of manhood. And surely it is natural that of all contests in the world this should excite the greatest zeal. 
For noble as other contests in the games, they are merely tests of bodily powers. But the contest for the council judges souls whether they be good. As much then, as the soul surpasses the body, so much more worthy are the contests of the soul to kindle zeal than those of the body. Again, the following surely entitles the work of Lycurgus to high admiration. He observed that where the cult of virtue is left to voluntary effort, the virtuous are not strong enough to increase the fame of their fatherland. So he compelled all men at Sparta to practice all the virtues in public life. And therefore, just as private individuals differ from one another in virtue according as they practice or neglect it, so Sparta, as a matter of course, surpasses all other states in virtue, because she alone makes a public duty of gentlemanly conduct. For was not this too a noble rule of his? That whereas other states punish only for wrong done to one's neighbour. He inflicted penalties no less severe on any who openly neglected to live as good a life as possible. For he believed, it seems, that enslavement, fraud, robbery, are crimes that injure only the victims of them, but the wicked man and the coward are traitors to the whole body politic. And so he had good reason, I think, for visiting their offences with the heaviest penalties. And he laid on the people the duty of practising the whole virtue of a citizen as a necessity irresistible. For to all who satisfied the requirements of his code he gave equal rights of citizenship, without regard to bodily infirmity or want of money. But the coward who shrank from the task of observing the rules of his code he caused to be no more reckoned among the peers. Now that these laws are of high antiquity there can be no doubt, for Lycurgus is said to have lived in the days of the Heraclidae. Nevertheless, in spite of their antiquity, they are wholly strange to others even at this day. Indeed, it is most astonishing that all men praise such institutions, but no state chooses to imitate them. 11. The blessings that I have enumerated so far were shared by all alike in peace and in war. But if anyone wishes to discover in what respect Lycurgus' organization of the army on active service was better than other systems, here is the information that he seeks. The ephors issue a proclamation stating the age limit fixed for the Levi, first for the cavalry and infantry, and then for the handicraftsmen. Thus the Lacedaemonians are well supplied in the field with all things that are found useful in civil life. All the implements that an army may require in common are ordered to be assembled, some in carts, some on baggage animals, thus anything missing is not at all likely to be overlooked. In the equipment that he devised for the troops in battle he included a red cloak. Because he believed this garment to have least resemblance to women's clothing and to be most suitable for war. And a brass shield, because it is very soon polished and tarnishes very slowly. He also permitted men who were past their first youth to wear long hair, believing that it would make them look taller, more dignified, and more terrifying. The men so equipped were divided into six regiments of cavalry and infantry. The officers of each citizen regiment comprise one colonel, four captains, eight first lieutenants and sixteen second lieutenants. These regiments at the word of command form section sometimes, two, sometimes three, and sometimes six abreast. The prevalent opinion that the Laconian infantry formation is very complicated is the very reverse of the truth. In the Laconian formation the front-ranked men are all officers, and each file has all that it requires to make it efficient. The formation is so easy to understand that no one who knows man from man can possibly go wrong. For some have the privilege of leading, and the rest are under orders to follow. Orders to wheel from column into line of battle are given verbally by the second lieutenant acting as a herald and the line is formed either thin or deep, by wheeling. Nothing whatever in these movements is difficult to understand. To be sure, the secret of carrying on in a battle with any troops at hand when the line gets into confusion is not so easy to grasp, except for soldiers trained under the laws of Lycurgus. The Lacedaemonians also carry out with perfect ease maneuvers that instructors in tactics think very difficult. Thus, when they march in column, every section of course follows in the rear of the section in front of it. Suppose that at such a time an enemy in order of battle suddenly makes his appearance in front, the word is passed to the second lieutenant to deploy into line to the left, and so throughout the column until the battle line stands facing the enemy. Or again, if the enemy appears in the rear while they are in this formation, each file countermarches, in order that the best men may always be face to face with the enemy. True. The leader is then on the left. But instead of thinking this a disadvantage, they regard it as a positive advantage at times. For should the enemy attempt a flanking movement he would try to encircle them, not on the exposed but on the protected side. If, however, 
It seems better for any reason that the leader should be on the right wing, the left wing wheels, and the army countermarches by ranks until the leader is on the right, and the rear of the column on the left. If, on the other hand, an enemy force appears on the right when they are marching in column, all that they have to do is to order each company to wheel to the right so as to front the enemy like a man of war, and thus again the company at the rear of the column is on the right. If again an enemy approaches on the left, they do not allow that either, but either push him back or wheel their companies to the left to face him, and thus the rear of the column finds itself on the left. 12. I will now explain the method of encampment approved by Lycurgus. Seeing that the angles of a square are useless, he introduced the circular form of camp, except where there was a secure hill or wall, or a river afforded protection in the rear. He caused sentries to be posted by day facing inwards along the place where the arms were kept, for the object of these is to keep an eye not on the enemy but on their friends. The enemy is watched by cavalry from positions that command the widest outlook. To meet the case of a hostile approach at night, he assigned the duty of acting as sentries outside the lines to the Syrity. In these days the duty is shared by foreigners, if any happen to be present in the camp. The rule that patrols invariably carry their spears, has the same purpose, undoubtedly, as the exclusion of slaves from the place of arms. Nor is it surprising that sentries who withdraw for necessary purposes only go so far away from one another and from the arms as not to cause inconvenience. Safety is the first object of this rule also. The camp is frequently shifted with the double object of annoying their enemies and of helping their friends. Moreover the law requires all Lacedaemonians to practice gymnastics regularly throughout the campaign, and the result is that they take more pride in themselves and have a more dignified appearance than other men. Neither walk nor racecourse may exceed in length the space covered by the regiment, so that no one may get far away from his own arms. After the exercises the senior colonel gives the order by herald to sit down. This is their method of inspection. And next to take breakfast and to relieve the outposts quickly. After this there are amusements and recreations until the evening exercises. These being finished, the herald gives the order to take the evening meal, and, as soon as they have sung to the praise of the gods to whom they have sacrificed with good omens, to rest by the arms. Let not the length to which I run occasion surprise, for it is almost impossible to find any detail in military matters requiring attention that is overlooked by the Lacedaemonians. 13. I will also give an account of the power and honour that Lycurgus conferred on the king in the field. In the first place, while on military service the king and his staff are maintained by the state. The colonels mess with the king, in order that constant intercourse may give better opportunities for taking counsel together in case of need. Three of the peers also attend the king's mess. These three take entire charge of the commissariat for the king and his staff. So th that these may devote all their time to affairs of war. But I will go back to the beginning, and explain how the king sets out with an army. First he offers up sacrifice at home to Zeus the leader and to the gods associated with him. If the sacrifice appears propitious, the firebearer takes fire from the altar and leads the way to the borders of the land. There the king offers sacrifice again to Zeus and Athena. Only when the sacrifice proves acceptable to both these deities does he cross the borders of the land. And the fire from these sacrifices leads the way and is never quenched, and animals for sacrifice of every sort follow. At all times when he offers sacrifice, the king begins the work before dawn of day, wishing to forestall the goodwill of the god. And at the sacrifice are assembled colonels, captains, lieutenants, commandants of foreign contingents, commanders of the baggage train, and, in addition, any general from the states who chooses to be present. There are also present two of the ephors, who interfere in nothing except by the king's request, but keep an eye on the proceedings, and see that all behave with a decorum suitable to the occasion. When the sacrifices are ended, the king summons all and delivers the orders of the day. And so, could you watch the scene, you would think all other men mere improvisers in soldiering and the Lacedaemonians the only artists in warfare. When the king leads, provided that no enemy appears, no one precedes him except the Syrity and the mounted vedettes. But if ever they think there will be fighting, he takes the lead of the first regiment and wheels to the right, until he is between two regiments and two colonels. The troops that are to support these are marshalled by the senior member of the king's staff. The staff consists of all peers who are members of the royal mess, seers, doctors, flute players, commanding officers and any volunteers who happen to be present. Thus nothing that has to be done causes any difficulty. For everything is duly provided for. 
The following arrangements made by Lycurgus with a view to the actual fighting are also, in my opinion, very useful. When a goat is sacrificed, the enemy being near enough to see, custom ordains that all the flute players present are to play and every Lacedaemonian is to wear a wreath. An order is also given to Polish arms. It is also the privilege of the young warrior to comb his hair. Before entering battle, to look cheerful and earn a good report. Moreover, the men shout words of encouragement to the subaltern, for it is impossible for each subaltern to make his voice travel along the whole of his section to the far end. The colonel is responsible for seeing that all is done properly. When the time for encamping seems to have arrived, the decision rests with the king, who also indicates the proper place. On the other hand the dispatch of embassies whether to friends or enemies is not the king's affair. All who have any business to transact deal in the first instant with the king. Suitors for justice are remitted by the king to the court of Hellenodiki, applications for money to the treasurers, and if anyone brings booty, he is sent to the auctioneers. With this routine the only duties left to the king on active service are to act as priest in matters of religion and as general in his dealings with the men. 14. Should anyone ask me whether I think that the laws of Lycurga still remain unchanged at this day, I certainly could not say that with any confidence whatever. For I know that formerly the Lacedaemonians preferred to live together at home with moderate fortunes rather than expose themselves to the corrupting influences of flattery as governors of dependent states. And I know too that in former days they were afraid to be found in possession of gold, whereas nowadays there are some who even boast of their possessions. There were alien acts in former days, and to live abroad was illegal. And I have no doubt that the purpose of these regulations was to keep the citizens from being demoralized by contact with foreigners. And now I have no doubt that the fixed ambition of those who are thought to be first among them is to live to their dying day as governors in a foreign land. There was a time when they would fain be worthy of leadership, but now they strive far more earnestly to exercise rule than to be worthy of it. Therefore in times past the Greeks would come to Lacedaemon and beg her to lead them against reputed wrongdoers, but now many are calling on one another to prevent a revival of Lacedaemonian supremacy. Yet we need not wonder if these reproaches are leveled at them, since it is manifest that they obey neither their god nor the laws of Lycurgus. 15. I wish also to give an account of the compact made by Lycurgus between king and state. For this is the only government that continues exactly as it was originally established, whereas other constitutions will be found to have undergone and still to be undergoing modifications. He ordained that the king shall offer all the public sacrifices on behalf of the state. In virtue of his divine descent, and that, whatever may be the destination to which the state sends out an army, he shall be its leader. He also gave him the right to receive certain parts of the beasts sacrificed, and assigned to him enough choice land in many of the outlander cities to ensure him a reasonable competent without excessive riches. In order that even the kings should mess in public, he assigned to them a public mess tent, he also honoured them with a double portion at the meal, not that they might eat enough for two, but that they might have the wherewithal to honour anyone whom they chose. He also allowed each king to choose two messmates, who are called Pythiae. Further, he granted them to take of every litter of pigs a porker, that a king may never want victims, in case he wishes to seek counsel of the gods. A lake near the house supplies abundance of water, and how useful that is for many purposes none know so well as those who are without it. Further, all rise from their seats when the king appears, only the ephors do not rise from their official chairs. And they exchange oaths monthly, the ephors on behalf of the state, the king for himself. And this is the king's oath, I will reign according to the established laws of the state. And this the oath of the state, while you abide by your oath, we will keep the kingship unshaken. These then are the honours that are bestowed on the king at home during his lifetime, and they do not greatly exceed those of private persons. For it was not the wish of Lycurgus to put into the king's hearts despotic pride, nor to implant in the mind of the citizens envy of their power. As for the honours assigned to the king at his death, the intention of the laws of Lycurgus herein is to show that they have preferred the kings of the Lacedaemonians in honour not as mere men, but as demigods. Ways and Means Translated by E. C. Marchant. 1. For my part one have always held that the constitution of a state reflects the character of the leading politicians. But some of the leading men at Athens have stated that they recognize justice as clearly as other men, but, they have said, owing to the poverty of the masses, we are forced to be somewhat unjust in our treatment of the cities. This set me thinking whether by any means the citizens might obtain food entirely from their own soil, which would certainly be the fairest way. I felt that, were this so, they would be relieved of their poverty, and also of the suspicion with which they are regarded by the Greek world. 
Now as I thought over my ideas, one thing seemed clear at once, that the country is by its nature capable of furnishing an ample revenue. To drive home the truth of this statement I will first describe the natural properties of Attica. The extreme mildness of the seasons here is shown by the actual products. At any rate, plants that will not even grow in many countries bear fruit here. Not less productive than the land is the sea around the coasts. Notice too that the good things which the gods send in their season all come in earlier here and go out later than elsewhere. And the preeminence of the land is not only in the things that bloom and wither annually, she has other good things that last forever. Nature has put in her abundance of stone, from which are fashioned lovely temples and lovely altars, and goodly statues for the gods. Many Greeks and barbarians alike have need of it. Again, there is land that yields no fruit if sown, and yet, when quarried, feeds many times the number it could support if it grew corn. And recollect, there is silver in the soil, the gift, beyond doubt, of divine providence, at any rate, many as are the states near to her by land and sea, into none of them does even a thin vein of silver or extend. One might reasonably suppose that the city lies at the centre of Greece, nay of the whole inhabited world. For the further we go from her, the more intense is the heat or cold we meet with, and every traveller who would cross from one to the other end of Greece passes Athens as the centre of a circle. Whether he goes by water or by road. Then, too, though she is not wholly sea-girt, all the winds of heaven bring to her the goods she needs and bear away her exports, as if she were an island, for she lies between two seas, and she has a vast land trade as well, for she is of the mainland. Further, on the borders of most states dwell barbarians who trouble them, but the neighbouring states of Athens are themselves remote from the barbarians. 2. All these advantages, as I have said, are, I believe, due to the country itself. But instead of limiting ourselves to the blessings that may be called indigenous, suppose that, in the first place, we studied the interests of the resident aliens. For in them we have one of the very best sources of revenue, in my opinion, in Asmuk as they are self-supporting and, so far from receiving payment for the many services they render to states, they contribute by paying a special tax. I think that we should study their interests sufficiently. If we relieve them of the duties that seem to impose a certain measure of disability on the resident alien without conferring any benefit on the state. And also of the obligation to serve in the infantry along with the citizens. Apart from the personal risk, it is no small thing to leave their trades and their private affairs. The state itself too would gain if the citizens served in the ranks together, and no longer found themselves in the same company with Lydians, Phrygians, Syrians, and barbarians of all sorts, of whom a large part of our alien population consists. In addition to the advantage of dispensing with the services of these men, it would be an ornament to the state that the Athenians should be thought to rely on themselves rather than on the help of foreigners in fighting their battles. If, moreover, we granted the resident aliens the right to serve in the cavalry and various other privileges which it is proper to grant them, I think that we should find their loyalty increase and at the same time should add to the strength and greatness of the state. Then again, since there are many vacant sites for houses within the walls, if the state allowed approved applicants to erect houses on these and granted them the freehold of the land, I think that we should find a larger and better class of persons desiring to live at Athens. And if we appointed a board of guardians of aliens analogous to the guardians of orphans, and some kind of distinction were earmarked for guardians whose list of resident aliens was longest, that too would add to the loyalty of the aliens, and probably all without a city would covet the right of settling in Athens, and would increase our revenues. 3. I shall now say something of the unrivaled amenities and advantages of our city as a commercial centre. In the first place, I presume, she possesses the finest and safest accommodation for shipping, since vessels can anchor here and ride safe at their moorings in spite of bad weather. Moreover, at most other ports merchants are compelled to ship a return cargo, because the local currency has no circulation in other states, but at Athens they have the opportunity of exchanging their cargo and exporting very many classes of goods that are in demand, or, if they do not want to ship a return cargo of goods, it is sound business to export silver, for, wherever they sell it, they are sure to make a profit on the capital invested. If prizes were offered to the magistrates of the market for just and prompt settlement of disputes, so that sailings were not delayed, the effect would be that a far larger number of merchants would trade with us and with much greater satisfaction. It would also be an excellent plan to reserve front seats in the theatre for merchants and shipowners. And to offer them hospitality occasionally. When the high quality of their ships and merchandise entitles them to be considered benefactors of the state. With the prospect of these honours before them they would look on us as friends and hasten to visit us to win the honour as well as the profit.
the rise in the number of residents and visitors would of course lead to a corresponding expansion of our imports and exports, of sales, rents and customs. Now such additions to our revenues as these need cost us nothing whatever beyond benevolent legislation and measures of control. Other methods of raising revenue that I have in mind will require capital, no doubt. Nevertheless I venture to hope that the citizens would contribute eagerly towards such objects, when I recall the large sums contributed by the state when Lysistratus was in command and troops were sent to aid the Arcadians, and again in the time of Hegesilios. I am also aware that large expenditure is frequently incurred to send warships abroad, though none can tell whether the venture will be for better or worse, and the only thing certain is that the subscribers will never see their money back nor even enjoy any part of what they contribute. But no investment can yield them so fine a return as the money advanced by them to form the capital fund. For every subscriber of 10 mini, drawing 3 obols a day, gets nearly 20%. As much as he would get on bottomry, and every subscriber of five mini gets more than a third of his capital back in interest. But most of the Athenians will get over a hundred percent. In a year, for those who advance one mina will draw an income of nearly two mini, guaranteed by the state, which is to all appearances the safest and most durable of human institutions. I think, too, that if their names were to be recorded in the role of benefactors for all time, many foreigners also would subscribe, and a certain number of states would be attracted by the prospect of enrollment. I believe that even kings and despots and oriental governors would desire to share in this reward. When funds were sufficient, it would be a fine plan to build more lodging houses for shipowners near the harbours, and convenient places of exchange for merchants, also hotels to accommodate visitors. Again, if houses and shops were put up both in the Piraeus and in the city for retail traders. They would be an ornament to the state, and at the same time the source of a considerable revenue. Moreover, I think it would be a good plan to take a hint from the state ownership of public warships, and to see whether it be possible to acquire a fleet of public merchant vessels and to lease them under securities, like our other public property. For if this proved to be practicable, these vessels would yield another large revenue. For, as for the silver mines. I believe that if a proper system of working were introduced, a vast amount of money would be obtained from them apart from our other sources of revenue. I want to point out the possibilities of these mines to those who do not know. For, once you realize their possibilities, you will be in a better position to consider how the mines should be managed. Now, we all agree that the mines have been worked for many generations. At any rate, no one even attempts to date the beginning of mining operations. And yet, although digging and the removal of the silver ore have been carried on for so long a time, note how small is the size of the dumps compared with the virgin and silver-laden hills. And it is continually being found that, so far from shrinking, the silver-yielding area extends further and further. Well, so long as the maximum number of workmen was employed in them, no one ever wanted a job, in fact, there were always more jobs than the labourers could deal with. And even at the present day no owner of slaves employed in the mines reduces the number of his men. On the contrary, every master obtains as many more as he can. The fact is, I imagine, that when there are few diggers and searchers, the amount of metal recovered is small, and when there are many, the total of ore discovered is multiplied. Hence of all the industries with which I am acquainted this is the only one in which expansion of business excites no jealousy. Further than this, every farmer can tell just how many yoke of oxen are enough for the farm and how many labourers. To put more on the land than the requisite number is counted loss. In mining undertakings, on the contrary, everyone tells you that he is short of labour. Mining, in fact, is quite different from other industries. An increase in the number of coppersmiths, for example, produces a fall in the price of copper work, and the coppersmiths retire from business. The same thing happens in the iron trade. Again, when corn and wine are abundant, the crops are cheap. And the profit derived from growing them disappears. So that many give up farming and set up as merchants or shopkeepers or moneylenders. But an increase in the amount of the silver or discovered and of the metal one is accompanied by an increase in the number of persons who take up this industry. Neither is silver like furniture, of which a man never buys more when once he has got enough for his house. No one ever yet possessed so much silver as to want no more, if a man finds himself with a huge amount of it, he takes as much pleasure in burying the surplus as in using it. Mark too that, whenever states are prosperous, silver is in strong demand. The men will spend money on fine arms and good horses and magnificent houses and establishments, and the women go in for expensive clothes and gold jewellery. 
If, on the other hand, the body politic is diseased owing to failure of the harvest or to war, the land goes out of cultivation and there is a much more insistent demand for cash to pay for food and mercenaries. If anyone says that gold is quite as useful as silver. I am not going to contradict him, but I know this, that when gold is plentiful, silver rises and gold falls in value. With these facts before us, we need not hesitate to bring as much labor as we can get into the mines and carry on work in them, feeling confident that the ore will never give out and that silver will never lose its value. I think, indeed, that the state has anticipated me in this discovery, at any rate she throws open the mining industry to foreigners on the same terms as are granted to citizens. To make myself clearer on the subject of alimony, I will now explain how the mines may be worked with the greatest advantage to the state. Not that I expect to surprise you by what I am going to say, as if I had found the solution of a difficult problem. For some things that I shall mention are still to be seen by anyone at the present day, and as for conditions in the past, our fathers have told us that they were similar. But what may well excite surprise is that the state, being aware that many private individuals are making money out of her, does not imitate them. Those of us who have given thought to the matter have heard long ago, I imagine, that Nisha's son of Niceratus once owned a thousand men in the mines, and let them out to Socius the Thracian, on condition that Sozias paid him an obol a day per man net and filled all vacancies as they occurred. Hipponicus, again, had six hundred slaves let out on the same terms and received a rent of a mina a day net. Philomenides had three hundred, and received half a mina. There were others too. Owning numbers in proportion, I presume, to their capital. But why dwell on the past? At this day there are many men in the mines let out in this way. Were my proposals adopted, the only innovation would be, that just as private individuals have built up a permanent income by becoming slave owners, so the state would become possessed of public slaves, until there were three for every citizen. Whether my plan is workable, let anyone who chooses judge for himself by examining it in detail. So let us take first the cost of the men. Clearly the treasury is in a better position to provide the money than private individuals. Moreover the council can easily issue a notice inviting all and sundry to bring slaves, and can buy those that are brought to it. When once they are purchased, why should there be more hesitation about hiring from the treasury than from a private person, the terms offered being the same? At any rate men hire consecrated lands and houses. And farm taxes under the state. The treasury can ensure the slaves purchased by requiring some of the lessees to become guarantors, as it does in the case of the tax farmers. In fact a tax farmer can swindle the state more easily than a lessee of slaves. For how are you to detect the export of public money? Money looks the same whether it is private property or belongs to the state. But how is a man to steal slaves when they are branded with the public mark and it is a penal offence to sell or export them? So far, then, it appears to be possible for the state to acquire and to keep men. But, one may ask, when labor is abundant, how will a sufficient number of persons be found to hire it? Well, if anyone feels doubtful about that, let him comfort himself with the thought that many men in the business will hire the state slaves as additional hands, since they have abundance of capital, and that among those now working in the mines many are growing old. Moreover there are many others. Both Athenians and foreigners who have neither will nor strength to work with their own hands, but would be glad to to make a living by becoming managers. Assume, however, that the total number of slaves to begin with is 1200. By using the revenue derived from these the number might in all probability be raised to 6000 at the least in the course of five or six years. Further, if each man brings in a clear obol a day, the annual revenue derived from that number of men is 60 talents. Out of this sum, if 20 talents are invested in additional slaves, the state will have 40 talents available for any other necessary purpose. And when a total of 10,000 men is reached, the revenue will be 100 talents. But the state will receive far more than that, as anyone will testify who is old enough to remember how much the charge for slave labor brought in before the trouble at Decelia. And there is another proof. During the history of the mines an infinite number of men has worked in them. And yet the condition of the mines today is exactly the same as it was in the time of our ancestors, and their memory ran not to the contrary. And present conditions all lead to the conclusion that the number of slaves employed there can never be greater than the work's need. For the miners find no limit to shaft or gallery. And, mark you, it is as possible now to open new veins as in former times. Nor can one say with any certainty whether the ore is more plentiful in the area already under work or in the unexplored tracts. 
Then why, it may be asked, are fewer new cuttings made nowadays than formerly? Simply because those interested in the mines are poorer. For operations have only lately been resumed, and a man who makes a new cutting incurs a serious risk. If he strikes good stuff he makes a fortune, but if he is disappointed, he loses the money he has spent. Therefore people nowadays are very chary of taking such a risk. However, I think I can meet this difficulty too. And suggest a plan that will make the opening of new cuttings a perfectly safe undertaking. The Athenians, of course, are divided into ten tribes. Now assume that the state were to offer each tribe an equal number of slaves, and that when new cuttings were made, the tribes were to pool their luck. The result would be that if one tribe found silver, the discovery would be profitable to all, and if two, three, four, or half the tribes found, the profits from these works would obviously be greater. Nothing that has happened in the past makes it probable that all would fail to find. Of course, private individuals also are able to combine on this principle and pool their fortunes in order to diminish the risk. Nevertheless there is no reason to fear that a public company formed on this plan will conflict with the interests of private persons, or be hampered by them. No, just as every new adhesion to a confederacy brings an increase of strength to all its members. So the greater the number of persons operating in the mines, the more treasure they will discover and unearth. I have now explained what regulations I think should be introduced into the state in order that every Athenian may receive sufficient maintenance at the public expense. Some may imagine that enough money would never be subscribed to provide the huge amount of capital necessary, according to their calculations, to finance all these schemes. But even so they need not despair. For it is not essential that the plan should be carried out in all its details in order that any advantage may come of it. No, whatever the number of houses built, or of ships constructed, or of slaves purchased, they will immediately prove a paying concern. In fact in one respect it will be even more profitable to proceed gradually than to do everything at once. For if everybody begins building, we shall pay more for worse work than if we carry out the undertaking gradually, and if we try to find an enormous number of slaves. We shall be forced to buy inferior men at a high price. By proceeding as our means allow, we can repeat whatever is well conceived and avoid the repetition of mistakes. Besides, were the whole scheme put in hand at once, we should have to find the whole of the money, but if some parts were proceeded with and others postponed, the income realized would help to provide the amount still required. Possibly the gravest fear in everyone's mind is that the works may become overcrowded if the state acquires too many slaves. But we can rid ourselves of that fear by not putting more men in year by year than the works themselves require. Accordingly I hold that this, which is the easiest way, is also the best way of doing these things. On the other hand, if you think that the burdens imposed during the late war make it impossible for you to contribute anything at all well, keep down the cost of administration during the next year to the amount that the taxes yielded before the peace. And invest the balances over and above that amount. Which you will get with peace, with considerate treatment of resident aliens and merchants, with the growth of imports and exports due to concentration of a larger population, and with the expansion of harbour and market dues, so that the investment will bring in the largest revenue. Or again, if any fear that this scheme would prove worthless in the event of war breaking out, they should observe that, with this system at work, war becomes far more formidable to the aggressors than to the city. For what instrument is more serviceable for war than men? We should have enough of them to supply crews to many ships of the state, and many men available for service in the ranks as infantry could press the enemy hard, if they were treated with consideration. But I reckon that, even in the event of war, the mines need not be abandoned. There are, of course, two fortresses in the mining district, one at Anaphlistus on the south side, the other at Thoricus on the north. The distance between them is about seven miles and a half. Now suppose that we had a third stronghold between them on the highest point of Basa. The works would then be linked up by all the fortresses, and at the first intimation of a hostile movement. Every man would have but a short distance to go in order to reach safety. In case an enemy came in force, he would, no doubt, seize any corn or wine or cattle that he found outside, but the silver ore, when he had got it, would be of as much use to him as a heap of stones. And how could an enemy ever go for the mines? The distance between Megara, the nearest city, and the silver mines, is of course much more than 500 furlongs, and Thebes, which is next in proximity, lies at a distance of much more than 600 furlongs from them. Let us assume, then, that an enemy is marching on the mines from some such point. 
he is bound to pass Athens, and if his numbers are small, he is likely to be destroyed by our cavalry and patrols. On the other hand, to march on them with a large force, leaving his own property unprotected, is no easy matter, for when he arrived at the mines the city of Athens would be much nearer to his own states than he himself would be. But even supposing that he should come, how is he to stay without supplies? And to send part of their forces in search of food may mean destruction to the foraging party and failure to achieve the ends for which he is contending, or if the whole force is continually foraging it will find itself blockaded instead of blockading. However, the rent derived from the slaves would not be the only source of relief to the community. With the concentration of a large population in the mining district, abundant revenue would be derived from the local market, from state-owned houses near the silver mines, from furnaces and all the other sources. For a densely populated city would grow up there, if it were organized on this plan, yes, and building sites would become as valuable there as they are in our suburbs. If the plans that I have put forward are carried out, I agree that, apart from the improvement in our financial position, we shall become a people more obedient, better disciplined, and more efficient in war. For the classes undergoing physical training will take more pains in the gymnasium when they receive their maintenance in full than they take under the superintendence of the torch races. And the classes on garrison duty in a fortress, or serving as targeteers, or patrolling the country will show greater alacrity in carrying out all these duties when the maintenance is duly supplied for the work done. 5. If it seems clear that the state cannot obtain a full revenue from all sources unless she has peace, is it not worthwhile to set up a board of guardians of peace? Were such a board constituted, it would help to increase the popularity of the city and to make it more attractive and more densely thronged with visitors from all parts. If any are inclined to think that a lasting peace for our city will involve a loss of her power and glory and fame in Greece, they too, in my opinion, are out in their calculations. For I presume that those states are reckoned the happiest that enjoy the longest period of unbroken peace, and of all states Athens is by nature most suited to flourish in peace. For if the state is tranquil, what class of men will not need her? Shipowners and merchants will head the list. Then there will be those rich in corn and wine and oil and cattle, men possessed of brains and money to invest, craftsmen and professors and philosophers, poets and the people who make use of their works, those to whom anything sacred or secular appeals that is worth seeing or hearing. Besides, where will those who want to buy or sell many things quickly meet with better success in their efforts than at Athens? No one, I dare say, contests this, but there are some who wish the state to recover her ascendancy, and they may think that it is more likely to be won by war than by peace. Let such, in the first place, call to mind the Persian wars. Was it by coercing the Greeks or by rendering services to them that we became leaders of the fleet and treasurers of the league funds? Further, after the state had been stripped of her empire through seeming to exercise her authority with excessive harshness. Did not the islanders even then restore to us the presidency of the fleet by their own free will? When we refrained from acts of injustice? And again, did not the bands place themselves under the leadership of the Athenians in return for our good offices? Yet once again, it was not the effect of coercion on our part, but of generous treatment, that the Lacedaemonians permitted the Athenians to arrange the leadership as they chose. And now, owing to the confusion prevalent in Greece, an opportunity, I think, has fallen to the state to win back the Greeks without trouble, without danger, and without expense. For she has it in her power to try to reconcile the warring states, she has it in her power to compose the factions contending in their midst. And were it apparent that you are striving to make the Delphic shrine independent, as it used to be, not by joining in war, but by sending embassies up and down Greece, I for my part should not be in the least surprised if you found the Greeks all of one mind. Banded together by oath and united in alliance against any that attempted to seize the shrine in the event of the Phocians abandoning it. Were you to show also that you are striving for peace in every land and on every sea, I do think that, next to the safety of their own country, all men would put the safety of Athens first in their prayers. If, on the other hand, any one supposes that financially war is more profitable to the state than peace, I really do not know how the truth of this can be tested better than by considering once more what has been the experience of our state in the past he will find that in old days a very great amount of money was paid into the treasury in time of peace, and that the whole of it was spent in time of war, he will conclude on consideration that in our own time the effect of the late war on our revenues was that many of them ceased, while those that came in were exhausted by the multitude of expenses, whereas the cessation of war by sea has been followed by a rise in the revenues, and has allowed the citizens to devote them to any purpose. They choose. But someone may ask me. 
Do you mean to say that, even if she is wronged, the state should remain at peace with the offender? No, certainly not, but I do say that our vengeance would follow far more swiftly on our enemies if we provoked nobody by wrongdoing, for then they would look in vain for an ally. 6. Well now. Surely, if none of these proposals is impossible or even difficult, if by carrying them into effect we shall be regarded with more affection by the Greeks, shall live in greater security, and be more glorious, if the people will be maintained in comfort and the rich no more burdened with the expenses of war, if with a large surplus in hand we shall celebrate our festivals with even more splendor than at present, shall restore the temples, and repair the walls and docks, and shall give. Back to priests, counsellors, magistrates, knights their ancient privileges, surely, I say, our proper course is to proceed with this scheme forthwith, that already in our generation we may come to see our city secure and prosperous. Furthermore, if you decide to go forward with the plan, I should advise you to send to Dodona and Delphi, and inquire of the gods whether such a design is fraught with weal for the state both now and in days to come. And should they consent to it? Then I would say that we ought to ask them further. Which of the gods we must propitiate in order that we may prosper in our handiwork? Then, when we have offered an acceptable sacrifice to the gods named in their reply, it behoves us to begin the work. For with heaven to help us in what we do, it is likely that our undertakings will go forward continually to the greater wheel of the state. On the Cavalry Commander. Translated by E. C. Marchant. 1. The first duty is to sacrifice to the gods and pray them to grant you the thoughts, words and deeds likely to render your command most pleasing to the gods and to bring yourself, your friends and your city the fullest measure of affection and glory and advantage. Having gained the goodwill of the gods, you have then to recruit a sufficient number of mounted men that you may bring the number up to the total required by the law, and also may prevent any decrease in the cavalry establishment. Unless additional recruits are enrolled in the force, the number will constantly dwindle, for some men are bound to retire through old age and others to drop off for various reasons. While the ranks are filling up, you must see that the horses get enough food to stand hard work, since horses unfit for their work can neither overtake nor escape. You must see that they are docile, because disobedient animals assist the enemy more than their own side. And horses that kick when mounted must be got rid of. For such brutes often do more mischief than the enemy. You must also look after their feet, so that they can be ridden on rough ground, for you know that wherever galloping is painful to them, they are useless. Having made sure that the horses are in good condition, the next business is to train the men. First they must learn to mount from the spring, since many before now have owed their lives to that. Secondly, they must practice riding over all sorts of ground, since any kind of country may become the area of war. As soon as they have acquired a firm seat, your next task is to take steps that as many as possible shall be able to throw the javelin when mounted and shall become efficient in all the details of horsemanship. After that both horses and men must be armed, so that, while they are themselves thoroughly protected against wounds, they may have the means of inflicting the greatest loss on the enemy. Then you must contrive to make the men obedient, otherwise neither good horses nor a firm seat nor fine armor are of any use. For ensuring efficiency in all these matters the cavalry commander, as a matter of course, is the principal authority. But, at the same time, the state thinks it difficult for the cavalry commander to carry out all these duties single-handed, therefore, it also elects colonels of regiments to assist him, and it has charged the council with the duty of taking a share in the management of the cavalry. I think it well, then, that you should encourage the colonels to be as eager as yourself for the efficiency of the cavalry, and should have suitable spokesmen in the council, that their speeches may alarm the men they will do better under the influence of fear and may also appease the wrath of the council, in case it shows indignation at the wrong time. Here, then, you have brief notes on the matters that demand your attention. I will now try to explain how these duties may best be carried out in detail. As for the men, you must obviously raise them as required by the law. From among those who are most highly qualified by wealth and bodily vigor, either by obtaining an order of the court or by the use of persuasion. The cases that should be brought before the court, I think, are those of men who otherwise might be suspected of having bribed you not to apply for a judgment. For the smaller men will at once have a ground for escaping, unless you first compel the most highly qualified to serve. I think, too, that, by dwelling on the brilliancy of horsemanship, you might fire some of the young men with ambition to serve in the cavalry, and that you might overcome the opposition of their guardians by informing them that they will be required to keep horses by someone, if not by you, on account of their wealth, whereas, if their boys join up during your command, you will put an end to their extravagance in buying expensive horses, and see that they soon make good riders. 
and you must try to suit your actions to your words. As for the existing cavalry, I think that the council should give notice that in future double the amount of exercise will be required, and that any horse unable to keep up will be rejected. This warning would put the screw on the men and make them feed their horses better and take more care of them. I think it would be well, too, if notice were given that vicious horses would be rejected. Under the stimulus of this threat men would break in such animals more thoroughly and would be more careful in buying horses. Again, it would be well to give notice that horses found kicking at exercise will be rejected. For it is impossible even to keep such animals in line, in a charge against an enemy they are bound to lag behind, and the consequence is, that through the bad behaviour of his horse, the man himself becomes useless. For getting horses' feet into the best condition, if anyone has an easier and cheaper method than mine, by all means adopt it. If not, I hold and I speak from experience. That the right way is to throw down some stones from the road, averaging about a pound in weight, and to curry the horse on these and to make him stand on them whenever he goes out of the stable. For the horse will constantly use his feet on the stones when he is cleaned and when he is worried by flies. Try it, and you will find your horse's feet round, and will believe in the rest of my rules. Assuming that the horses are in good condition, I will explain how to make the men themselves thoroughly efficient. We would persuade the young recruits to learn for themselves how to mount from the spring, but if you provide an instructor, you will receive well-merited praise. The way to help the older men is to accustom them to get a leg up in the Persian fashion. To ensure that the men have a firm seat, whatever the nature of the ground, it is, perhaps, too much trouble to have them out frequently when there is no war going on, but you should call the men together. And recommend them to practice turning off the roads and galloping over all sorts of ground when they are riding to quarters or any other place. For this does as much good as taking them out, and it is less tedious. It is useful to remind them that the state supports an expenditure of nearly 40 talents a year in order that she may not have to look about for cavalry in the event of war, but may have it ready for immediate use. For with this thought in their minds the men are likely to take more pains with their horsemanship, so that when war breaks out they may not have to fight untrained for the state, for glory and for life. It is well also to give notice to the men that you intend to take them out yourself some day, and lead them over country of all kinds. And during the manoeuvres that precede the sham fight it is proper to take them out to a different piece of country at different times, this is better for both men and horses. As for throwing the javelin on horseback. I think that the greatest number will practice that if you add a warning to the colonels that they will be required to ride to javelin exercise themselves at the head of the marksmen of the regiment. Thus, in all probability, every one of them will be eager to turn out as many marksmen as possible for the service of the state. Towards the proper arming of the men, I think that the greatest amount of assistance will be obtained from the colonels, if they are persuaded that from the point of view of the state the brilliance of the regiment is a far more glorious ornament to them than the brightness of their own accoutrements only. It is likely that they will not be hard to persuade in such matters, considering that honour and glory were the attractions that the colonelcy held out to them, and they can arm the men in accordance with the regulations laid down in the law without incurring expense themselves, afterwards compelling the men to spend their pay on their arms, as the law ordains. To make the men who are under your command obedient, it is important to impress on them by word of mouth the many advantages of obedience to authority and no less important to see that good discipline brings gain and insubordination loss in every respect. The best way of inducing every colonel to take pride in commanding a well-equipped regiment, I think, is to arm your company of couriers as well as you can, to demand of them constant practice in the use of the javelin, and to instruct them in it after making yourself proficient. And if you could offer prizes to the regiments for skill in all the feats that the public expects the cavalry to perform at the spectacles, I think this would appeal strongly to the spirit of emulation in every Athenian. For evidence of this I may refer to the choruses, in which many labours and heavy expenses are the price paid for trifling rewards. Only you must find judges whose suffrage will shed lustre on a victory. 2. When your men are well trained in all these points. They must, of course, understand some plan of formation, that in which they will show to greatest advantage in the sacred processions and at manoeuvres, fight, if need be, with the greatest courage, and move along roads and cross rivers with perfect ease in unbroken order. So I will now try to explain the formation that I think will give the best results in these various circumstances. Now the state has divided the cavalry into ten separate regiments. I hold that within these you should, to begin with, appoint file leaders after consulting each of the colonels, choosing sturdy men, who are bent on winning fame by some brilliant deed. These should form the front rank. 
Next you should choose an equal number of the oldest and most sensible to form the rear rank. To use an illustration, steel has most power to cut through steel when its edge is keen and its back reliable. To fill the ranks between the front and rear. The file leaders should choose the men to form the second line. And these in turn the men to form the third, and so on throughout. In this way every man will naturally have complete confidence in the man behind him. You must be very careful to appoint a competent man as leader in the rear. For if he is a good man, his cheers will always hearten the ranks in front of him in case it becomes necessary to charge. Or, should the moment come to retreat, his prudent leadership will, in all probability, do much for the safety of his regiment. An even number of file leaders has this advantage over an odd, that it is possible to divide the regiment into a larger number of equal parts. The reasons why I like this formation are these. In the first place, all the men in the front rank are officers, and the obligation to distinguish themselves appeals more strongly to men when they are officers than when they are privates. Secondly, when anything has to be done, the word of command is much more effective if it is passed to officers rather than to privates. Let us assume that this formation has been adopted, every file leader must know his position in the line of march by word passed along by the colonel, just as every colonel is informed by the commander of his proper place in the charge. For when these instructions are given there will be much better order than if the men hamper one another like a crowd leaving the theatre. And in the event of a frontal attack, the men in the van are far more willing to fight when they know that this is their station, so is the rear rank in the event of a surprise attack in the rear, when the men there understand that it is disgraceful to leave their post. But if no order is kept there is confusion whenever the roads are narrow or rivers are being crossed, and when an action is fought no one voluntarily takes his post in the fighting line. All these preliminaries must be thoroughly mastered by all the cavalry, if they are to give their leader unflinching support. 3. Now we come to duties that the cavalry commander must perform himself. First, he must sacrifice to propitiate the gods on behalf of the cavalry, secondly, he must make the processions during the festivals worth seeing, further, he must conduct all the other obligatory displays before the people with as much splendor as possible, that is to say, the reviews in the academy, in the lyceum, at phalarum, and in the hippodrome. These again are only brief notes, and I will now explain exactly how the details of these various functions may be carried out with most splendor. As for the processions, I think they would be most acceptable both to the gods and to the spectators if they included a gala ride in the marketplace. The starting point would be the Hermi, and the cavalry would ride round saluting the gods at their shrines and statues. So at the great Dionysia the dance of the choruses forms part of the homage offered to the twelve and to other gods. When the circuit is completed and the cavalcade is again near the Hermi. The next thing to do, I think, is to gallop at top speed by regiments as far as the Eleusinium. I will add a word on the position in which the lances should be held to prevent crossing. Every man should point his lance between his horse's ears, if the weapons are to look fearsome, stand out distinctly, and at the same time to convey the impression of numbers. The gallop finished and the goal reached, the right plan is to ride back to the temples by the same route but at a slow pace, thus every effect that can be obtained from a horse with a man on his back will be included in the display, to the satisfaction of gods and men alike. I know that our cavalrymen are not accustomed to these movements, but I am sure that they are desirable and beautiful, and will delight the spectators. I am aware, too, that the cavalry have exhibited other novel feats of skill in days when the cavalry commanders had sufficient influence to get their wishes carried out. During the parade at the Lyceum, before the javelin throwing, the right way is to ride in two divisions in line of battle, each division consisting of five regiments with its commander at the head and the colonels, and the line should be so extended that the whole breadth of the course will be covered. As soon as they reach the highest point looking down on the theatre opposite, I think it would clearly be useful if you displayed your men's ability to gallop downhill in fairly large companies. To be sure, I know well enough that, if they feel confident of their ability to gallop, they will welcome the opportunity of showing off their skill, but you must see that they are not short of practice, or the enemy will compel them to do it against their will. The formation that would add most to the beauty of the exercises at the inspections has already been explained. Provided his horse is strong enough, the leader should ride round with the file that is on the outside every time. He will be galloping all the time himself, and the file whose turn it is to be on the outside with him will also be galloping. Thus the eyes of the council will always be on the galloping file, and the horses will get a breathing space, resting by turns. When the hippodrome is the scene of the display, the right plan would be that the men should first be drawn up on a front broad enough to fill the hippodrome with horses and drive out the people standing there. 
In the sham fight when the regiments pursue and fly from one another at the gallop in two squadrons of five regiments. Each side led by its commander, the regiments should ride through one another. How formidable they will look when they charge front to front, how imposing when, after sweeping across the hippodrome, they stand facing one another again, how splendid, when the trumpet sounds and they charge once more at a quicker pace. After the halt, the trumpet should sound once more, and they should charge yet a third time at top speed, and when they have crossed, they should all range themselves in battle line preparatory to being dismissed, and ride up to the council, just as you are accustomed to do. I think that these manoeuvres would look more like war and would have the charm of novelty. It is unworthy of his high rank that a cavalry commander should gallop at a slower pace than the colonels, and ride in the same way as they do. When the ride is to take place in the academy on the hard ground, I have the following recommendations to make. To avoid being thrown the riders should throw the body back in charging. And collect their horses when wheeling, to keep them from falling. In the straight, however, they should gallop. The council will thus watch a safe as well as a beautiful performance. 4. During a march the cavalry commander must always think ahead. In order that he may rest the horses' backs and relieve the men by walking, giving moderate spells of alternate riding and marching. You can't misjudge what is a moderate spell, since every man is himself the measure that will show you when they are getting tired. But when it is uncertain whether you will encounter an enemy on your way to any place, you must give the regiment a rest in turn. For it would be a bad job if all the men were dismounted when the enemy is close at hand. If you are riding along narrow roads, the order must be given to form column, but when you find yourself on broad roads, the order must be given to every regiment to extend front. When you reach open ground, all the regiments must be in line of battle. Incidentally these changes of order are good for practice, and help the men to get over the ground more pleasantly by varying the march with cavalry maneuvers. When riding on difficult ground away from roads. Whether in hostile or friendly country. It is very useful to have some of the aides de camp in advance of each regiment, that they may find a way round into the open in case they come across pathless woodland, and show the men what line they should follow, so that whole companies may not go astray. If your route lies in dangerous country, a prudent commander will have a second advanced guard ahead of his scouts for reconnaissance purposes. For it is useful both for attack and defence to discover an enemy as far off as possible. It is useful also to halt at the passage of a river, that the rear guard may not wear out their horses in chasing their leader. These rules, no doubt, are familiar to nearly everybody, but few will take the trouble to observe them. A cavalry commander should be at pains even in time of peace to acquaint himself with hostile and friendly country alike. In case he is without personal experience, he should at least consult the men in the force who have the best knowledge of various localities. For the leader who knows the roads has a great advantage over one who does not. In making plans against the enemy, too, a knowledge of the district makes a great difference. You must also have taken steps to enlist the services of spies before the outbreak of war. Some of these should be citizens of neutral states, and some merchants, since all states invariably welcome the importer of merchandise. Sham deserters, too, have their use on occasions. Still, you must never neglect to post guards through reliance on spies, on the contrary, your precautions must at all times be as complete as when you have information that the enemy is approaching. For even if the spies are entirely reliable, it is difficult to report at the critical moment, since many things happen in war to hinder them. The advance of cavalry is less likely to be detected by the enemy if orders are not given by a herald or in writing beforehand, but passed along. Accordingly, for this purpose, too, that the order to advance may be given by word of mouth. It is well to post file leaders, and half file leaders behind them, so that each may pass the word to as few men as possible. Thus, too, the half file leaders will wheel and extend the line without confusion, whenever there is occasion to do so. When it is necessary to keep a lookout, I am all in favour of the plan of having hidden outposts and guards. For these serve at once as guards to protect your friends and snares to trap the enemy. And the men, being unseen, are more secure themselves and at the same time more formidable to the enemy. For the enemy, conscious that there are outposts somewhere, but ignorant of their whereabouts and their strength, feels nervous and is forced to suspect every possible position, whereas visible outposts show them where danger lies and where all is safe. Besides, if you conceal your outposts, you will have the chance of luring the enemy into an ambush by placing a few guards in the open to screen the hidden men. Occasionally. 2. 
A cunning trap may be laid by posting a second body of exposed guards behind the men in hiding, for this plan may prove as deceptive to the enemy as the one just referred to. A prudent commander will never take risks unnecessarily. Except when it is clear beforehand that he will have the advantage of the enemy. To play into the enemy's hand may fairly be considered treachery to one's allies rather than courage. Another sound principle is to go for any position where the enemy is weak, even if it is a long way off, since hard work is less dangerous than a struggle against superior forces. But if the enemy places himself somewhere between yourself and fortresses friendly to you, then it is proper to attack him, even if he is greatly superior, on that side where your presence is unsuspected, or on both flanks at once, for when one part of your force is retiring, a charge on the opposite flank will flurry the enemy and rescue your friends. It is an old maxim that, in attempting to discover what the enemy is about, it is well to employ spies. But the best plan of all, in my opinion, is for the commander himself to watch the enemy from some safe coin of vantage, if possible. And take notice of his mistakes. And when anything can be filched by cunning, you should send likely men to steal it, and when anything may be seized you should dispatch troops to seize it. If the enemy is marching on some objective and a part of his force weaker than your own separates from the main body or straggles carelessly, the chance must not be missed, the hunter, however, must always be stronger than the hunted. You can see the point of this if you consider. Even wild creatures less intelligent than man, such as hawks, will grab unguarded plunder and get away into a place of safety before they can be caught. Wolves, again, prey on anything left unprotected and steal things lying in holes and corners, and if a dog does pursue and overtake him, the wolf, if stronger than the dog, attacks him, or if weaker, snatches away the prize and makes off. Moreover, when a pack of wolves feels no fear of a convoy, they arrange themselves so that some shall drive off the convoy. And others seize the plunder. And thus they get their food. Well, if wild beasts show such sagacity, surely any man may be expected to show more wisdom than creatures that are themselves taken by the skill of man. 5. Every horseman should know at what distance a horse can overtake a man on foot. And how much start a slow horse needs to escape from a fast one. A cavalry commander should also be able to judge of the ground where infantry has an advantage over cavalry and where cavalry has an advantage over infantry. He must also have sufficient ingenuity to make a small company of horse look large, and conversely, to make a large one look small, to seem to be absent when present, and present when absent, to know how to deceive, not merely how to steal the enemy's possessions, but also how to conceal his own force and fall on the enemy unexpectedly. Another neat ruse is to create a scare among the enemy when your own position is precarious, so that he may not attack, and to put him in good heart, when it is strong, so that he may make an attempt. Thus you are least likely to come to harm yourself and most likely to catch the enemy tripping. That I may not seem to demand impossibilities, I will add a solution of the problems that seem most puzzling. Success in an attempt to pursue or retreat depends on experience of horses and their powers. But how are you to get this experience? By watching the friendly encounters of the sham fights and noticing what condition the horses are in after the pursuits and flights. When your object is to make the number of your cavalry look large, first take it for an axiom, if possible, not to attempt the ruse when you are near the enemy, for distance gives safety and increases the illusion. Secondly you must know that horses look many when crowded, owing to the animal size, but are easily counted when scattered. Another way of exaggerating the apparent strength of your force is to arm the grooms with lances or even imitation lances, and put them between the cavalrymen, whether you display the cavalry at the halt or wheel it into line. Thus the bulk of the company is bound to look denser and more massive. On the other hand, if your object is to make a large number look small, then, assuming that your ground affords cover, you can obviously conceal your cavalry by having part in the open and part hidden. If, however, the whole of the ground is exposed, you must form the files into rows and wheel, leaving a gap between each two rows, and the men in each file who are next the enemy must hold their lances upright, while the rest keep theirs low down out of sight. The means to employ for scaring the enemy are false ambuscades, false reliefs and false information. An enemy's confidence is greatest when he is told that the other side is in difficulties and is preoccupied. But given these instructions, a man must himself invent a ruse to meet every emergency as it occurs. For there is really nothing more profitable in war than deception. Even children are successful deceivers when they play guess the number, they will hold up a counter or two and make believe that they have got a fistful, and seem to hold up few when they are holding many, so surely men can play similar tricks when they are intent on deceiving in earnest. 
and on thinking over the successes gained in war you will find that most of them, and these the greatest, have been won with the aid of deception. For these reasons either you should not essay to command, or you should pray to heaven that your equipment may include this qualification, and you should contrive on your own part to possess it. For those near the sea two effective ruses are, to strike on land while fitting out ships, and to attack by sea while ostensibly planning a land attack. Another duty of a cavalry commander is to demonstrate to the city the weakness of cavalry destitute of infantry as compared with cavalry that has infantry attached to it. Further, having got his infantry, a cavalry commander should make use of it. A mounted man being much higher than a man on foot, infantry may be hidden away not only among the cavalry but in the rear as well. For the practical application of these devices and any others you may contrive for the undoing of your foes by force or craft, I counsel you to work with God, so that the gods being propitious. Fortune too may favor you. Another ruse that proves highly effective at times is to feign excess of caution and reluctance to take risks. For this pretense often lures the enemy into making a more fatal blunder through want of caution. Or once come to be thought venturesome, and you can give the enemy trouble by merely sitting still and pretending that you are on the point of doing something. 6. However. No man can mould anything to his mind unless the stuff in which he proposes to work lies ready to obey the artist's will. No more can you make anything of men, unless, by God's help, they are ready to regard their commander with friendly feelings and to think him wiser than themselves in the conduct of operations against the enemy. Now the feeling of loyalty will naturally be fostered when the commander is kind to his men, and obviously takes care that they have victuals, and that they are safe in retreat and well protected when at rest. In the garrisons he must show an interest in fodder, tents, water, firewood, and all other supplies, he must show that he thinks ahead and keeps his eyes open for the sake of his men. And when he is doing well the chief's best policy is to give them a share in his good things. To put it shortly, a commander is least likely to incur the contempt of his men if he shows himself more capable than they of doing whatever he requires of them. He must therefore practice every detail of horsemanship mounting and the rest that they may see their commander able to take a ditch without a spill, clear a wall, leap down from a bank and throw a javelin skillfully. For all these feats are so many stepping stones to their respect. If they know him also to be a master of tactics and able to put them in the way of getting the better of the enemy, and if besides, they are certain that he will never lead them against an enemy recklessly or without the god's approval or in defiance of the sacrifices, all these conditions increase the men's readiness to obey their commander. 7. Every commander then, should have intelligence. The Athenian cavalry commander, however, should excel greatly both in the observance of his duty to the gods and in the qualities of a warrior, seeing that he has on his borders rivals in the shape of cavalry as numerous as his and large forces of infantry. And if he attempts to invade the enemy's country without the other armed forces of the state, he will have to take his chance with the cavalry only against both arms. Or if the enemy invades Athenian territory, in the first place, he will certainly not fail to bring with him other cavalry besides his own and infantry in addition, whose numbers he reckons to be more than a match for all the Athenians put together. Now provided that the whole of the city's levies turn out against such a host in defence of their country, the prospects are good. For our cavalrymen, God helping, will be the better, if proper care is taken of them, and our heavy infantry will not be inferior in numbers. And I may add. They will be in as good condition and will show the keener spirit, if only, with God's help, they are trained on the right lines. And, remember, the Athenians are quite as proud of their ancestry as the Boeotians. But if the city falls back on her navy, and is content to keep her walls intact, as in the days when the Lacedaemonians invaded us with all the Greeks to help them, and if she expects her cavalry to protect all that lies outside the walls, and to take its chance unaided against her foes. Why then, I suppose, we need first the strong arm of the gods to aid us, and in the second place it is essential that our cavalry commander should be masterly. For much sagacity is called for in coping with a greatly superior force, an abundance of courage when the call comes. I take it, he must also be able to stand hard work. For if he should elect to take his chance against the army confronting him an army that not even the whole state is prepared to stand up to it is evident that he would be entirely at the mercy of the stronger and incapable of doing anything. But should he guard whatever lies outside the walls with a force that will be just sufficient to keep an eye on the enemy and to remove into safety from as great a distance as possible property that needs saving? 
and a large force is not necessary for this, a small force can keep a lookout as well as a large one, and when it comes to guarding and removing the property of friends, men who have no confidence in themselves or their horses will meet the case, because fear, it seems, is a formidable member of a guard well, it may perhaps be a sound plan to draw on these men for his guards. But if he imagines that the number remaining over and above the guard constitutes an army, he will find it too small, for it will be utterly inadequate to risk a conflict in the open. Let him use these men as raiders, and he will probably have a force quite sufficient for this purpose. His business, it seems to me, is to watch for any blunder on the enemy's part without showing himself, keeping men constantly on the alert and ready to strike. It happens that, the greater is the number of soldiers, the more they are apt to blunder. Either they scatter deliberately in search of provisions. Or they are so careless of order on the march that some get too far ahead. While others lag too far behind. So he must not let such blunders go unpunished, or the whole country will be occupied, only he must take good care to retire the moment he has struck, without giving time for the main supports to arrive on the scene. An army on the march often comes to roads where large numbers have no advantage over small. In crossing rivers, again, a man with his wits about him may dog the enemy's steps without danger and regulate according to his will the number of the enemy that he chooses to attack. Sometimes it is proper to tackle the enemy while his troops are at breakfast or supper or when they are turning out of bed. For at all these moments soldiers are without arms, infantry for a shorter and cavalry for a longer time. Pickets and outposts, however, should be the mark of incessant plots, these being invariably weak in numbers and sometimes remote from their main force. But when the enemy has learned to take due precautions against such attacks, it is proper, with God's help, to enter his country stealthily after ascertaining his strength at various points and the position of his outposts. For no booty that you can capture is so fine as a patrol. Besides, patrols are easily deceived, for they pursue a handful of men at sight, believing that to be their special duty. You must see, however, that your line of retreat does not lead you straight into the enemy supports. 8. It is clear, however, that no troops will be able to inflict loss on a much stronger army with impunity, unless they are so superior in the practical application of horsemanship to war that they show like experts contending with amateurs. This superiority can be attained first and foremost if your marauding bands are so thoroughly drilled in riding that they can stand the hard work of a campaign. For both horses and men that are carelessly trained in this respect will naturally be like women struggling with men. On the contrary, those that are taught and accustomed to jump ditches, leap walls, spring up banks, leap down from heights without a spill, and gallop down steep places, will be as superior to the men and horses that lack this training as birds to beasts. Moreover, those that have their feet well hardened will differ on rough ground from the tender-footed as widely as the sound from the lame. And those that are familiar with the locality, compared with those to whom it is unfamiliar, will differ in the advance and retreat as much as men with eyes differ from the blind. It should also be realized that horses, to be well fettled, must be well fed and thoroughly exercised, so as to do their work without suffering from heaves. And since bits and saddlecloths are fastened with straps, a cavalry leader must never be short of them, for at a trifling expense he will make men in difficulties efficient. In case anyone feels that his troubles will be endless if his duty requires him to practice horsemanship in this way. Let him reflect that men in training for gymnastic contests face troubles far more numerous and exacting than the most strenuous votaries of horsemanship. For most gymnastic exercises are carried out with sweat and drudgery, but nearly all equestrian exercises are pleasant work. For if it is true that any man would like to fly, no action of man bears a closer resemblance to flying. And, remember, it is far more glorious to win a victory in war than in a boxing match, because, whereas the state as well as the victor has a considerable share in this glory, for a victory in war the gods generally crown states with happiness as well. For my part, therefore, I know not why any art should be more assiduously cultivated than the arts of war. It should be noticed that a long apprenticeship to toil enables sea pirates to live at the expense of much stronger folk. On land, too, pillage, though not for those who reap what they have sown is the natural resource of men who are deprived of food. For either men must work or they must eat the fruits of other men's labor, else it is a problem how to live and to obtain peace. If you charge a superior force, you must remember never to leave behind you ground difficult for horses. For a fall in retreat and a fall in pursuit are very different things. I want to add a word of warning against another error. 
Some men, when they suppose themselves to be stronger than the enemy whom they are going to attack, take an utterly inadequate force with them. The consequence is that they are apt to incur the loss they expected to inflict. Or, when they know themselves to be weaker than the enemy, they use all their available strength in the attack. The right procedure, in my opinion, is just the opposite, when the commander expects to win, he should not hesitate to use the whole of his strength, for an overwhelming victory never yet was followed by remorse. But when he tries conclusions with a much stronger force, knowing beforehand that he is bound to retreat when he has done his best, I hold that it is far better in such a case to throw a small part of his strength into the attack than the whole of it, only horses and men alike should be his very best. For such a force will be able to achieve something and to retreat with less risk. But when he has thrown the whole of his strength into an attack on a stronger force, and wants to retire, the men on the slowest mounts are bound to be taken prisoners, others to be thrown through lack of horsemanship, and others to be cut off owing to inequalities in the ground, since it is hard to find a wide expanse of country entirely to your liking. Moreover, owing to their numbers they will collide and hinder and hurt one another frequently. But good horses and men will contrive to escape, especially if you manage to scare the pursuers by using your reserves. Sham ambuscades, too, are helpful for this purpose. It is also useful to discover on what quarter your friends may suddenly reveal themselves in a safe position and make the pursuit slower. Then again it is obvious that in point of endurance and speed the advantage is much more likely to rest with a small than with a large force. I do not mean that mere paucity of numbers will increase the men's powers of endurance and add to their speed, but it is easier to find few men than many who will take proper care of their horses and will practice the art of horsemanship intelligently on their own account. Should it happen at any time that the cavalry forces engaged are about equal, I think it would be a good plan to split each regiment into two divisions, putting one under the command of the colonel, and the other under the best man available. The latter would follow in the rear of the colonel's division for a time, but presently, when the adversary is near, he would wheel on receiving the order and charge. This plan, I think, would make the blow delivered by the regiment more stunning and more difficult to parry. Both divisions should have an infantry contingent. And if the infantry, hidden away behind the cavalry, came out suddenly and went for the enemy, I think they would prove an important factor in making the victory more decisive, for I have noticed that a surprise cheers men up if it is pleasant, but stuns them if it is alarming. Anyone will recognize the truth of this who reflects that, however great their advantage in numbers, men are dazed when they fall into an ambuscade, and that two hostile armies confronting each other are scared out of their wits for the first few days. There is no difficulty in adopting these tactics, but only a good cavalry commander can find men who will show intelligence, reliability and courage in wheeling to charge the enemy. For the commander must be capable both by his words and action of making the men under him realize that it is good to obey, to back up their leader, and to charge home, of firing them with a desire to win commendation. And of enabling them to carry out their intentions with persistence. Suppose now that the cavalry are busy in the no man's land that separates two battle lines drawn up face to face or two strategic positions, wheeling, pursuing and retreating. After such maneuvers both sides usually start off at a slow pace, but gallop at full speed in the unoccupied ground. But if a commander first faints in this manner, and then after wheeling, pursues and retreats at the gallop he will be able to inflict the greatest loss on the enemy, and will probably come through with the least harm, by pursuing at the gallop so long as he is near his own defence, and retreating at the gallop from the enemy's defences. If, moreover, he can secretly leave behind him four or five of the best horses and men in each division, they will be at a great advantage in falling on the enemy as he is turning to renew the charge. 9. To read these suggestions a few times is enough. But it is always necessary for the commander to hit on the right thing at the right moment, to think of the present situation and to carry out what is expedient in view of it. To write out all that he ought to do is no more possible than to know everything that is going to happen. The most important of all my hints, I think, is this, whatever you decide to be best, see that it gets done. Whether you are a farmer, a skipper or a commander, sound decisions bear no fruit unless you see to it that, with heaven's help, they are duly carried out. Further, I am of opinion that the full complement of a thousand cavalry would be raised much more quickly and in a manner much less burdensome to the citizens if they established a force of 200 foreign cavalry. For I believe that the presence of these men would improve the discipline of the whole force and would foster rivalry in the display of efficiency. I know that the fame of the Lacedaemonian horse dates from the introduction of foreign cavalry, and in the other states everywhere I notice that the foreign contingents enjoy a high reputation. For need helps to produce great eagerness.
to defray the cost of their horses, I believe that money would be forthcoming from those who strongly object to serve in the cavalry since even men actually enrolled are willing to pay in order to get out of the service from rich men who are physically unfit, and also, I think, from orphans possessed of large estates. I believe also that some of the resident aliens would be proud to be enrolled in the cavalry. For I notice that, whenever the citizens give them a share in any other honourable duty, some are willing enough to take pride in doing the part assigned to them. I fancy, too, that infantry attached to the cavalry will be most effective if it consists of persons who are very bitter against the enemy. All these things are feasible provided the gods give their consent. If anyone is surprised at my frequent repetition of the exhortation to work with God, I can assure him that his surprise will diminish. If he is often in peril. And if he considers that in time of war foemen plot and counterplot. But seldom know what will come of their plots. Therefore there is none other that can give counsel in such a case but the gods. They know all things, and warn whomsoever they will in sacrifices, in omens, in voices, and in dreams. And we may suppose that they are more ready to counsel those who not only ask what they ought to do in the hour of need, but also serve the gods in the days of their prosperity with all their might. On Horsemanship. Translated by E. C. Marchant. 1. Inasmuch as we have had a long experience of cavalry and consequently claim familiarity with the art of horsemanship, we wish to explain to our younger friends what we believe to be the correct method of dealing with horses. True there is already a treatise on horsemanship by Simon, who also dedicated the bronze horse in the Eleusinium at Athens and recorded his own feats in relief on the pedestal. Nevertheless, we shall not erase from our work the conclusions that happen to coincide with his, but shall offer them to our friends with far greater pleasure, in the belief that they are more worthy of acceptance because so expert a horseman held the same opinions as we ourselves, moreover, we shall try to explain all the points that he has omitted. First we will give directions how best to avoid being cheated in buying a horse. For judging an unbroken colt, the only criterion, obviously, is the body, for no clear signs of temper are to be detected in an animal that has not yet had a man on his back. In examining his body, we say you must first look at his feet. For, just as a house is bound to be worthless less if the foundations are unsound, however well the upper parts may look, so a war horse will be quite useless, even though all his other points are good, if he has bad feet, for in that case he will be unable to use any of his good points. When testing the feet first look to the hoofs. For it makes a great difference in the quality of the feet if they are thick rather than thin. Next you must not fail to notice whether the hoofs are high both in front and behind, or low. For high hoofs have the frog, as it is called, well off the ground, but flat hoofs tread with the strongest and weakest part of the foot simultaneously, like a bow-legged man. Moreover, Simon says that the ring, too, is a clear test of good feet, and he is right, for a hollow hoof rings like a symbol in striking the ground. Having begun here, we will proceed upwards by successive steps to the rest of the body. The bones, of the paston, above the hoofs and below the fetlocks should not be too upright. Like a goat's, such legs give too hard a tread, jar the rider, and are more liable to inflammation. Nor yet should the bones be too low, else the fetlocks are likely to become bare and sore when the horse is ridden over clods or stones. The bones of the shanks should be thick, since these are the pillars of the body, but not thick with veins nor with flesh, else when the horse is ridden over hard ground, these parts are bound to become charged with blood and varicose, the legs will swell, and the skin will fall away, and when this gets loose the pin, too, is apt to give way and lame the horse. If the colt's knees are supple when bending as he walks, you may guess that his legs will be supple when he is ridden too, for all horses acquire greater suppleness at the knee as time goes on. Supple knees are rightly approved, since they render the horse less likely to stumble and tire than stiff legs. The arms below the shoulders, as in man, are stronger and better looking if they are thick. A chest of some width is better formed both for appearance and for strength, and for carrying the legs well apart without crossing. His neck should not hang downwards from the chest like a boar's, but stand straight up to the crest, like a cock's, but it should be flexible at the bend, and the head should be bony, with a small cheek. Thus the neck will protect the rider, and the eye see what lies before the feet. Besides, a horse of such a mould will have least power of running away, be he never so high-spirited, for horses do not arch the neck and head, but stretch them out when they try to run away. You should notice, too, whether both jaws are soft or hard, or only one, for horses with unequal jaws are generally unequally sensitive in the mouth. A prominent eye looks more alert than one that is hollow, and, apart from that, it gives the horse a greater range of vision. 
and wide open nostrils afford room for freer breathing than close ones. And at the same time make the horse look fiercer. For whenever a horse is angry with another or gets excited under his rider, he dilates his nostrils. A fairly large crest and fairly small ears give the more characteristic shape to a horse's head. High withers offer the rider a safer seat and a stronger grip on the shoulders. The double back is both softer to sit on than the single and more pleasing to the eye. The deeper the flanks and the more swelling toward the belly, the firmer is the seat and the stronger, and as a rule, the better feeder is the horse. The broader and shorter the loins, the more easily the horse lifts his forequarters and the more easily he brings up his hindquarters. And, apart from that, the belly looks smallest so, and if it is big it disfigures the horse to some extent, and also makes him to some extent both weaker and clumsier. The haunches must be broad and fleshy, that they may be in right proportion to the flanks and chest, and if they are firm all over. They will be lighter for running and will make the horse speedier. If the gap that separates the hams under the tail is broad, he will also extend his hind legs well apart under his belly, and by doing that he will be more fiery and stronger when he throws himself on his haunches and when he is ridden, and will make the best of himself in all ways. One can infer this from the action of a man, for when he wants to lift anything from the ground, a man invariably tries to lift it with his legs apart rather than close together. A horse's stones should not be big, but it is impossible to observe this in a colt. As for the parts below, the hocks, shin bones, fetlocks and hoofs, what we have said about the corresponding parts in the forelegs applies to these also. I want also to explain how one is least likely to be disappointed in the matter of size. The colt that is longest in the shanks at the time he is foaled makes the biggest horse. For in all quadrupeds the shanks increase but little in size as time goes on. Whereas the rest of the body grows to them. So as to be in the right proportion. He who applies these tests to a colt's shape is sure, in my opinion, to get a beast with good feet, strong, muscular, of the right look and the right size. If some change as they grow, still we may confidently rely on these tests, for it is far commoner for an ugly colt to make a useful horse than for a colt like this to turn out ugly. 2. We do not think it necessary to give directions for breaking a colt. For in our states the cavalry are recruited from those who have ample means and take a considerable part in the government. And it is far better for a young man to get himself into condition and when he understands the art of horsemanship to practice riding than to be a horsebreaker, and an older man had far better devote himself to his estate and his friends and affairs of state and of war than spend his time in horsebreaking. So he who shares my opinion about horsebreaking will, of course, send his colt out. Still he should put in writing what the horse is to know when he is returned, just as when he apprentices his son to a profession. For these articles will serve as notes to remind the horsebreaker of what he must attend to if he is to get his money. Still, care must be taken that the colt is gentle, tractable, and fond of man when he is sent to the horsebreaker. That sort of business is generally done at home through the groom. If he knows how to contrive that hunger and thirst and horseflies are associated by the colt with solitude. While eating and drinking and delivery from irritation come through man's agency. For in these circumstances a foal is bound not only to like men, but to hanker after them. One should also handle those parts in which the horse likes most to be cherished, that is to say the hairiest parts and those where the horse has least power of helping himself, if anything worries him. Let the groom be under orders also to lead him through crowds, and accustom him to all sorts of sights and all sorts of noises. If the colt shies at any of them, he must teach him, by quieting him and without impatience, that there is nothing to be afraid of. I think that the directions I have given on the subject of horse-breaking are sufficient for the private person. 3. In case the intention is to buy a horse already ridden. We will write out some notes that the buyer must thoroughly master if he is not to be cheated over his purchase. First, then, he must not fail to ascertain the age. A horse that has shed all his milk teeth does not afford much ground for pleasing expectations, and is not so easily got rid of. If he is clearly a youngster, one must notice further how he receives the bit in his mouth and the headstall about his ears. This may best be noticed if the buyer sees the bridle put on and taken off again. Next, attention must be paid to his behavior when he receives the rider on his back. For many horses will not readily accept a thing if they know beforehand that, if they accept it, they will be forced to work. Another thing to be observed is whether when mounted he is willing to leave his companions, or whether in passing standing horses he does not bolt towards them. Some too, in consequence of bad training run away from the riding ground to the paths that lead home. 
A horse with jaws unequally sensitive is detected by the exercise called the ring. But much more by changing the exercise. For many do not attempt to bolt unless they have a bad mouth, and the road along which they can bolt home gives them their chance. It is likewise necessary to know whether, when going at full speed he can be pulled up sharp, and whether he turns readily. And it is well to make sure whether he is equally willing to obey when roused by a blow. For a disobedient servant and a disobedient army are of course useless, and a disobedient horse is not only useless, but often behaves just like a traitor. As we have assumed that the horse to be bought is designed for war, he must be tested in all the particulars in which he is tested by war. These include springing across ditches, leaping over walls, rushing up banks, jumping down from banks. One must also try him by riding up and down hill and on a slope. All these experiments prove whether his spirit is strong and his body sound. Nevertheless, it is not necessary to reject a horse that is not perfect in these trials. For many break down in these not from want of ability, but from lack of experience. With teaching, use and discipline they will perform all these exercises well, provided they are otherwise sound and not faulty. But one should beware of horses that are naturally shy. For timid horses give one no chance of using them to harm the enemy, and often throw their rider and put him in a very awkward situation. It is necessary also to find out whether the horse has any vice towards horses or towards men, and whether he will not stand tickling, for all these things prove troublesome to the owner. As regards objection to being bridled or mounted, and the other reactions, there is a much better way still of detecting these, namely, by trying to do over again, after the horse has finished his work, just what one did before starting on the ride. All horses that are willing after their work to do another spell thereby give sufficient proofs of a patient temper. To sum up, the horse that is sound in his feet, gentle and fairly speedy, has the will and the strength to stand work, and, above all, is obedient, is the horse that will, as a matter of course, give least trouble and the greatest measure of safety to his rider in warfare. But those that want a lot of driving on account of their laziness, or a lot of coaxing and attention on account of their high spirit, make constant demands on the rider's hands and rob him of confidence in moments of danger. For, when a man has found a horse to his mind, bought him and taken him home, it is well to have the stable so situated with respect to the house that his master can see him very often, and it is a good plan to have the stall so contrived that it will be as difficult to steal the horse's fodder out of the manger as the master's victuals from the larder. He who neglects this seems to me to neglect himself, for it is plain that in danger the master entrusts his life to his horse. But a well-secured stall is not only good for preventing theft of the fodder but also because one can see when the horse does not spill his food and on noticing this one may be sure that either his body is overfull of blood and needs treatment or the horse is overworked and wants rest, or that laminitis or some other ailment is coming on. It is the same with horses as with men, all distempers in the early stage are more easily cured than when they have become chronic and have been wrongly treated. Just as the food and exercise of the horse must be attended to in order that he may keep sound. So his feet must be cared for. Now damp and slippery floors ruin even well-formed hoofs. In order that they may not be damp, the floor should have a slope to carry off the wet, and, that they may not be slippery, they should be paved all over with stones, each one about the size of the hoof. Such floors, indeed, have another advantage because they harden the feet of the horses standing on them. To take the next point, the groom must lead out the horse to clean him, and must loose him from the stall after the morning feed, that he may return to his evening feed with more appetite. Now the stable yard will be of the best form and will strengthen the feet if he throws down and spreads over it four or five loads of round stones, the size of a fist, about a pound in weight, and surrounds them with a border of iron so that they may not be scattered. Standing on these will have the same effect as if the horse walked on a stone road for some time every day. When he is being rubbed down and teased with flies he is bound to use his hoofs in the same way as when he walks. The frogs also are hardened by stones scattered in this way. The same care must be taken to make his mouth tender as to harden his hoofs. This is done by the same methods as are employed to soften human flesh. 5. It is a mark of a good horseman, in our opinion, to see that his groom, like himself, is instructed in the way in which he should treat the horse. First then the man ought to know that he should never make the knot in the halter at the point where the headstall is put on. For if the halter is not easy about the ears, the horse will often rub his head against the manger and may often get sores in consequence. Now if there are sore places thereabouts the horse is bound to be restive both when he is bridled and when he is rubbed down. 
it is well also for the groom to have orders to remove the dung and litter daily to one and the same place. For by doing this he will get rid of it most easily and at the same time relieve the horse. The groom must also know about putting the muzzle on the horse when he takes him out to be groomed or to the rolling place. In fact he must always put the muzzle on when he leads him anywhere without a bridle. For the muzzle prevents him from biting without hampering his breathing, and moreover, when it is put on, it goes far towards preventing any propensity to mischief. He should tie up the horse at a place above the head, because when anything irritates his face, the horse instinctively tries to get rid of it by tossing his head upwards, and if he is tied thus he loosens the halter instead of breaking it by tossing up his head. In rubbing the horse down, the man should start at the head and manner, for if the upper parts are not clean, it is idle to clean his lower parts. Next, going over the rest of his body, he should make the hair stand up with all the dressing instruments and get the dust out by rubbing him the way the hair lies. But he should not touch the hair on the backbone with any instrument, he should rub and smooth it down with the hands the way it naturally grows, for so he will be least likely to injure the rider's seat. He must wash the head well with water, for, as it is bony, to clean it with iron or wood would hurt the horse. He must also wet the forelock, for this tuft of hair, even if pretty long, does not obstruct his sight, but drives from his eyes anything that worries them, and we must presume that the gods have given the horse this hair in lieu of the long ears that they have given to asses and mules as a protection to their eyes. He should also wash the tail and manner, for growth of the tail is to be encouraged in order that the horse may be able to reach as far as possible and drive away anything that worries him, and growth of the manner in order to give the rider as good a hold as possible. Besides, the manner. Forelock and tail have been given to the horse by the gods as an ornament. A proof of this is that brood mares herding together, so long as they have fine manes, are reluctant to be covered by asses, for which reason all breeders of mules cut off the manes of the mares for covering. Washing down of the legs we disapprove of, it does no good, and the hoofs are injured by being wetted every day. Excessive cleaning under the belly also should be diminished, for this worries the horse very much, and the cleaner these parts are, the more they collect under the belly things offensive to it, and notwithstanding all the pains that may be taken with these parts, the horse is no sooner led out than he looks much the same as an unwashed animal. So these operations should be omitted, and as for the rubbing of the legs, it is enough to do it with the bare hands. 6. We will now show how one may rub down a horse with least danger to oneself and most advantage to the horse. If in cleaning him the man faces in the same direction as the horse, he runs the risk of getting a blow in the face from his knee and his hoof. But if he faces in the opposite direction to the horse and sits by the shoulder out of reach of his leg when he cleans him, and rubs him down so, then he will come to no harm, and can also attend to the horse's frock by lifting up the hoof. Let him do exactly the same in cleaning the hind legs. The man employed about the horse is to know that in these operations and in all that he has to do he must be very chary of approaching from the head or tail to do his work. For if the horse attempts to show mischief he has the man in his power in both these directions, but if he approaches from the side he can manage the horse with least danger to himself and in the best manner. When it is necessary to lead the horse, we do not approve of leading him behind one for this reason. That the man leading him is then least able to take care of himself while the horse has the utmost freedom to do whatever he chooses. On the other hand we also disapprove of training the horse to go in front on a long lead for the following reasons, the horse has the power of misbehaving on either side as he chooses, and has also the power of turning round and facing his driver. And if several horses together are driven in this fashion, how can they possibly be kept from interfering with one another? But a horse that is accustomed to being led from the side will have least power of doing harm either to horses or to men, and will be in the handiest position for the rider should he want to mount quickly. In order to put the bit in properly, first let the groom approach on the near side of the horse. Then let him throw the reins over the head and drop them on the withers, and next lift the headstall with the right hand and offer the bit with the left. If he takes the bit, of course the bridle should be put on. But if he refuses to open his mouth, the man must hold the bit to his teeth and put the thumb of the left hand in the horse's jaw. Most horses open the mouth when this is done. If he still resists, the man should squeeze his lip against the tusk, and very few resist when they are treated in this way. The groom should also be instructed in the following points, first, never to lead the horse on the rein that gives the horse a hard mouth on one side and secondly, what is the correct distance from the bit to the jaws. For if it is too high up, it hardens the mouth so that it loses its sensitivity, and if it lies too low in the mouth, it gives the horse power to take it between his teeth and refuse to obey. 
the groom must also pay some attention to such points as the following, whether the horse will not easily take the bit when he knows that he has work to do. Willingness to receive the bit is, in fact, so important that a horse that refuses it is quite useless. But if he is bridled not only when he is going to be ridden, but also when he is taken to his food and when he is led home from exercise, it would not be at all surprising if he seized the bit of his own accord when offered to him. It is well for the groom to know how to give a leg up in the Persian fashion, so that his master himself, in case he is indisposed or is getting old may have someone to put him up conveniently, and may, if he wishes, oblige his friend with a man to give him a lift up. The one best rule and practice in dealing with a horse is never to approach him in anger, for anger is a reckless thing, so that it often makes a man do what he must regret. Moreover, when the horse is shy of anything and will not come near it, you should teach him that there is nothing to be afraid of, either with the help of a plucky horse which is the surest way or else by touching the object that looks alarming yourself, and gently leading the horse up to it. To force him with blows only increases his terror, for when horses feel pain in such a predicament, they think that this too is caused by the thing at which they shy. When the groom presents the horse to his rider, we take no exception to his understanding how to cause the horse to crouch, for convenience in mounting. We think, however, that the rider should get used to mounting even without his horse's help. For a rider gets a different sort of horse at different times, and the same one does not always serve him in the same way. 7. We will now describe what the rider should do when he has received his horse and is going to mount. If he is to make the best of himself and his horse in riding. First, then, he must hold the lead rope fastened to the chin strap or the noseband ready in the left hand, and so loose as not to jerk the horse whether he means to mount by holding on to the mane near the ears or to spring up with the help of the spear. With his right hand let him take hold of the reins by the withers along with the mane, so that he may not jerk the horse's mouth with the bit in any way as he mounts. When he has made his spring in order to mount, he should raise his body with his left hand, while at the same time he helps himself up by stretching out his right, for by mounting in this way he will not present an awkward appearance even from behind by bending his leg. Neither must he touch the horse's back with his knee, but throw the leg right over the offside. Having brought the foot over, he must then let his buttocks down on the horse's back. In case the horseman happens to be leading the horse with the left hand and holding his spear in the right. It is well, we think, to practice mounting on the offside also. For this purpose all that he needs to learn is to do with the left parts of the body what in the other case he did with the right, and vice versa. The reason why we recommend this method of mounting also is, that no sooner is the rider mounted than he is quite ready to fight with the enemy on a sudden, if occasion requires. When he is seated, whether on the bare back or on the cloth, we would not have him sit as if he were on his chair, but as though he were standing upright with his legs astride. For thus he will get a better grip of his horse with his thighs, and the erect position will enable him, if need be, to throw his spear and deliver a blow on horseback with more force. The lower leg including the foot must hang lax and easy from the knee down. For if he keeps his leg stiff and should strike it against anything, he may break it, whereas a loose leg will recoil, whatever it encounters. Without disturbing the position of the thigh at all. The rider must also accustom himself to keeping his body above the hips as loose as possible, for thus he will be able to stand more fatigue and will be less liable to come off when he is pulled or pushed. As soon as he is seated, he must teach his horse to stand quiet at first, until he has shifted anything that wants arranging underneath him, gathered the reins even in his hand and grasped his spear in the most convenient manner. Then let him keep his left arm close to his side, for thus the horseman's figure will look best, and his hand will have most power. As for reins, we recommend that they be of equal strength, not weak nor slippery nor thick, in order that the spear may be held in the same hand when necessary. When he directs his horse to go forward, let him begin at a walk, for this prevents any flurry. If the horse carries his head too low, let the rider hold the hands higher, if too high, lower. For in this way he will give him the most graceful carriage. After this, if he breaks into his natural trot, he will relax his body in the easiest fashion and come to the gallop most readily. Since, too, the more approved method is to begin with the left, one will best begin on this side, by giving the horse the signal to gallop while trotting, at the instant when he is treading with the right, fore, foot. As he is then on the point of raising the left, he will begin with it, and, as soon as the rider turns him to the left, will immediately begin the stride. For it is natural for the horse to lead with the right when turned to the right and with the left when turned to the left. The exercise that we recommend is the one called the ring, since it accustoms the horse to turn on both jaws. 
It is also well to change the exercise, in order that both jaws may be equally practiced on each side of the exercise. We recommend the manage rather than the complete ring. For thus the horse will turn more willingly when he has gone some distance in a straight course. And one can practice the career and the turn at the same time. It is necessary to collect him at the turns, for it is neither easy for the horse nor safe to turn short when going fast, especially if the ground is uneven or slippery. In collecting him the rider must slant the horse as little as possible with the bit, and slant his own body as little as possible, else he may be sure that a trifling cause will be enough to bring him and his horse down. As soon as the horse faces the straight after turning, push him along at once. For of course, in war too, turns are made with a view to pursuit or retreat. It is well, therefore, to practice increasing the pace after turning. So soon as the horse appears to have been exercised enough, it is well to let him rest a certain time, and then suddenly to put him to his top speed again, of course away from, not towards, other horses, and to pull him up again in the midst of his career as short as possible. And then to turn and start him again from the stand. For it is obvious that a time will come when it will be necessary to do one or the other. When the time has come to dismount, the rider must never dismount among other horses or near a group of people or outside the riding ground, but let the place where the horse is forced to work be the place where he also receives his reward of ease. 8. As the horse will frequently have to gallop downhill and uphill and along a slope. And as he will have to leap over, and to leap out, and to jump down at various times, the rider must teach and practice both himself and his horse in all these things. For thus they will be able to help each other, and will be thought altogether more efficient. If anyone thinks that we are repeating ourselves, because we are referring to matters already dealt with, this is not repetition. For we recommended the purchaser to try whether the horse could do these things at the time of buying, but now we say that a man should teach his own horse, and we will show how to teach him. When a man has a raw horse quite ignorant of leaping, he must get over the ditch himself first, holding him loosely by the leading rein, and then give him a pull with the rein to make him leap over. If he refuses, let someone strike him as hard as he can with a whip or a stick, whereupon he will leap, and not only the necessary distance, but much further than was required. In future there will be no need to beat him. For if he merely sees a man approaching behind him, he will leap. As soon as he has grown accustomed to leap in this way, let him be mounted and tried first at narrow, and then at wider ditches. Just as he is on the point of springing touch him with the spur. Similarly he should be taught to leap up and to leap down by a touch of the spur. For if he does all these things with his body compactly gathered, it will be safer for the horse as well as the rider than if his hindquarters lag in taking a leap over, or in springing upwards or jumping downwards. Going downhill should first be taught on soft ground, and in the end, when the horse gets used to this, he will canter down more readily than uphill. If some fear that horses may put out their shoulders by being ridden downhill, they may take comfort when they understand that the Persians and Adrisians all ride races downhill, and yet keep their horses just as sound as the Greeks. Nor will we omit to state how the rider is to assist in all these movements. If the horse springs suddenly, he should lean forward, for so the horse is less likely to slip away and throw the rider off. But in pulling him up short he should lean back. For so he himself will be less jolted. When jumping a ditch or riding uphill it is well to take hold of the manner, that the horse may not be burdened by his bridle and the difficulty of the ground at the same time. When going down a steep incline, he should throw his body back and support the horse with the bridle, that neither rider nor horse may be tossed headlong downhill. It is correct also to exercise the horse sometimes in one place, sometimes in another, and to make the exercises sometimes long and sometimes short, for this is less irksome to the horse than being exercised always in the same place and for the same length of time. Since it is necessary that the rider should have a firm seat when riding at top speed over all sorts of country, and should be able to use his weapons properly on horseback, the practice of horsemanship by hunting is to be recommended where the country is suitable and big game is to be found where these conditions are lacking. It is a good method of training for two riders to work together thus, one flies on his horse over all kinds of ground and retreats. Reversing his spear so that it points backwards, while the other pursues, having buttons on his javelins and holding his spear in the same position, and when he gets within javelin shot, tries to hit the fugitive with the blunted weapons, and if he gets near enough to use his spear, strikes his captive with it. It is also a good plan, in case of a collision between them, for one to pull his adversary towards him and suddenly push him back again, since that is the way to dismount him. 
the right thing for the man who is being pulled is to urge his horse forward, by doing this the pulled is more likely to unhorse the puller than to be unhorsed himself. If at any time when an enemy's camp lies in front there is a cavalry skirmish, and one side presses the pursuit right up to the enemy's line of battle, but then retreats hastily to its own main body, it is well to know in that case that so long as you are by your friends. It is proper and safe to be among the first to wheel and make for the enemy at full speed. But when you come near the enemy to keep your horse well in hand. For in this way you have the best chance of injuring the enemy without coming to harm yourself. Now, whereas the gods have given to men the power of instructing one another in their duty by word of mouth, it is obvious that you can teach a horse nothing by word of mouth. If, however, you reward him when he behaves as you wish, and punish him when he is disobedient, he will best learn to do his duty. This rule can be stated in few words, but it applies to the whole art of horsemanship. He will receive the bit, for example, more willingly if something good happens to him as soon as he takes it. He will also leap over and jump out of anything, and perform all his actions duly if he can expect a rest as soon as he has done what is required of him. 9. So far we have described how to avoid being cheated in buying a colt or a horse. How to avoid spoiling him in usage and how to impart to a horse all the qualities required by a cavalryman for war. It is time perhaps to give directions, in case one has to deal with a horse that is too spirited or too sluggish, for the correct way of managing either. First, then, it must be realized that spirit in a horse is precisely what anger is in a man. Therefore, just as you are least likely to make a man angry if you neither say nor do anything disagreeable to him, so he who abstains from annoying a spirited horse is least likely to rouse his anger. Accordingly, at the moment of mounting, the rider should take care to worry him as little as possible, and when he is mounted, he should let him stand still longer than is otherwise usual, and then direct him to go by the most gentle aids. Then let him begin at a very slow pace and increase the speed with the same gentle help, so that the horse will not be aware of the transition to a quicker motion. Any sudden sign disturbs a spirited horse. Just as sudden sights and sounds and sensations disturb a man. It is important to realize that a horse too is flurried by anything sudden. If you want to correct a spirited horse when he is going too fast, do not pull him suddenly, but quietly check him with the bit, soothing him, not forcing him, to a quiet pace. Long rides rather than frequent turnings, calm horses, and quiet ones lasting long soothe and calm a spirited horse and do not excite him. But if anyone supposes that he will calm a horse by frequent riding at a quick pace so as to tire him, his opinion is the opposite of the truth. For in such cases a spirited horse does his utmost to get the upper hand by force, and in his excitement, like an angry man, he often causes many irreparable injuries both to himself and to his rider. One must prevent a high-spirited horse from going at his top speed, and of course, entirely avoid letting him race with another horse. For as a rule the most highly spirited horses are also most eager for victory. As for bits, the smooth are more suitable than the rough, but if a rough one is used, it should be made to resemble a smooth one by lightness of hand. It is also well to accustom oneself to sit still, especially on a spirited horse, and to touch him as little as possible with anything other than the parts that give us a safe seat by contact. It should also be known that a horse can be taught to be calm by a chirp with the lips and to be roused by a cluck with the tongue. And if from the first you use with the cluck aids to calm him, and with the chirp aids to rouse him, the horse will learn to rouse himself at the chirp and to calm down at the cluck. Accordingly, if a shout is heard or a trumpet sounds, you must not allow the horse to notice any sign of alarm in you, and must on no account do anything to him to cause him alarm, but as far as possible let him rest in such circumstances, and, if you have the opportunity, bring him his morning or evening meal. But the best advice is not to get an overspirited horse for war. As for a sluggish beast, I may be content with the remark that in everything you must do the opposite of what we advise for the treatment of a high-spirited one. 10. If a man wants to make a useful war horse look more stately and showy when ridden, he must avoid pulling his mouth with the bit, and using the spur and whip, means by which most people imagine that they show off a horse. In point of fact the results they produce are the very opposite of what they intend. For by dragging the mouth up they blind their horses instead of letting them see ahead, and by spurring and whipping, flurry them so that they are startled and get into danger. That is the behavior of horses that strongly object to being ridden and that behave in an ugly and unseemly fashion. But if you teach the horse to go with a slack bridle, to hold his neck up and to arch it towards the head, you will cause the horse to do the very things in which he himself delights and takes the greatest pleasure. 
a proof that he delights in them is that whenever he himself chooses to show off before horses, and especially before mares, he raises his neck highest and arches his head most, looking fierce, he lifts his legs freely off the ground and tosses his tail up. Whenever, therefore, you induce him to carry himself in the attitudes he naturally assumes when he is most anxious to display his beauty, you make him look as though he took pleasure in being ridden, and give him a noble, fierce, and attractive appearance. How we think that these effects may be produced we will now try to explain. To begin with, you should possess two bits at least. One of these should be smooth and have the discs of a good size, the other should have the discs heavy and low. And the teeth sharp. So that when the horse seizes it he may drop it because he objects to its roughness, and when he is bitted with the smooth one instead, may welcome its smoothness and may do on the smooth bit what he has been trained to do with the aid of the rough one. In case, however, he takes no account of it because of its smoothness, and keeps bearing against it, we put large discs on the smooth bit to stop this, so that they may force him to open his mouth and drop the bit. It is possible also to make the rough bit adaptable by wrapping it up and tightening the reins. But whatever be the pattern of the bits, they must all be flexible. For wherever a horse seizes a stiff one, he holds the whole of it against his jaws, just as you lift the whole of a spit wherever you take hold of it. But the other kind of bit acts like a chain, for only the part that you hold remains unbent, while the rest of it hangs loose. As the horse continually tries to seize the part that eludes him in his mouth, he lets the bit drop from his jaws. This is why little rings are hung in the middle on the axles, in order that the horse may feel after them with his tongue and teeth and not think of taking the bit up against the jaws. In case the meaning of the terms flexible and stiff as applied to a bit is not known, we will explain this too. Flexible means that the axles have broad and smooth links so that they bend easily, and if everything that goes round the axles has large openings, and does not fit tight, it is more flexible. Stiff, on the other hand, means that the pieces of the bit do not run over the axles and work in combination easily. Whatever the pattern may be, the same method of using it must be carried out in all the points that follow, assuming that you want your horse to have just the appearance I have described. The mouth must neither be pulled so hard that he holds his nose in the air, nor so gently that he takes no notice. As soon as he raises his neck when you pull, give him the bit at once. Invariably, in fact, as we cannot too often repeat, you must humor you horse whenever he responds to your wishes. And when you notice that high carriage of his neck and lightness of hand give him pleasure, you should not deal hardly with him as though you were forcing him to work, but coax him as when you want to stop, for thus he will break into a fast pace with most confidence. There is plain proof that a horse takes pleasure in going fast, for when he breaks loose a horse never goes at a walking pace, but always runs. He instinctively takes pleasure in this, provided he is not compelled to run too far for his strength. Nothing in excess is ever pleasing either to horse or man. When your horse has progressed so far as to bear himself proudly when ridden, he has, of course, already been accustomed in the early exercises to break into a quicker pace after turning. Now if after he has learnt this you pull him up with the bit and at the same time give him one of the signs to go forward. Then being held back by the bit and yet roused by the signal to go forward, he throws his chest out and lifts his legs from the ground impatiently, but not with a supple motion, for when horses feel uncomfortable, the action of their legs is not at all supple. But if, when he is thus excited, you give him the bit, then, mistaking the looseness of the bit for a deliverance from restraint, he bounds forward for very joy with a proud bearing and supple legs, exultant, imitating exactly in every way the graces that he displays before horses. And those who watch the horse when he is like that call him well-bred, a willing worker, worth riding, mettlesome, magnificent, and declare his appearance to be at once pleasing and fiery. And here we conclude these explanations addressed to those who want this sort of thing. 11. But in case anyone wants to own a horse suitable for parade, with a high and showy action. Such qualities are by no means to be found in every horse, but it is essential that he should have plenty of spirit and a strong body. Many suppose that an animal that has supple legs will also be capable of rearing his body. That, however, is not the case, rather it is the horse with supple, short, strong loins that will be able to extend his hind legs well under the forelegs. By loins we do not mean the parts about the tail, but those between the flanks and haunches about the belly. Now, if when he is planting his hind legs under him you pull him up with the bit, he bends the hind legs on the hocks and raises the forepart of his body, so that anyone facing him can see the belly and the sheath. When he does that you must give him the bit that he may appear to the onlookers to be doing willingly the finest things that a horse can do. 
Some, however, teach these accomplishments by striking him under the hocks with a rod, others by telling a man to run alongside and hit him with a stick under the gaskins. We, however, consider that the lesson is most satisfactory if, as we have repeatedly said, the rider invariably allows him relaxation when he has done something according to his wishes. For what a horse does under constraint, as Simon says, he does without understanding, and with no more grace than a dancer would show if he was whipped and goaded. Under such treatment horse and man alike will do much more that is ugly than graceful. No, a horse must make the most graceful and brilliant appearance in all respects of his own will with the help of aids. Further, if you gallop him during a ride until he sweats freely, and as soon as he prances in fine style, quickly dismount and unbridle him, you may be sure that he will come willingly to the prance. This is the attitude in which artists represent the horses on which gods and heroes ride, and men who manage such horses gracefully have a magnificent appearance. Indeed a prancing horse is a thing so graceful, terrible and astonishing that it rivets the gaze of all beholders, young and old alike. At all events no one leaves him or is tired of gazing at him so long as he shows off his brilliance. Should the owner of such a horse happen to be a colonel or a general, he must not make it his object to be the one brilliant figure, but must attach much more importance to making the whole troop behind him worth looking at. Now if a horse is leading in the manner which wins most praise for such horses, prancing high and with his body closely gathered, so that he moves forward with very short steps, the rest of the horses must obviously follow also at a walking pace. Now what can there be really brilliant in such a sight? But if you rouse your horse and lead neither too fast nor too slow, but at the pace at which the most spirited horses look most fiery and stately if you lead your men in that way, there will be such a continual stamping, such a continual neighing and snorting of the horses going on behind you, that not only you yourself but all the troop behind you will be worth watching. If a man buys his horses well, trains them so that they can stand work, and uses them properly in the training for war. In the exhibition rides and on the battlefields. What is there then to hinder him from making horses more valuable than they are when he takes them over, and why should he not be the owner of famous horses, and also become famous himself for his horsemanship, provided no divine power prevents? 12. We want to explain also how a man who is to face danger on horseback should be armed. We say, then, that in the first place his breastplate must be made to fit his body. For the well-fitting breastplate is supported by the whole body, whereas one that is too loose is supported by the shoulders only, and one that is too tight is rather an encumbrance than a defence. And, since the neck is one of the vital parts, we hold that a covering should be available for it also, standing up from the breastplate itself and shaped to the neck. For this will serve as an ornament, and at the same time, if properly made, will cover the rider's face, when he pleases, as high as the nose. For the helmet we consider the Boeotian pattern the most satisfactory, for this, again, affords the best protection to all the parts that project above the breastplate without obstructing the sight. As for the pattern of the breastplate, it should be so shaped as not to prevent the wearer from sitting down or stooping. About the abdomen and middle and round that region let the flaps be of such material and such a size that they will keep out missiles. And as a wound in the left hand disables the rider, we also recommend the piece of armor invented for it called the hand. For it protects the shoulder, the arm, the elbow, and the fingers that hold the reins, it will also extend and fold up, and in addition it covers the gap left by the breastplate under the armpit. But the right hand must be raised when the man intends to fling his javelin or strike a blow. Consequently that portion of the breastplate that hinders him in doing that should be removed, and in place of it there should be detachable flaps at the joints, in order that, when the arm is elevated, they may open correspondingly, and may close when it is lowered. For the forearm it seems to us that the piece put over it separately like a greave is better than one that is bound up together with a piece of armour. The part that is left exposed when the right arm is raised should be covered near the breastplate with calf skin or metal, otherwise the most vital part will be unprotected. Since the rider is seriously imperiled in the event of his horse being wounded, the horse also should be armed, having head, chest, and thigh pieces, the last also serve to cover the rider's thighs. But above all the horse's belly must be protected, for this, which is the most vital part, is also the weakest. It is possible to make the cloth serve partly as a protection to it. The quilting of the cloth should be such as to give the rider a safer seat and not to gall the horse's back. Thus horse and man alike will be armed in most parts. But the rider's shins and feet will of course be outside the thigh pieces. These two can be guarded if boots made of shoe leather are worn, there will thus be armour for the shins and covering for the feet at the same time. 
these are the defensive arms which with the gracious assistance of heaven will afford protection from harm. For harming the enemy we recommend the saber rather than the sword, because, owing to his lofty position, the rider will find the cut with the Persian saber more efficacious than the thrust with the sword. And, in place of the spear with a long shaft, seeing that it is both weak and awkward to manage, we recommend rather the two Persian javelins of Cornell wood. For the skillful man may throw the one and can use the other in front or on either side or behind. They are also stronger than the spear and easier to manage. We recommend throwing the javelin at the longest range possible. For this gives a man more time to turn his horse and to grasp the other javelin. We will also state in a few words the most effective way of throwing the javelin. If a man, in the act of advancing his left side, drawing back his right, and rising from his thighs, discharges the javelin with its point a little upwards, he will give his weapon the strongest impetus and the furthest carrying power, it will be most likely to hit the mark, however, if at the moment of discharge the point is always set on it. These notes, instructions and exercises which we have here set down are intended only for the private person. What it belongs to a cavalry leader to know and to do has been set forth in another book. On Hunting Translated by E. C. Marchant. 1. Game and hounds are the invention of gods. Of Apollo and Artemis. They bestowed it on Chaion and honoured him therewith for his righteousness. And he, receiving it, rejoiced in the gift, and used it. And he had for pupils in venery and in other noble pursuits Cephalus, Asclepius, Mylanian, Nestor, Amphiaros, Peleus, Telamon, Meliga, Theseus, Hippolytus, Palamedes, Odysseus, Menestheus, Diams, Castor, Polyduces, Machaon, Podolarius, Antilochus, Aeneas, Achilles, of whom each in his time was honoured by gods. Let no man marvel that the more part of these, even though they pleased gods, died none the less, for that was nature's work but the praise of them grew mightily. Nor yet that not all of these flourished at one time. For Sharon's lifetime sufficed for all. For Zeus and Chaion were brethren, sons of one sire, but the mother of the one was Rhea, of the other the nymph Nais, and so, though he was born before these, he died after them, for he taught Achilles. Through the heed they paid to hounds and hunting and the rest of their scholarship they excelled greatly and were admired for their virtue. Cephalus was carried away by a goddess. Asclepius won yet, greater preferment to raise the dead, to heal the sick, and for these things he has everlasting fame as a god among men. Mylanian was so peerless in love of toil that, though the princeliest of that age were his rival suitors for the greatest lady of the time, only he won Atalanta. Nestor's virtue is an old familiar tale to Greek ears, so there is no need for me to tell of it. Amphiaros when he fought against Thebes, gained great praise and won from the gods the honour of immortality. Peleus stirred a desire even in the gods to give him the teas and to him their marriage in Sharon's home. Telamon waxed so mighty that he wedded from the greatest city the maiden of his choice, Peribea, daughter of Alcathus, and when the first of the Greeks, Heracl son of Zeus, distributed the prizes of valour after taking Troy, to him he gave Hesion. As for Meliga, the honours that he won are manifest, and it was not by his own fault that he came to sorrow when his father in old age forgot the goddess. Theseus single-handed slew the enemies of all Greece, and because he enlarged greatly the borders of his country he is admired to this day. Hippolytus was honoured by Artemis and held converse with her, and for his prudence and holiness he was counted happy when he died. Palamedes far outstripped the men of his generation in wisdom while he lived, and being unjustly slain he won from the gods such vengeance as fell to the lot of no other mortal. But his end was not compassed by those whom some imagine. Else could not the one of them have been well nigh the best, and the other the peer of the good, but bad men did the deed. Menestheus through the heat he paid to hunting, so far surpassed others in love of toil that the first of the Greeks confessed themselves his inferiors in feats of war, all save Nestor, and he, it is said, outdid not, but rivalled him. Odysseus and Diams were brilliant in every single deed, and in short, to them was due the capture of Troy. Castor and Polyduces, through the renown that they won by displaying in Greece the arts they learned of Chaion, are immortal. Machaon and Podolarius, schooled in all the selfsame arts, proved in crafts and reasonings and wars good men. Antilochus, by giving his life for his father, won such glory that he alone was proclaimed among the Greeks as the devoted son. Aeneas saved the gods of his father's and his mother's family, and with all his father himself, wherefore he bore away fame for his piety. So that to him alone among all the vanquished at Troy even the enemy granted not to be despoiled. Achilles, nursed in this schooling, bequeathed to posterity memorials so great and glorious that no man wearies of telling and hearing of him. 
These, whom the good love even to this day and the evil envy, were made so perfect through the care they learned of Chaian that, when troubles fell upon any state or any king in Greece, they were composed through their influence, or if all Greece was at strife or at war with all the barbarian powers, these brought victory to the Greeks, so that they made Greece invincible. Therefore I charge the young not to despise hunting or any other schooling. For these are the means by which men become good in war and in all things out of which must come excellence in thought and word and deed. 2. The first pursuit, therefore, that a young man just out of his boyhood should take up is hunting, and afterwards he should go on to the other branches of education, provided he has means. He must look to his means, and, if they are sufficient, spend as much as the benefit to himself is worth, or, if they are insufficient, at least let him supply enthusiasm, in no way coming short of his power. I will give a list and a description of the intending hunter's outfit, and the explanation of each item, in order that he may understand the business before he puts his hand to it. And let no one regard these details as trivial, inasmuch as nothing can be done without them. The net keeper should be a man with a keen interest in the business, one who speaks Greek, about twenty years old, agile and strong, and resolute, that, being well qualified to overcome his tasks, he may take pleasure in the business. The purse nets should be made of fine phasian or Carthaginian flax, and the road nets and haze of the same material. Let the purse nets be of nine threads woven in three strands, each strand consisting of three threads. The proper length for these nets is 45 inches. The proper width of the mesh is 6 inches. The cords that run round them must be without knots, so that they may run easily. The road nets should be of 12 threads, and the haze of 16. The length of the road nets may be 12, 24 or 30 feet, that of the hay 60, 120, or 180 feet. If they are longer, they will be unwieldy. Both kinds should be 30 knots high, and should have meshes of the same width as those of the purse nets. At the elbows at either end let the road nets have slip knots of string and the hay's metal rings, and let the cords be attached by loops. The stakes for the purse nets should be 30 inches long, but some should be shorter. Those of unequal length are for use on sloping ground, to make the height of the nets equal, while those of the same length are used on the level. These stakes must be so shaped at the top that the nets will pull off readily and they must be smooth. The stakes for the road nets should be twice the length of these. And those for the haze 45 inches long. The latter should have little forks with shallow grooves, and all should be stout, of a thickness proportion to the length. The number of stakes used for the haze may be large or small. Fewer are required if the nets are strained tight when set up, more if they are slack. A calfskin bag will be wanted for carrying the purse nets and road nets and haze and the bill hooks for cutting wood and stopping gaps where necessary. 3. The hounds used are of two kinds, the Castaean and the Vulpine. The Castaean is so called because Castor paid special attention to the breed, making a hobby of the business. The Vulpine is a hybrid between the dog and the fox, hence the name. In the course of time the nature of the parents has become fused. Inferior specimens, that is to say, the majority, show one or more of the following defects. They are small, hook-nosed, grey-eyed, blinking, ungainly, stiff, weak, thin-coated, lanky, ill-proportioned, cowardly, dull-scented, unsound in the feet. Now small dogs often drop out of the running through their want of size, hook-nosed dogs have no mouth and can't hold the hair. Grey-eyed dogs and blinkers have bad sight. Ungainly dogs look ugly, stiff ones are in a bad way at the end of the hunt, no work can be got out of the weak and the thin-coated ones, those that are lanky and ill-proportioned are heavy movers and carry themselves anyhow, cowards leave their work and give up and slink away from the sun into shady places and lie down, dogs with no nose seldom scent their hair and only with difficulty, and those with bad feet, even if they are plucky, can't stand the hard work, and tire because they are footsore. Moreover, hounds of the same breed vary much in behavior when tracking. Some go ahead as soon as they find the line without giving a sign, and there is nothing to show that they are on it. Some move the ears only, but keep the tail still, others keep the ear still and wag the tip of the tail. Others prick up the ears and run frowning along the track, dropping their tails and putting them between their legs. Many do none of these things. But rush about madly round the track and when they happen upon it, stupidly trample out the traces, barking all the time. Others again, continually circling and straying, get ahead of the line when clean off it and pass the hare, and every time they run against the line, begin guessing, and if they catch sight of the hare, tremble and never go for her until they see her stir. 
Hounds that run forward and frequently examine the discoveries of the others when they are casting about and pursuing have no confidence in themselves, while those that will not let their cleverer mates go forward, but fuss and keep them back, are confident to a fault. Others will drive ahead, eagerly following false lines and getting wildly excited over anything that turns up, well knowing that they are playing the fool, others will do the same thing in ignorance. Those that stick to game paths and don't recognize the true line are poor tools. A hound that ignores the trail and races over the track of the hare on the run is ill-bred. Some, again, will pursue hotly at first, and then slack off from want of pluck, others will cut in ahead and then get astray, while others foolishly dash into roads and go astray, deaf to all recall. Many abandon the pursuit and go back through their hatred of game, and many through their love of man. Others try to mislead by baying on the track, representing false lines as true ones. Some, though free from this fault, leave their own work when they hear a shout from another quarter while they are running, and make for it recklessly. When pursuing some are dubious, others are full of assumptions but their notions are wrong. Then there are the skirters, some of whom merely pretend to hunt, while others out of jealousy perpetually scamper about together beside the line. Now most of these faults are natural defects, but some by which hounds are spoilt are due to unintelligent training. Anyhow such hounds may well put a keen hunter off the sport. What hounds of the same breed ought to look like and what they should be in other respects I will now explain. For, first, then, they should be big. Next, the head should be light, flat and muscular, the lower parts of the forehead sinewy, the eyes prominent, black and sparkling, the forehead broad, with a deep dividing line, the ears small and thin with little hair behind, the neck long, loose and round, the chest broad and fairly fleshy, the shoulder blade slightly outstanding from the shoulders, the forelegs short, straight, round and firm, the elbows straight, the ribs not low down on the ground, but sloping in an oblique line, the loins fleshy, of medium length, and neither too loose nor too hard, the flanks of medium size, the hips round and fleshy at the back, not close at the top, and smooth on the inside, the underpart of the belly itself slim, the tail long, straight and thin, the thighs hard, the shanks long, round and solid, the hind legs much longer than the forelegs and slightly bent, the feet round. Hounds like these will be strong in appearance. Agile, well-proportioned, and speedy, and they will have a jaunty expression and a good mouth. When tracking they should get out of the game paths quickly, hold their heads well down and aslant, smiling when they find the scent and lowering their ears, then they should all go forward together along the trail towards the form circling frequently, with eyes continually on the move and tails wagging. As soon as they are close on the hare, they should let the huntsman know, quickening the pace and showing more emphatic signs by their excitement, movements of the head and eyes, changes of attitude, by looking up and looking into the covert and returning again and again to the hare's form, by leaps forward, backward and to the side, displays of unaffected agitation and overpowering delight at being near the hare. They should pursue with unremitting vigor, giving tongue and barking freely, dogging the hare's steps wherever she goes. They should be fast and brilliant in the chase, frequently casting about and giving tongue in the right fashion, and they should not leave the track and go back to the huntsman. Along with this appearance and behavior they should have pluck, keen noses, sound feet and good coats. They will be plucky if they don't leave the hunting ground when the heat is oppressive, keen-nosed if they smell the hair on bear. Parched and sunny ground in the dog days. Sound in the feet if at the same season their feet are not torn to bits during a run in the mountains, they will have a good coat if the hair is fine, thick and soft. The color of the hounds should not be entirely tawny, black or white, for this is not a sign of good breeding, on the contrary, unbroken color indicates a wild strain. So the tawny and the black hounds should show a patch of white about the face, and the white hounds a tawny patch. At the top of the thighs the hair should be straight and thick, and on the loins and at the lower end of the tail, but it should be moderately thick higher up. It is advisable to take the hounds to the mountains often, but less frequently to cultivated land. For in the mountains it is possible to track and follow a hare without hindrance, whereas it is impossible to do either in cultivated land owing to the game paths. It is also well to take the hounds out into rough ground, whether they find a hare or not. For they get sound in the feet. And hard work in such country is good for their bodies. In summer they should be out till midday, in winter at any hour of the day, in autumn at any time except midday, and before evening during the spring, for at these times the temperature is mild. 5. The scent of the hair lies long in winter owing to the length of the nights, and for a short time in summer for the opposite reason. In the winter, however, there is no scent in the early morning whenever there is a white frost or the earth is frozen hard. 
for both white and black frost hold heat, since the one draws it out by its own strength, and the other congeals it. The hound's noses, too, are numbed by the cold, and they cannot smell when the tracks are in such a state until the tracks thaw in the sun or as day advances. Then the dogs can smell and the scent revives. A heavy dew, again, obliterates scent by carrying it downwards, and storms, occurring after a long interval. Draw smells from the ground and make the earth bad for scent until it dries. South winds spoil scent, because the moisture scatters it, but north winds concentrate and preserve it, if it has not been previously dissolved. Heavy showers drown it, and so does light rain, and the moon deadens it by its warmth, especially when at the full. Scent is most irregular at that time, for the hares, enjoying the light, fling themselves high in the air and jump a long way, frolicking with one another, and it becomes confused when foxes have crossed it. Spring with its genial temperature yields a clear scent, except where the ground is studded with flowers and hampers the hounds by mingling the odors of the flowers with it. In summer it is thin and faint, for the ground, being baked, obliterates what warmth it possesses, which is thin, and the hounds' noses are not so good at that season, because their bodies are relaxed. In the autumn it is unimpeded, for the cultivated crops have been harvested and the weeds have withered. So that the odors of the herbage do not cause trouble by mingling with it. In winter and summer and autumn the scent lies straight in the main. In spring it is complicated, for though the animal couples at all times, it does so especially at this season, so instinct prompts them to roam about together, and this is the result they produce. The scent left by the hare in going to her form lasts longer than the scent of a running hare. For on the way to the form the hare keeps stopping, whereas when on the run she goes fast, consequently the ground is packed with it in the one case, but in the other is not filled with it. In coverts it is stronger than in open ground, because she touches many objects while running about and sitting up. They find a resting place where there is anything growing or lying on the ground, underneath anything, on the top of the objects, inside, alongside, well away or quite near or fairly near, occasionally even in the sea by springing onto anything she can reach, or in fresh water. If there is anything sticking out or growing in it. The hare, when going to her form generally choosing a sheltered place for it in cold weather and a cool one in hot, but in spring and autumn a place exposed to the sun, but hares on the run do not do that, because they are scared by the hounds. When she sits, she puts the hind legs under the flanks, and most commonly keeps the forelegs close together and extended, resting the chin on the ends of the feet, and spreading the ears over the shoulder blades, so that she covers the soft parts. The hare too, being thick and soft, serves as a protection. When awake she blinks her eyelids, but when she is asleep the eyelids are wide open and motionless, and the eyes still. She moves her nostrils continually when sleeping, but less frequently when awake. When the ground is bursting with vegetation they frequent the fields rather than the mountains. Wherever she may be she remains there when tracked, except when she is suddenly alarmed at night. In which case she moves off. The animal is so prolific that at the same time she is rearing one litter, she produces another and she is pregnant. The scent of the little leverets is stronger than that of the big ones, for while their limbs are still soft they drag the whole body on the ground. Sportsmen, however, leave the very young ones to the goddess. Yearlings go very fast in the first run, but then flag, being agile, but weak. Find the hare's track by beginning with the hounds in the cultivated lands and gradually working downwards. To track those that do not come into cultivated land, search the meadows, valleys, streams, stones and woody places. If she moves off, don't shout, or the hounds may get wild with excitement and fail to recognize the tracks. Hares when found by hounds and pursued sometimes cross brooks and double back and slip into gullies or holes. The fact is they are terrified not only of the hounds, but of eagles as well, for they are apt to be snatched up while crossing hillocks and bare ground until they are yearlings, and the bigger ones are run down and caught by the hounds. The swiftest are those that frequent mountains, those of the plain are not so speedy, and those of the marshes are the slowest. Those that roam over any sort of country are difficult to chase. Since they know the short cuts. They run mostly uphill or on the level, less frequently in uneven ground, and very seldom downhill. When being pursued they are most conspicuous across ground that has been broken up, if they have some red in their coats, or across stubble, owing to the shadow they cast. They are also conspicuous in game paths and on roads if these are level, since the bright color of their coat shows up in the light. But when their line of retreat is amongst stones, in the mountains, over rocky or thickly wooded ground they cannot be seen owing to the similarity of coloring. 
when they are well ahead of the hounds, they will stop, and sitting up will raise themselves and listen for the baying or the footfall of the hounds anywhere near, and should they hear the sound of them from any quarter, they make off. Occasionally, even when they hear no sound. Some fancy or conviction prompts them to jump hither and thither past and through the same objects. Mixing the tracks as they retreat. The longest runners are those that are found on bare land, because they are exposed to view, the shortest, those found in thick covers, since the darkness hinders their flight. There are two species of hare. The larger dark brown, and the white patch on the forehead is large, the smaller are chestnut, with a small white patch. The larger have spots round the scut, the smaller at the side of it. The eyes in the large species are blue, in the small grey. The black at the tip of the ear is broad in the one species, narrow in the other. The smaller are found in most of the islands, both desert and inhabited. They are more plentiful in the islands than on the mainland, for in the majority of these there are no foxes to attack and carry off the hares and their young, nor eagles, for they haunt big mountains rather than small, and the mountains in the islands, generally speaking, are rather small. Hunters seldom visit the desert islands and there are few people in the inhabited ones, and most of them are not sportsmen, and if an island is consecrated, one may not even take dogs into it. Since, then, but few of the old hares and the leverets that they produce are exterminated by hunting, they are bound to be abundant. The sight of the hare is not keen for several reasons. The eyes are prominent, the lids are too small and do not give protection to the pupils, consequently the vision is weak and blurred. Added to this, though the animal spends much time asleep, it gets no benefit from that, so far as seeing goes. Its speed, too, accounts in no small degree for its dim sight. For it glances at an object and is past it in a flash, before realizing its nature. And those terrors, the hounds, close behind them when they are pursued combine with these causes to rob them of their wits. The consequence is that the hare bumps against many obstacles unawares and plunges into the net. If she ran straight. She would seldom meet with this mishap. But instead of that she comes round and hugs the place where she was born and bred, and so is caught. In a fair run she is seldom beaten by the hounds owing to her speed. Those that are caught are beaten in spite of their natural characteristics through meeting with an accident. Indeed, there is nothing in the world of equal size to match the hare as a piece of mechanism. For the various parts that make up her body are formed as follows. The head is light, small, drooping, narrow at the front, the ears are upright, the neck is thin, round, not stiff, and fairly long, the shoulder blades are straight and free at the top, the forelegs are agile and close together, the chest is not broad, the ribs are light and symmetrical, the loins are circular, the rump is fleshy, the flanks are soft and fairly spongy, the hips are round, well filled out, and the right distance apart at the top, the thighs are small and firm. Muscular on the outside and not puffy on the inside. The shanks are long and firm, the fore feet are extremely pliant and narrow and straight and the hind feet hard and broad, and all four are indifferent to rough ground, the hind legs are much longer than the fore legs, and slightly bent outwards, the coat is short and light. With such a frame she cannot fail to be strong, pliant and very agile. Here is a proof of her agility. When going quietly, she springs no one ever saw or ever will see a hare walking bringing the hind feet forward in advance of the fore feet and outside them. And that is how she runs. This is obvious when snow is on the ground. The scut is of no assistance in running, for it is not able to steer the body owing to its shortness. The hare does this by means of one of her ears, and when she is roused by the hound she drops one ear on the side on which she is being pressed and throws it aslant, and then bearing on this she wheels round sharply and in a moment leaves the assailant far behind. So charming is the sight that to see a hare tracked, found, pursued and caught is enough to make any man forget his heart's desire. When hunting on cultivated land avoid growing crops and let pools and streams alone. It is unseemly and wrong to interfere with them, and there is a risk of encouraging those who see to set themselves against the law. On days on which there is no hunting, all hunting tackle should be removed. 6. The trappings of hounds are collars, leashes, and surcingles. The collars should be soft and broad so as not to chafe the hound's coat. The leashes should have a noose for the hand, and nothing else, for if the collar is made in one piece with the leash, perfect control of the hounds is impossible. The straps of the surcingles should be broad, so as not to rub the flanks, and they should have little spurs sewed onto them, to keep the breed pure. 
Hounds should not be taken out hunting when off their feed, since this is a proof that they are ailing, nor when a strong wind is blowing, since it scatters the scent and they cannot smell, and the purse nets will not stand in position, nor the haze. But when neither of these hindrances prevents, have the hounds out every other day. Do not let them take to pursuing foxes, for it is utter ruin, and they are never at hand when wanted. Vary the hunting ground frequently, so that the hounds may be familiar with the hunting grounds and the master with the country. Start early, and so give the hounds a fair chance of following the scent. A late start robs the hounds of the find and the hunters of the prize. For the scent is by its nature too thin to last all day. Let the net keeper wear light clothing when he goes hunting. Let him set up the purse nets in winding, rough, steep, narrow, shady paths, brooks, ravines, running watercourses, these are the places in which the hare is most apt to take refuge, a list of all the others would be endless, leaving unobstructed and narrow passages to and through these places, just about daybreak, and not too early, so that in case the line of nets be near the grove to be searched, the hare may not be frightened by hearing the noise close by, if the distance is. Considerable, it matters less if the work is done early, seeing that the nets stand clear so that nothing may cling to them. He must fix the stakes asland, so that when pulled they may stand the strain. On the tops of them let him put an equal number of meshes, and set the props uniformly, raising the purse towards the center. To the cord let him attach a long, big stone, so that the net may not pull away when the hair is inside. Let him make his line long and high, so that the hair may not jump over. When it comes to tracking the hare, he must not be too zealous. To do everything possible to effect a quick capture shows perseverance, but is not hunting. Let him stretch the haze on level ground and put the road nets in roads and from game tracks into the adjacent ground, fastening down the, lower, cords to the ground, joining the elbows, fixing the stakes between the selvages, putting the ends on the top of the stakes and stopping the byways. Let him mount guard, going round the nets. If a purse net is pulling its stake out of line, let him put it up. When the hare is being chased into the purse net he must run forward and shout as he runs after her. When she is in, he must calm the excitement of the hounds, soothing without touching them. He must also shout to the huntsman and let him know that the hare is caught. Or that she has run past on this or that side. Or that he has not seen her, or where he caught sight of her. Let the huntsman go out to the hunting ground in a simple light dress and shoes, carrying a cudgel in his hand, and let the net keeper follow. Let them keep silent while approaching the ground, so that, in case the hare is near, she may not move off on hearing voices. Having tied the hounds separately to the tree so that they can easily be slipped, let him set up the purse nets and haze in the manner described. After this let the net keeper keep guard, and let the huntsman take the hounds and go to the place in the hunting ground where the hare may be lurking, and after registering a vow to Apollo and Artemis the huntress to give them a share of the spoil, let him loose one hound, the cleverest at following a track, at sunrise in winter, before dawn in summer, and some time between at other seasons. As soon as the hound picks up a line from the network of tracks that lead straight ahead, let him slip another. If the track goes on, let him set the others going one by one at short intervals, and follow without pressing them, accosting each by name, but not often, that they may not get excited too soon. They will go forward full of joy and ardor, disentangling the various tracks, double or triple springing forward now beside, now across the same one's tracks interlaced or circular, straight or crooked, close or scattered, clear or obscure, running past one another with tails wagging, ears dropped and eyes flashing. As soon as they are near the hare they will let the huntsman know by the quivering of the whole body as well as the tail, by making fierce rushes, by racing past one another, by scampering along together persistently, massing quickly, breaking up and again rushing forward. At length they will reach the hare's form and will go for her. She will start up suddenly, and will leave the hounds barking and baying behind her as she makes off. Let the huntsman shout at her as she runs. Now, hounds. Now. Well done. Bravo, hounds. Well done, hounds. Wrapping his cloak round his arm and seizing his cudgel he must follow up behind the hare and not try to head her off, since that is useless. The hare, making off, though out of sight, generally doubles back to the place where she is found. Let him call out to the man, hit her, boy, hit her, hit her. And the man must let him know whether she is caught or not. If she is caught in the first run, let him call in the hounds and look for another but if not, he must follow up at top speed and not let her go, but stick to it persistently. 
If the hounds come on her again in the pursuit, let him cry, good, good, hounds, after her, hounds. If they have got so far ahead of him that he cannot overtake them by following up and is quite out of the running, or if he cannot see them though they are moving about somewhere near or sticking to the tracks, let him find out by shouting as he runs past to anyone near. Hello. Have you seen the hounds? As soon as he has found out, let him stand near if they are on the track, and cheer them on, running through the hound's names, using all the variations of tone he can produce, pitching his voice high and low, soft and loud. Amongst other calls, if the chase is in the mountains, let him sing out, a ho, hounds, a ho. If they are not clinging to the track, but are overrunning, let him call them in with, back, hounds, back with you. As soon as they are close on the tracks, let him cast them round, making many circles, and wherever they find the track dim, let him stick a pole in the ground as a mark, and beginning from this mark keep them together until they clearly recognize the track, encouraging and coaxing them. As soon as the track is clear they will be off in hot pursuit, hurling themselves on it, jumping beside it, working together, guessing, signaling to one another and setting bounds for one another that they can recognize. When they are thus scurrying in a bunch along the track, let him follow up without pressing them, or they may overrun the line through excess of zeal. As soon as they are near the hare and give the huntsman clear evidence of the fact, let him take care, or in her terror of the hound she will slip away and be off. The hounds, wagging their tails, colliding and frequently jumping over one another, and baying loudly, with heads uplifted and glances at the huntsman, showing him plainly that they have the real thing now, will rouse the hare for themselves and go for her, giving tongue. If she plunges into the purse nets or bolts past them on the inside or outside, the net keeper must in each event make it known by shouting. If she is caught, look for another, if not, continue the pursuit, using the same methods of encouragement. As soon as the hounds are getting tired of pursuing and the day is far advanced, it is time for the huntsman to search for the hare, worn out as she is. Passing over nothing growing or lying on the ground retracing his steps continually for fear of an oversight since the animal rests in a small space and is too tired and frightened to get up. Bringing the hounds along, encouraging and exhorting the gentle frequently, the willful sparingly, the average sort in moderation, until he kills her in a fair run or drives her into the purse nets. After this take up the purse nets and haze, rub down the hounds and leave the hunting ground, after waiting, if it be an afternoon in summer, in order that the hounds' feet may not be overheated on the road. 7. For breeding purposes. Relieve the bitches of work in the winter, that the rest may help them to produce a fine litter towards spring, which is the best growing season for hounds. They are in heat for 14 days. Mate them with good dogs near the end of the period, that they may the sooner become pregnant. When they are near their time do not take them out hunting continually, but only now and then, or love of work may result in a miscarriage. The period of gestation is 60 days. After the birth of the puppies leave them with the mother and do not place them under another bitch, for nursing by a foster mother does not promote growth, whereas the mother's milk and breath do them good, and they like her caresses. As soon as the puppies can get about, give them milk for a year, and the food that will form their regular diet, and nothing else. For heavy feeding warps the puppies' legs and sows the seeds of disease in the system, and their insides go wrong. Give the hounds short names. So as to be able to call to them easily. The following are the right sort, Psyche, Thymus, Porpax, Styrax, Lonch, Locus, Fura, Phylax, Taxis, Xiphon, Phonax, Phlegon, Alci, Tushon, Hylius, Medas, Porthun, Spurchin, Orge, Bremen, Hybri, Tholon, Rome, Antheus, Heb, Gethius, Chara, Lucen, Orgo, Polys, Bia, Stition, Spewed, Briars, Enas, Steris, Crawge, Kynon, Turbas, Sthenan, Ether, Actis, Echmi, Nose, Gnome, Stiban, Horm. Take the bitches to the hunting ground at eight months, the dogs at ten. Do not slip them on the trail that leads to the form, but keep them in long leashes and follow the tracking hounds, letting the youngsters run to and fro in the tracks. As soon as the hare is found, if they shape well for the run don't let them go at once, but as soon as the hare has got so far ahead in the run that they can't see her, send them along. For if the huntsman slips good-looking, plucky runners close to the hare, the sight of her will cause them to strain themselves and crack, since their bodies are not yet firm. So she should be very careful about this. But if they are poor runners there is no reason why he should not let them go. For as they have no hope of catching the hare from the first, they will not meet with this accident. On the other hand, let the youngsters follow the track of the hare on the run until they catch her, and when she is caught, 
give her to them to break up. As soon as they show reluctance to stick to it and begin scattering, call then in, until they grow accustomed to keep on till they find the hair, lest if they get into the way of misbehaving when they seek her, they end by becoming skirt as a vile habit. Give them their food near the purse net so long as they are young, while the nets are being taken up, so that if they have gone astray in the hunting ground, through inexperience, they may come back safe for their meal. This will be discontinued when they come to regard the game as an enemy, they will be too intent on that to worry about their food. As a rule when they are hungry the master should feed the hounds himself, for when they are not hungry they do not know to whom that is due, but when they want food and get it. They love the giver. 8. Track the hare when it snows so hard that the ground is covered. But if there are black spaces, she will be hard to find. When it is cloudy and the wind is in the north, the tracks lie plain on the surface for a long time, because they melt slowly, but only for a short time if the wind is south and the sun shines, since they soon melt away. But when it snows without stopping, don't attempt it, since the tracks are covered, nor when there is a high wind, since they are buried in the snowdrift it causes. On no account have the hounds out with you for this kind of sport, for the snow freezes their noses and feet, and destroys the scent of the hair owing to the hard frost. But take the haze, and go with a companion to the mountains, passing over the cultivated land, and as soon as the tracks are found, follow them. If they are complicated, go back from the same ones to the same place and work round in circles and examine them, trying to find where they lead. The hare roams about uncertain where to rest, and, moreover, it is her habit to be tricky in her movements. Because she is constantly being pursued in this manner. As soon as the track is clear, push straight ahead. It will lead either to a thickly wooded spot or to a steep declivity. For the gusts of wind carry the snow over such places, consequently many resting places are left, and she looks for one of these. As soon as the tracks lead to such a place, don't go near, or she will move off, but go round and explore. For she is probably there, and there will be no doubt about the matter, since the tracks will nowhere run out from such places. As soon as it is evident that she is there, leave her for she will not stir and look for another before the tracks become obscure, and take care, in case you find others, that you will have enough daylight left to surround them with nets. When the time has come, stretch the haze round each of them in the same way as in places where no snow lies, enclosing anything she may be near, and as soon as they are up. Approach and start her. If she wriggles out of the haze, run after her along the tracks. She will make for other places of the same sort, unless indeed she squeezes herself into the snow itself. Wherever she may be, mark the place and surround it. Or, if she doesn't wait, continue the pursuit. For she will be caught even without the haze, for she soon tires owing to the depth of the snow, and because large lumps of it cling to the bottom of her hairy feet. 9. For hunting fawns and deer use Indian hounds. For they are strong, big, speedy and plucky, and these qualities render them capable of hard work. Hunt the calves in spring, since they are born at that season. First go to the meadows and reconnoitre, to discover where hinds are most plentiful. Wherever they are, let the keeper of the hounds go with the hounds and javelins to this place before daybreak and tie up the dogs to tree some distance off, so that they may not catch sight of the hinds and bark, and let him watch from a coin of vantage. At daybreak he will see every dam leading her fawn to the place where she means to lay it. When they have put them down, suckled them, and looked about to make sure that they are not seen, they move away into the offing and watch their calves. On seeing this, let him loose the dogs, and taking the javelins approach the spot where he saw the nearest fawn laid, carefully observing the position so as not to make a mistake, since they look quite different when approached from what they seem to be at a distance. As soon as he sees the fawn, let him go close up to it. It will keep still, squeezing its body tight against the ground, and will let itself be lifted, bleating loudly, unless it is wet through. In which case it will not stay. Since the rapid condensation of the moisture in its body by the cold causes it to make off. But it will be caught by the hounds if hotly pursued. Having taken it, let him give it to the net keeper. It will cry out, and the sight and the sound between them will bring the hind running up to the holder, in her anxiety to rescue it. That is the moment to set the hounds on her, and ply the javelms. Having settled this one, let him proceed to tackle the rest, hunting them in the same manner. Young fawns are caught by this method, but big ones are difficult to catch. For they graze with their dams and other deer, and when pursued they make off in the midst of them, or sometimes in front, but rarely in the rear. 
the hinds trample on the hounds in their efforts to defend their fawns, consequently it is not easy to catch them, unless a man gets amongst them at once and scatters them, so that one of the fawns is isolated. The result of this strain on the hounds is that they are left behind in the first run. For the absence of the hinds fills the creature with terror, and the speed of fawns at that age is without parallel. But they are soon caught in the second or third run, since their bodies are still too young to stand the work. Caltrops are set for deer in the mountains, about meadows and streams and glades, in alleys and cultivated lands that they frequent. The caltrops should be made of plaited yew, stripped of the bark, so as not to rot. They should have circular crowns, and the nails should be of iron and wood alternately, plaited into the rim, the iron nails being the longer, so that the wooden ones will yield to the foot and the others hurt it. The noose of the cord to be laid on the crown and the cord itself should be of woven esparto, since this is rot-proof. The noose itself and the cord must be strong, and the clog attached must be of common or evergreen oak, 27 inches long, not stripped of the bark, and 3 inches thick. To set the caltrops make a round hole in the ground 15 inches deep. Of the same size at the top as the crowns of the traps, but tapering towards the bottom. Make shallow drills in the ground for the cord and the clog to lie in. Having done this lay the caltrop on the hole a little below the surface, and level, and put the noose of the cord round the top. Having laid the cord and the clog in their places, lay spindlewood twigs on the top, not letting them stick out beyond the circle, and on these any light leaves in season. Next throw some earth on them, beginning with the surface soil taken from the holes, and on top of this some unbroken soil from a distance, in order that the position may be completely concealed from the deer. Remove any earth remaining over to a place some distance from the caltrop, for if the deer smells earth recently disturbed, it shies, and it is not slow to smell it. Accompanied by the hounds, inspect the traps set in the mountains. Preferably at daybreak, but it should be done also at other times during the day. In the cultivated lands early. For in the mountains deer may be caught in the daytime as well as at night owing to the solitude, but on cultivated land only at night, because they are afraid of human beings in the daytime. On coming across a caltrop upset, slip the hounds, give them a hark forward, and follow along the track of the clog, noticing which way it runs. That will be clear enough for the most part, for the stones will be displaced and the trail of the clock will be obvious in the cultivated ground, and if the deer crosses rough places, there will be fragments of bark torn from the clock on the rocks, and the pursuit will be all the easier. If the deer is caught by the forefoot it will soon be taken, as it hits every part of its body and its face with the clock during the run, or if by the hind leg, the dragging of the clock hampers the whole body, and sometimes it dashes into forked branches of trees, and unless it breaks the cord, is caught on the spot. But, whether you catch it in this way or by wearing it out, don't go near it, for it will butt, if it's a stag, and kick, and if it's a hind, it will kick. So throw javelins at it from a distance. In the summer months they are also caught by pursuit without the aid of a caltrop, for they get dead beat, so that they are hit standing. When hard pressed, they will even plunge into the sea and into pools in their bewilderment, and occasionally they drop from want of breath. 10. For hunting the wild boar provide yourself with Indian, Cretan, Locrian and Laconian hounds, boar nets, javelins, spears and caltrops. In the first place the hounds of each breed must be of high quality, that they may be qualified to fight the beast. The nets must be made of the same flax as those used for hares, of 45 threads woven in three strands, each strand containing 15 threads. The height should be 10 knots, counted from the top. And the depths of the meshes 15 inches. The ropes at top and bottom must be half as thick again as the nets. There must be metal rings at the elbows. And the ropes must be inserted under the meshes, and their ends must pass out through the rings. Fifteen nets are sufficient. The javelins must be of every variety, the blades broad and keen, and the shaft strong. The spears must have blades fifteen inches long, and stout teeth at the middle of the socket, forged in one piece but standing out, and their shafts must be of cornel wood, as thick as a military spear. The caltrops must be similar to those used in hunting deer. There must be several huntsmen, for the task of capturing the beast is no light one even for a large number of men. I will now explain how to use each portion of the outfit in hunting. First then, when the company reach the place where they suppose the game to lurk, let them slip one of the Laconian hounds, and taking the others in leash, go round the place with the hound. As soon as she has found his tracks, let the field follow, one behind another, keeping exactly to the line of the track. The huntsman also will find many evidences of the quarry. 
the tracks in soft ground, broken branches where the bushes are thick, and marks of his tusks wherever there are trees. The hound following the track will, as a rule, arrive at a well-wooded spot. For the beast usually lies in such places, since they are warm in winter and cool in summer. As soon as the hound reaches the lair, she will bark. But in most cases the boar will not get up. So take the hound and tie her up with the others at a good distance from the lair, and have the nets put up in the convenient anchorages, hanging the meshes on forked branches of trees. Out of the net itself make a long projecting bosom, putting sticks inside to prop it up on both sides, so that the light of day may penetrate as much as possible into the bosom through the meshes, in order that the interior may be as light as possible when the ball rushes at it. Fasten the, lower, rope to a strong tree, not to a bush, since the bushes give way at the bare stem. Wherever there is a gap between a net and the ground. Fill in the places that afford no anchorage with wood, in order that the boar may rush into the net, and not slip out. As soon as they are in position, let the party go to the hounds and loose them all, and take the javelins and the spears and advance. Let one man, the most experienced, urge on the hounds, while the others follow in regular order, keeping well behind one another, so that the boar may have a free passage between them. For should he be to retreat and dash into a crowd, there is a risk of being gored, since he spends his rage on anyone he encounters. As soon as the hounds are near the lair, they will go for him. The noise will cause him to get up, and he will toss any hound that attacks him in front. He will run and plunge into the nets, or if not, you must pursue him. If the ground where he is caught in the net is sloping, he will quickly get up, if it is level, he will immediately stand still, intent on himself. At this moment the hounds will press their attack. And the huntsmen must fling their javelins at him warily, and pelt him with stones, gathering round behind and a good way off, till he shoves hard enough to pull the rope of the net tight. Then let the most experienced and most powerful man in the field approach him in front and thrust his spear into him. If, in spite of javelins and stones, he refuses to pull the rope tight, but draws back, wheels round and marks his assailant, in that case the man must approach him spear in hand, and grasp it with the left in front and the right behind, since the left steadies while the right drives it. The left foot must follow the left hand forward, and the right foot the other hand. As he advances let him hold the spear before him, with his legs not much further apart than in wrestling, turning the left side towards the left hand, and then watching the beast's eye and noting the movement of the fellow's head. Let him present the spear, taking care that the boar doesn't knock it out of his hand with a jerk of his head, since he follows up the impetus of the sudden knock. In case this accident should happen, the man must fall on his face and clutch the undergrowth beneath him, for, if the beast attacks him in this position, he is unable to lift the man's body owing to the upward curve of his tusks. But if his body is off the ground, the man is certain to be gored. Consequently the boar tries to lift him up, and, if he cannot, he stands over and tramples on him. For a man in this critical situation there is only one escape from these disasters. One of his fellow huntsmen must approach with a spear and provoke the boar by making as though he would hurl it, but he must not hurl it, or he may hit the man on the ground. On seeing this the boar will leave the man under him and turn savagely and furiously on his tormentor. The other must jump up instantly, remembering to keep his spear in his hand as he rises, for safety without victory is not honourable. He must again present the spear in the same way as before, and thrust it inside the shoulder blade where the throat is, and push with all his might. The enraged beast will come on, and but for the teeth of the blade, would shove himself forward along the shaft far enough to reach the man holding the spear. His strength is so great that he has some peculiar properties which one would never imagine him to possess. Thus, if you lay hairs on his tusks immediately after he is dead, they shrivel up, such is the heat of the tusks. While he is alive they become intensely hot whenever he is provoked, or the surface of the hound's coats would not be singed when he tries to gore them and misses. All this trouble, and even more, the male animal causes before he is caught. If the creature in the toils is a sow, run up and stick her, taking care not to be knocked down. Such an accident is bound to result in your being trampled and bitten. So don't fall under her, if you can help it. If you get into that position unintentionally, the same aids to rise that are used to assist a man under a boar are employed. When on your feet again. You must ply the spear until you kill her. Another way of capturing them is as follows. The nets are set up for them at the passages from glens into oak coppices, dells and rough places, on the outskirts of meadows, fens and sheets of water. The keeper, spear in hand, watches the nets. 
the huntsmen take the hounds and search for the likeliest places. As soon as the boar is found, he is pursued. If he falls into the net, the net keeper must take his spear, approach the boar, and use it as I have explained. The boar is also captured, in hot weather, when pursued by the hounds, for in spite of his prodigious strength, the animal tires with hard breathing. Many hounds are killed in this kind of sport, and the huntsmen themselves run risks, whenever in the course of the pursuit they are forced to approach a boar with their spears in their hands. When he is tired or standing in water or has posted himself by a steep declivity or is unwilling to come out of a thicket. For neither net nor anything else stops him from rushing at anyone coming near him. Nevertheless approach they must in these circumstances, and show the pluck that led them to take up this hobby. They must use the spear and the forward position of the body as explained, then, if a man does come to grief, it will not be through doing things the wrong way. Caltrips are also set for them as for the deer and in the same places. The routine of inspection and pursuit, the methods of approach and the use of the spear are the same. The young pigs are not to be caught without difficulty. For they are not left alone so long as they are little, and when the hounds find them or they see something coming, they quickly vanish into the wood, and they are generally accompanied by both parents, who are fierce at such times and more ready to fight for their young than for themselves. 11. Lions, leopards, lynxes, panthers. Bears and all similar wild beasts are captured in foreign countries. About Mount. Pangaeus and Citus beyond Macedonia, on Mysian Olympus and Pindus, on Nysa beyond Syria, and in other mountain ranges capable of supporting such animals. On the mountains they are sometimes poisoned, owing to the difficulty of the ground, with aconite. Hunters put it down mixed with the animal's favorite food round pools and in other places that they frequent. Sometimes, while they are going down to the plain at night, they are cut off by parties of armed and mounted men. This is a dangerous method of capturing them. Sometimes the hunters dig large, round, deep holes, leaving a pillar of earth in the middle. They tie up a goat and put it on the pillar in the evening, and pile wood round the hole without leaving an entrance, so that the animals cannot see what lies in front. On hearing the bleating in the night, the beasts run round the barrier, and finding no opening, jump over and are caught. 12. With the practical side of hunting I have finished. But the advantages that those who have been attracted by this pursuit will gain are many for it makes the body healthy, improves the sight and hearing, and keeps men from growing old, and it affords the best training for war. In the first place, when marching over rough roads under arms, they will not tire, accustomed to carry arms for capturing wild beasts, they will bear up under their tasks. Again, they will be capable of sleeping on a hard bed and of guarding well the place assigned to them. In an attack on the enemy they will be able to go for him and at the same time to carry out the orders that are passed along, because they are used to do the same things on their own account when capturing the game. If their post is in the van they will not desert it, because they can endure. In the route of the enemy they will make straight for the foe without a slip over any kind of ground, through habit. If part of their own army has met with disaster in ground rendered difficult by woods and defiles or what not. They will manage to save themselves without loss of honor and to save others. For their familiarity with the business will give them knowledge that others lack. Indeed, it has happened before now, when a great host of allies has been put to flight, that a little band of such men, through their fitness and confidence, has renewed the battle and routed the victorious enemy when he has blundered owing to difficulties in the ground. For men who are sound in body and mind may always stand on the threshold of success. It was because they knew that they owed their successes against the enemy to such qualities that our ancestors looked after the young men. For in spite of the scarcity of corn it was their custom from the earliest times not to prevent hunters from hunting over any growing crops, and, in addition, not to permit hunting at night within a radius of many furlongs from the city, so that the masters of that art might not rob the young men of their game. In fact they saw that this is the only one among the pleasures of the younger men that produces a rich crop of blessings. For it makes sober and upright men of them, because they are trained in the school of truth, and they perceive that to these men they owed their success in war, as in other matters, and it does not keep them from any other honourable occupation they wish to follow, like other and evil pleasures that they ought not to learn. Of such men, therefore, are good soldiers and good generals made. For they whose toils root out whatever is base and froward from mind and body and make desire for virtue to flourish in their place they are the best, since they will not brook injustice to their own city nor injury to its soil. Some say that it is not right to love hunting, because it may lead to neglect of one's domestic affairs. They are not aware that all who benefit their cities and their friends are more attentive to their domestic affairs than other men. 
therefore, if keen sportsmen fit themselves to be useful to their country in matters of vital moment. Neither will they be remiss in their private affairs, for the state is necessarily concerned both in the safety and in the ruin of the individual's domestic fortunes. Consequently such men as these save the fortunes of every other individual as well as their own. But many of those who talk in this way, blinded by jealousy, choose to be ruined through their own evil rather than be saved by other men's virtue. For most pleasures are evil, and by yielding to these they are encouraged either to say or to do what is wrong. Then by their frivolous words they make enemies, and by their evil deeds bring diseases and losses and death on themselves, their children and their friends, being without perception of the evils, but more perceptive than others of the pleasures. Who would employ these to save a state? From these evils, however, everyone who loves that which I recommend will hold aloof, since a good education teaches a man to observe laws, to talk of righteousness and hear of it. Those, then, who have given themselves up to continual toil and learning hold for their own portion laborious lessons and exercises, but they hold safety for their cities. But if any decline to receive instruction because of the labour and prefer to live among untimely pleasures, they are by nature utterly evil. For they obey neither laws nor good words, for because they toil not, they do not discover what a good man ought to be, so that they cannot be pious or wise men, and being without education they constantly find fault with the educated. In these men's hands, therefore, nothing can prosper. All discoveries that have benefited mankind are due to the better sort. Now the better sort are those who are willing to toil. And this has been proved by a great example. For among the ancients the companions of Chayan to whom I referred learnt many noble lessons in their youth, beginning with hunting, from these lessons there sprang in them great virtue. For which they are admired even today. That all desire virtue is obvious, but because they must toil if they are to gain her, the many fall away. For the achievement of her is hidden in obscurity, whereas the toils inseparable from her are manifest. It may be that, if her body were visible, men would be less careless of virtue, knowing that she sees them as clearly as they see her. For when he is seen by his beloved every man rises above himself and shrinks from what is ugly and evil in word or deed, for fear of being seen by him. But in the presence of virtue men do many evil and ugly things, supposing that they are not regarded by her because they do not see her. Yet she is present everywhere because she is immortal, and she honours those who are good to her, but casts off the bad. Therefore, if men knew that she is watching them, they would be impatient to undergo the toils and the discipline by which she is hardly to be captured, and would achieve her. 13. I am surprised at the sophists. As they are called. Because, though most of them profess to lead the young to virtue they lead them to the very opposite. We have never seen anywhere the man whose goodness was due to the sophists of our generation. Neither do their contributions to literature tend to make men good, but they have written many books on frivolous subjects, books that offer the young empty pleasures, but put no virtue into them. To read them in the hope of learning something from them is mere waste of time, and they keep one from useful occupations and teach what is bad. Therefore their grave faults incur my grave censure. As for the style of their writings, I complain that the language is far-fetched, and there is no trace in them of wholesome maxims by which the young might be trained to virtue. I am no professor, but I know that the best thing is to be taught what is good by one's own nature. And the next best thing is to get it from those who really know something good instead of being taught by masters of the art of deception. I dare say that I do not express myself in the language of a sophist, in fact, that is not my object, my object is rather to give utterance to wholesome thoughts that will meet the needs of readers well educated in virtue. For words will not educate, but maxims, if well found. Many others besides myself blame the sophists of our generation philosophers I will not call them because the wisdom they profess consists of words and not of thoughts. I am well aware that someone, perhaps one of this set, will say that what is well and methodically written is not well and methodically written for hasty and false censure will come easily to them. But my aim in writing has been to produce sound work that will make men not wiseacres, but wise and good. For I wish my work not to seem useful, but to be so, that it may stand for all time unrefuted. The sophists talk to deceive and write for their own gain, and do no good to anyone. For there is not, and there never was a wise man among them. Every one of them is content to be called a sophist, which is a term of reproach among sensible men. So my advice is, avoid the behests of the sophists, and despise not the conclusions of the philosophers, for the sophists hunt the rich and young, but the philosophers are friends to all alike, but as for men's fortunes, they neither honour nor despise them. 
Envy not those either who recklessly seek their own advantage whether in private or in public life bear in mind that the best of them, though they are favourably judged, are envied, and the bad both fare badly and are unfavourably judged. For engaged in robbing private persons of their property, or plundering the state, they render less service than private persons when plans for securing the common safety are afoot, and in body they are disgracefully unfit for war because they are incapable of toil. But huntsmen offer their lives and their property in sound condition for the service of the citizens. These attack the wild beasts. Those others their friends. And whereas those who attack their friends earn infamy by general consent, huntsmen by attacking the wild beasts gain a good report. For if they make a capture, they win victory over enemy forces, and if they fail, they are commended, in the first place, because they assail powers hostile to the whole community, and, secondly, because they go out neither to harm a man nor for sordid gain. Moreover, the very attempt makes them better in many ways and wiser, and we will give the reason. Unless they abound in labours and inventions and precautions, they cannot capture game. For the forces contending with them, fighting for their life and in their own home, are in great strength, so that the huntsman's labours are in vain, unless by greater perseverance and by much intelligence he can overcome them. In fine, the politician whose objects are selfish practices for victory over friends, the huntsman for victory over common foes. This practice makes the one a better. The other a far worse fighter against all other enemies. The one takes prudence with him for companion in the chase, the other base rashness. The one can despise malice and avarice, the other cannot. The language of the one is gracious, of the other ugly. As for religion, nothing checks impiety in the one, the other is conspicuous for his piety. In fact, an ancient story has it that the gods delight in this business, both as followers and spectators of the chase. Therefore, reflecting on these things, the young who do what I exhort them to do will put themselves in the way of being dear to the gods and pious men. Conscious that one or other of the gods is watching their deeds. These will be good to parents, good to the whole city, to every one of their friends and fellow citizens. For all men who have loved hunting have been good, and not men only, but those women also to whom the goddess has given this blessing, Atalanta and Procris and others like them. Constitution of the Athenians. Translated by E. C. Marchant. Classical Athens. And as for the fact that the Athenians have chosen the kind of constitution that they have, I do not think well of their doing this inasmuch as in making their choice they have chosen to let the worst people be better off than the good. Therefore, on this account I do not think well of their constitution. But since they have decided to have it so, I intend to point out how will they preserve their constitution and accomplish those other things for which the rest of the Greeks criticize them. First I want to say this, there the poor and the people generally are right to have more than the highborn and wealthy for the reason that it is the people who man the ships and impart strength to the city, the steersmen, the bosuns, the sub bosuns the lookout officers, and the shipwrights these are the ones who impart strength to the city far more than the hoplites, the highborn, and the good men. This being the case, it seems right for everyone to have a share in the magistracies, both allotted and elective, for anyone to be able to speak his mind if he wants to. Then there are those magistracies which bring safety or danger to the people as a whole depending on whether or not they are well managed, of these the people claim no share, they do not think they should have an allotted share in the generalships or cavalry commands. For these people realize that there is more to be gained from their not holding these magistracies but leaving them instead in the hands of the most influential men. However, such magistracies as are salaried and domestically profitable the people are keen to hold. Then there is a point which some find extraordinary, that they everywhere assign more to the worst persons, to the poor, and to the popular types than to the good men, in this very point they will be found manifestly preserving their democracy. For the poor, the popular, and the base, inasmuch as they are well off and the likes of them are numerous, will increase the democracy. But if the wealthy, good men are well off, the men of the people create a strong opposition to themselves. And everywhere on earth the best element is opposed to democracy. For among the best people there is minimal wantonness and injustice but a maximum of scrupulous care for what is good, whereas among the people there is a maximum of ignorance, disorder, and wickedness, for poverty draws them rather to disgraceful actions, and because of a lack of money some men are uneducated and ignorant. Someone might say that they ought not to let everyone speak on equal terms and serve on the council, but rather just the cleverest and finest. Yet their policy is also excellent in this very point of allowing even the worst people to speak. For if the good men were to speak and make policy, it would be splendid for the likes of themselves but not so for the men of the people. 
but, as things are. Any wretch who wants to can stand up and obtain what is good for him and the likes of himself. Someone might say, what good would such a man propose for himself and the people? But they know that this man's ignorance, baseness, and favor are more profitable than the good man's virtue, wisdom, and ill will. A city would not be the best on the basis of such a way of life, but the democracy would be best preserved that way. For the people do not want a good government under which they themselves are slaves, they want to be free and to rule. Bad government is of little concern to them. What you consider bad government is the very source of the people's strength and freedom. If it is good government you seek, you will first observe the cleverest men establishing the laws in their own interest. Then the good men will punish the bad, they will make policy for the city and not allow madmen to participate or to speak their minds or to meet in assembly. As a result of these excellent measures the people would swiftly fall into slavery. Now among the slaves and metics at Athens there is the greatest uncontrolled wantonness. You can't hit them there, and a slave will not stand aside for you. I shall point out why this is their native practice, if it were customary for a slave, or metic or freedman, to be struck by one who is free, you would often hit an Athenian citizen by mistake on the assumption that he was a slave. For the people there are no better dressed than the slaves and metics, nor are they any more handsome. If anyone is also startled by the fact that they let the slaves live luxuriously there and some of them sumptuously, it would be clear that even this they do for a reason. For where there is a naval power, it is necessary from financial considerations to be slaves to the slaves in order to take a portion of their earnings, and it is then necessary to let them go free. And where there are rich slaves, it is no longer profitable in such a place for my slave to fear you. In Sparta my slave would fear you, but if your slave fears me, there will be the chance that he will give over his money so as not to have to worry any more. For this reason we have set up equality between slaves and free men, and between metics and citizens. The city needs metics in view of the many different trades and the fleet. Accordingly, then, we have reasonably set up a similar equality also for the metics. The people have spoiled the athletic and musical activities at Athens because they thought them unfitting, they know they can't do them. In the training of dramatic choruses and in providing for athletic contests and the fitting out of triremes, they know that it is the wealthy who lead the choruses, but the people who are led in them, and it is the wealthy who provide for athletic contests, but the people who are presided over in the triremes and in the games. At least the people think themselves worthy of taking money for singing, running, dancing, and sailing in ships, so that they become wealthy and the wealthy poorer. And in the courts they are not so much concerned with justice as with their own advantage. In regard to the allies, the Athenians sail out and lay information. As they are said to do, they hate the aristocrats in Asmach as they realize that the ruler is necessarily hated by the ruled and that if the rich and aristocratic men in the cities are strong, the rule of the people at Athens will last for a very short time. This is why they disfranchise the aristocrats, take away their money, expel and kill them, whereas they promote the interests of the lower class. The Athenian aristocrats protect their opposite numbers in the allied cities, since they realize that it will be to their advantage always to protect the finer people in the cities. Someone might say that the Athenian strength consists in the allies' ability to pay tribute money, but the rabble thinks it more advantageous for each one of the Athenians to possess the resources of the allies and for the allies themselves to possess only enough for survival and to work without being able to plot defection. Also in another point the Athenian people are thought to act ill-advisedly, they force the allies to sail to Athens for judicial proceedings. But they reason in reply that the Athenian people benefit from this. First, from the deposits at law they receive their dicastic pay through the year. Then, sitting at home without going out in ships, they manage the affairs of the allied cities, in the courts they protect the democrats and ruin their opponents. If the allies were each to hold trials locally, they would, in view of their annoyance with the Athenians, ruin those of their citizens who were the leading friends of the Athenian people. In addition, the people at Athens profit in the following ways when trials involving allies are held in Athens, first, the 1% tax in the Piraeus brings in more for the city, secondly, if anyone has lodgings to rent, he does better, and so does anyone who lets out on hire a team of animals or a slave, further, the heralds of the assembly do better when the allies are in town. In addition, were the allies not to go away for judicial proceedings, they would honor only those of the Athenians who sail out from the city, namely generals, triarchs, and ambassadors.
As it is now, each one of the allies is compelled to flatter the Athenian populace from the realization that judicial action for anyone who comes to Athens is in the hands of none other than the populace, this indeed is the law at Athens, in the courts he is obliged to entreat whoever comes in and to grasp him by the hand. In this way the allies have become instead the slaves of the Athenian people. Furthermore, as a result of their possessions of abroad and the tenure of magistracies which take them abroad, both they and their associates have imperceptibly learned to row, for of necessity a man who is often at sea takes up an oar, as does his slave, and they learn naval terminology. Both through experience of voyages and through practice they become fine steersmen. Some are trained by service as steersmen on an ordinary vessel, others on a freighter, others after such experience on triremes. Many are able to row as soon as they board their ships, since they have been practicing beforehand throughout their whole lives. But the Athenian infantry, which has the reputation of being very weak, has been deliberately so constituted, they consider that they are weaker and fewer than their enemies, but they are stronger, even on land than such of their allies as pay the tribute, and they think their infantry sufficient if they are more powerful than their allies. Besides, there is the following accidental circumstance which applies to them, subject peoples on land can combine small cities and fight collectively. But subject peoples at sea, by virtue of being islanders, cannot join their cities together into the same unit. For the sea is in the way, and those now in power are thalassocrats. If it is possible for islanders to combine unnoticed on a single island, they will die of starvation. Of the Athenian subject cities on the mainland, some which are large are ruled because of fear, and some small are ruled because of actual need, for there is no city which does not have to import or export, and these activities will be impossible for a city unless it is subject to the rulers of the sea. Moreover, the rulers of the sea can do just what rulers of the land sometimes can do. Ravage the territory of the stronger. For wherever there is no enemy, or wherever enemies are few, it is possible to put in along the coast and if there is an attack. To go on board one ship and sail away, one who does this is less badly off than one who comes to help with infantry. Further, the rulers of the sea can sail away from their own land to anywhere at all, whereas a land power can take a journey of only a few days from its own territory. Progress is slow, and going on foot one cannot carry provisions sufficient for a long time. One who goes on foot must pass through friendly country or else fight and win, whereas it is possible for the seafarer to go on shore wherever he has the stronger power this land. But to sail along the coast until he comes to a friendly region or to those weaker than himself. Further, the strongest land powers suffer badly from visitations of disease on the crops, but sea powers bear them easily. For the whole earth does not ail at the same time, so that from a prosperous land imports reach the rulers of the sea. If there should be mention also of slighter matters, first, by virtue of their naval power, the Athenians have mingled with various peoples and discovered types of luxury. Whatever the delicacy in Sicily, Italy, Cyprus, Egypt, Lydia, Pontus, the Peloponnese, or anywhere else. All these have been brought together into one place by virtue of naval power. Further, hearing every kind of dialect, they have taken something from each, the Greeks rather tend to use their own dialect, way of life, and type of dress, but the Athenians use a mixture from all the Greeks and non-Greeks. The Athenian populace realizes that it is impossible for each of the poor to offer sacrifices, to give lavish feasts, to set up shrines, and to manage a city which will be beautiful and great, and yet the populace has discovered how to have sacrifices, shrines, banquets, and temples. The city sacrifices at public expense many victims, but it is the people who enjoy the feasts and to whom the victims are allotted. Some rich persons have private gymnasia, baths, and dressing rooms, but the people have built for their own use many wrestling quarters, dressing rooms, and public baths. The rabble has more enjoyment of these things than the well-to-do members of the upper class. Wealth they alone of the Greeks and non-Greeks are capable of possessing. If some city is rich in ship timber, where will it distribute it without the consent of the rulers of the sea? Again if some city is rich in iron, copper, or flax, where will it distribute without the consent of the rulers of the sea? However, it is from these very things that I have my ships, timber from one place, iron from another, copper from another, flax from another, wax from another. In addition, they will forbid export to wherever any of our enemies are, on pain of being unable to use the sea. And I, without doing anything, have all this from the land because of the sea, yet no other city has even two of these things, the same city does not have timber and flax, but wherever there is flax in abundance, the land is smooth and timberless. There is not even copper and iron from the same city, not any two or three other things in a single city. 
but there is one product here and another there. Furthermore, every mainland has either a projecting headland or an offshore island or some strait, so that it is possible for a naval power to put in there and to injure those who dwell on the land. But there is one thing the Athenians lack. If they were Thalassocrats living on an island, it would be possible for them to inflict harm, if they wished, but as long as they ruled the sea, to suffer none. Neither the ravaging of their land nor the taking on of enemies. As it is, of the Athenians the farmers and the wealthy curry favour with the enemy, whereas the people, knowing that nothing of theirs will be burnt or cut down, live without fear and refuse to fawn upon the enemy. Furthermore, if they lived on an island, they would have been relieved of another fear, the city would never be betrayed by oligarchs nor would the gates be thrown open nor enemies invade. For how would these things happen to islanders? Besides no one would rebel against the democracy, if they lived on an island, as it is, if there were civil strife, the rebels would place their hope in bringing in the enemy by land. If they lived on an island, even this would be of no concern to them. However, since from the beginning they happen not to have lived on an island, they now do the following, they place their property on islands while trusting in the naval empire and they allow their land to be ravaged. For they realize that if they concern themselves with this, they will be deprived of other greater goods. Further, for oligarchic cities it is necessary to keep to alliances and oaths. If they do not abide by agreements or if injustice is done, there are the names of the few who made the agreement. But whatever agreements the populace makes can be repudiated by referring the blame to the one who spoke or took the vote, while the others declare that they were absent or did not approve of the agreement made in the full assembly. If it seems advisable for their decisions not to be effective, they invent myriad excuses for not doing what they do not want to do. And if there are any bad results from the people's plans, they charge that a few persons, working against them, ruined their plans, but if there is a good result, they take the credit for themselves. They do not permit the people to be ill-spoken of in comedy, so that they may not have a bad reputation. But if anyone wants to attack private persons, they bid him do so, knowing perfectly well that the person so treated in comedy does not, for the most part, come from the populace and mass of people but is a person of either wealth, high birth, or influence. Some few poor and plebeian types are indeed abused in comedy but only if they have been meddling in others' affairs and trying to rise above their class, so that the people feel no vexation at seeing such persons abused in comedy. It is my opinion that the people at Athens know which citizens are good and which bad, but that in spite of this knowledge they cultivate those who are complacent and useful to themselves, even if bad, and they tend to hate the good. For they do not think that the good are naturally virtuous for the people's benefit, but for their hurt. On the other hand, some persons are not by nature democratic although they are truly on the people's side. I pardon the people themselves for their democracy. One must forgive everyone for looking after his own interests. But whoever is not a man of the people and yet prefers to live in a democratic city rather than in an oligarchic one has readied himself to do wrong and has realized that it is easier for an evil man to escape notice in a democratic city than in an oligarchic. As for the constitution of the Athenians I do not praise its form, but since they have decided to have a democracy, I think they have preserved the democracy well by the means which I have indicated. I notice also that objections are raised against the Athenians because it is sometimes not possible for a person, though he sit about for a year, to negotiate with the council or the assembly. This happens at Athens for no other reason than that owing to the quantity of business they are not able to deal with all persons before sending them away. For how could they do this? First of all they have to hold more festivals than any other Greek city, and when these are going on it is even less possible for any of the city's affairs to be transacted. Next they have to preside over private and public trials and investigations into the conduct of magistrates to a degree beyond that of all other men, and the council has to consider many issues involving war, revenues, lawmaking, local problems as they occur, also many issues on behalf of the allies, receipt of tribute, the care of dockyards and shrines. Is there accordingly any cause for surprise if with so much business they are unable to negotiate with all persons? But some say, if you go to the council or assembly with money, you will transact your business. I should agree with these people that many things are accomplished at Athens for money and still more would be accomplished if still more gave money. This, however, I know well, that the city has not the wherewithal to deal with everyone who asks, not even if you give them any amount of gold and silver. They have also to adjudicate cases when a man does not repair his ship or build something on public property. And in addition to settle disputes every year for chorus leaders at the Dionysia, Thargelia, Panathenia, Promethea, and Hephaestia.
400 triarchs are appointed every year, and disputes have to be settled for any of these who wish. Moreover, magistrates have to be approved and their disputes settled, orphans approved and prisoners guards appointed. And these things happen every year. Now and again they have to deal with cases of desertion and other unexpected misdeeds, whether it be an irregular act of wantonness or an act of impiety. There are still many items which I altogether pass over. The most important have been mentioned except for the assessments of tribute. These generally occur every four years. Well then, ought one to think that all these cases should not be dealt with? Let someone say what should not be dealt with there. If, on the other hand, one must agree that it is all necessary, the adjudicating has to go on throughout the year, since not even now when they do adjudicate throughout the year can they stop all the wrongdoers because there are so many. All right, yet someone will say that they ought to judge cases, but that fewer people should do the judging. Unless they have only a few courts, there will necessarily be few jurors in each court, so that it will be easier to adapt oneself to a few jurors and to bribe them, and easier to judge much less justly. Further, one must consider that the Athenians have to hold festivals during which the courts are closed. They hold twice as many festivals as others do, but I am counting only those which have equivalents in the state holding the smallest number. Under such circumstances, therefore, I deny that it is possible for affairs at Athens to be otherwise than as they now are, except insofar as it is possible to take away a bit here and add a bit there. A substantial change is impossible without removing some part of the democracy. It is possible to discover many ways to improve the constitution, however, it is not easy to discover a means whereby the democracy may continue to exist but sufficient at the same time to provide a better polity. Except as I have just said by adding or subtracting a little. Also in the following point the Athenians seem to me to act ill-advisedly, in cities embroiled in civil strife they take the side of the lower class. This they do deliberately, for if they preferred the upper class, they would prefer those who are contra-minded to themselves. In no city is the superior element well disposed to the populace, but in each city it is the worst part which is well disposed to the populace. For like is well disposed to like. Accordingly the Athenians prefer those sympathetic to themselves. Whenever they have undertaken to prefer the upper class, it has not turned out well for them, within a short time the people in Boeotia were enslaved, similarly when they preferred the Miletian upper class, within a short time that class had revolted and cut down the people, similarly when they preferred the Spartans to the Messenians. Within a short time the Spartans had overthrown the Messenians and were making war on the Athenians. Someone might interject that no one has been unjustly disfranchised at Athens. I say that there are some who have been unjustly disfranchised but very few indeed. To attack the democracy at Athens not a few are required. As this is so, there is no need to consider whether any persons have been justly disfranchised, only whether unjustly. Now how would anyone think that many people were unjustly disfranchised at Athens, where the people are the ones who hold the offices? It is from failing to be a just magistrate or failing to say or do what is right that people are disfranchised at Athens. In view of these considerations one must not think that there is any danger at Athens from the disfranchised.